Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see title what if Naruto inherited the dormant powers of ancient land of Uzushiogakure. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Naruto sat on a couch reading The Art of War by Sun Tzu, the past six months had been extremely boring. Wonder Woman had told him that he wasn't allowed in the Justice League until he turned 18 years old and he had to be homeschooled at the Wayne Manor. However that wasn't a problem considering Naruto's speed reading and vast telepathy it was pretty easy for him to recall everything he read, it took him a while to understand a few things like physics but his tutor had stated that Naruto could easily reach the level of people his age in a few more months. He however was allowed to train with Wonder Woman and the two would spar for hours, it was a fact that they were even in hand to hand combat and weapon proficiency making each of their spar extremely competitive. So far it was 30 to Naruto and 29 to Wonder Woman. He did however question the rule the Justice League had on not killing their enemies, he didn't understand the purpose of leaving a foe alive if he was a murderer but since he was dependent on them, he would just follow the rule for now. However considering that most of Wonder Woman's fights involved going to Greece, it was no surprise that no one even knew of him apart from the occupants of Greece. He had been shown once or twice helping Wonder Woman defeat Cheetah but that was all really, he was getting antsy at not being able to fight a worthy foe. Of course there were positives since Batman said it made him better at covert missions as he would stay under the radar of major villains. Naruto sighed as he finished the last page of the book. He threw the book to the side and walked towards the kitchen to get himself a drink when heard Wonder Woman's TV switch on. Batman's face appeared. Cage, Hal Jordan requires your assistance in Coast City. Coordinates will be sent your visor. Right. I am on it. His body glowed an ethereal gold as one of the seals on his chest summoned his new armored costume. Naruto still had the same body armor except he now had a black metallic mask that had a red visor on it. Batman said it would be wise for Naruto to have a navigating system since he didn't know the exact the map of America and would simply get lost. However unknown to Naruto Batman had a secret agenda which was to analyze Naruto's fights and make a contigny C file against Naruto if he decided to go rogue. Naruto flew out of the penthouse and towards his target with speeds equaling that of lightning. Meanwhile Hal Jordan was fighting Sinistro and the two were equally matched however the tides changed when Solomon Grundy showed up. It suddenly became two on one and he called for backup but most of the league were already fighting their own foes so he was going to get backup in the form of his favorite teenager, Uzumaki Naruto or as everyone else knew him Cage. He dodged to the side as Grundy threw a car but was hit in his back by a beam from Sinistro. Hal was sent crashing into the ground and was about to get hit by Grundy when all of a sudden a blur smashed into Grundy with such force that it drove him through several buildings. Grundy landed in Coast City Park with Naruto floating over him, Naruto said calmly, give up you grey monster. Grundy shouted, Grundy kill armor boy. Grundy jumped and tried to tackle but Naruto dodged and cut him across the chest with Kusanagi. Naruto smirked. This is my blade Kusanagi, it can cut the strongest of beings and you are from having such a status but you will be enough to entertain me for now. Naruto sheathed his sword and said, come beast. I will fight you with my fists. Naruto flew towards the standing Grundy and delivered a punch that shattered its jaw but watched as it healed with ease. Naruto grinned. Yes you will be a worthwhile foe. He appeared beneath Grundy who was clueless as to where Naruto had vanished and delivered an uppercut that sent him soaring into the air. Naruto merely used his gravity powers to send Grundy spiraling downwards into the ground. Grundy hit the ground hard enough to make a massive crater however he only had minimal damage. Naruto watched as the beast rose with an enraged face before it charged at him. Naruto let the beast hit him with a massive hook that sent him flying into the water fountain. Naruto rose from the water unharmed and his red visor turned flashed blue as Naruto fired a massive beam of blue energy from his eyes that knocked Grundy back a hundreds of meters. Grundy roared but Naruto shook his head, you've gotten boring beast, it's time to end you. He flew towards the beast and struck a flat palm that hit Grundy in the middle of the chest making him stumble. Naruto performed a tiger hand seal and muttered. Fuinjutsu. Prison seal. Fuinjutsu marks spread all over Grundy's body immobilizing the beast. Naruto said. I'll leave you here for the police, 
I hope that next time we meet you will give me a better fight. Naruto saw Hal Jordan fly towards him. Hal shouted, Great job Naruto although you could have done with less collateral damage. Naruto snorted. Where is the fun with that, so where did Sinistro go? Hal Jordan replied, he left via a portal, he wasn't expecting for me to have back up. Naruto said, well I should be heading back, Diana will have my head if I don't get to the penthouse for dinner. Hal laughed, she has you whipped man, it's like you two are dating. Naruto retorted, she has a boyfriend remember, Superman. Hal shrugged. Yes yes the boy scout managed to bag an Amazon but for a long time their relationship has been strained. Nearly every hero in the watchtower betted on how long they would last, I still say that won't even last the rest of the year. Naruto replied. Well they seemed pretty good to me this morning, got to go Jordan. Hal waved by as he saw Naruto blast into the air traveling at transonic speeds towards Washington DC. Diana's apartment Naruto flew through the open window and saw Diana sitting on the couch talking to Superman through Skype. Naruto landed softly and Diana looked at her protege and asked, Where did you go? Naruto replied, Coast City, fought Grundy, he was an interesting beast. Diana said, There's some lasagna in the oven if you want some food. Naruto grinned, Thanks, I'll eat it later. Wonder Woman merely nodded and returned to her conversation with her boyfriend. Naruto looked back at his mentor with a frown, he didn't understand what she saw in the Kryptonian but he dare not say his opinion in front of her. Next day April 5, 2010 Naruto walked out of the Wayne Manor with Alfred Pennyworth who was the loyal butler for the Wayne family. Alfred spoke, same time tomorrow Master Uzumaki. Naruto wore a black muscle shirt and leather jacket with a pair of blue jeans. He wore a heavy backpack that contained all of his books. Naruto said, Thank you Alfred. Naruto blasted himself into the air using clouds as cover traveling at a cruising speed of 400 miles per hour, his telescopic eyesight allowing him to see the dark city known as Gotham. Gotham was an infamous city known for having the highest crime rates in all categories from theft to mass murder it was a haven for criminals, mercenaries and corrupt government officials and the increase in metahuman villains like Poison Ivy and Clayface didn't help. Naruto suddenly heard a scream from downwards and the mental laughter that followed sounded feminine, he spun him towards the direction of the sound before diving with enough speed to surpass that of a bullet twice. Down at Gotham docks Harley Quinn. Catwoman and Poison Ivy laughed as plants held onto to a female cop. You came at the wrong time darling, we were just about to steal some expensive shipment. The cop screamed as Harley Quinn drew a gun but before she could pull the trigger, a massive amount of gravity pushed them to the ground. Naruto hit the ground, his voice dark as he spoke. You will not be killing anyone today. Catwoman looked at the team curiously and she could tell he would kill them in an instant however Harley jumped and tried to clobber Naruto with a bat. Naruto grabbed her and threw her straight at a container almost as if she was a mere ball to him. She hit the metal container with her head and dented it before slumping unconscious. Naruto's grin didn't leave his face, she won't remember any of this, now who else wants to get beaten? Poison Ivy looked at him, you're strong, why are you on the sides of the angels? Naruto grinned turned demonic, oh darling, me on the side of the angels, you don't know me at all? He charged at her but was stopped by a bad rang. He turned and saw Batman looking at him, the man shook his head telling Naruto he would handle it. Naruto smiled. Well that's my cue girls, hopefully we won't see each other under such unpleasant circumstances. Batcave Bruce replayed the fight between Grundy and Naruto, he typed a few things into his back computer and the face of Silas Stone appeared on the gigantic screen. Silas asked. Batman, I suppose you want the data from what Grundy was restricted with. Batman merely nodded. Silas continued, well from what I can deduce is that the boy used an unknown energy to induce the immobilization. However I found that in the middle of Grundy's chest there was text written in Japanese and translated as prison or something. Batman asked, have you studied the energy? Silas answered, well we only had residual energy to work with but from what we can see it is unlike any energy we have encountered. The closest it resembles is Kai from the ancient texts and the energy that the new gods use for their powers however it functions as an energy source that can be converted into other types of energy like thermal or electrical energy. Batman scratched his chin, so what you're saying is that this energy has many applications. 
Silas nodded, yes, it could enhance a human's current condition and make them high supernatural in terms of physical aspect. The person who managed to seal Grundy has only scratched the surface of what his energy could do and I am pretty sure he doesn't know how to use it properly yet. Batman replied, thank you for the information Drivestone. I'll be sure to contact you if you something else comes up. The screen switched off and Bruce sighed in his seat, Alfred asked, sir, are you still spying on Master Uzumaki? Bruce replied, yes, his powers are a secret to all of us and he continues to slowly show more and more of his abilities. He pressed a button and two metahumans appeared on the screen, these are the youngest metahumans that I have classified as planetary level threats. Alfred read them out, severe threat level, Supergirl, Kid Flash and Cage. Bruce nodded, Supergirl has the potential to become as strong as her cousin and Cage has proved he could he go in a fist fight with Wonder Woman and beat her in all categories with the exception of experience. His gravity powers allow him to increase his super strength by making things light. Supergirl may be in the Justice League but she is far from being mature and Cage is getting antsy sitting and learning all day long his fight with Grundy proved that. Alfred sighed. If I may master Bruce why don't you simply allow Naruto to join the Justice League by all means he is capable of fighting the foes of both Wonder Woman and Superman. Bruce leaned to his chair and replied, surprisingly many have voted Naruto to not be allowed to join the league until such a time that Wonder Woman and the rest of the original team members agree that he is ready. Alfred shook his head, Naruto is a warrior and an idol warriors are always irritable, he wants to fight someone strong as that is the way he was brought up. I am sure what could happen if you he finds out that you and the other leaguers are extensively studying each of his moves. Bruce answered, he will turn and might become our worst enemy. I am sure many other people have taken an interest at Cage and his powers. Cage isn't affiliated with the Justice League so he could leave if he was given a proposition by one of our enemies like Lex Luthor or worse Amanda Waller. Alfred checked his watch, now if you excuse me sir, I'll be bringing Master from his school. Alfred excused himself and walked out of the Batcave towards the garage. Bryce sighed as he looked at the screen, he had a lot of thinking to do on the question that was ringing in his head. What does he do with Uzumaki Naruto? Diana's missions usually involved her traveling to Thymesikara but Naruto swore never to enter a place that the Greek gods have full jurisdiction over. It was pure blasphemy if a child of the Shinto entered the lands of the Greek god. So Naruto usually stayed in Washington where the only villain over there was the mysterious Amanda Waller. So Bruce thought of a way to ease all these young sidekicks into the Justice League, first step was to take them to the Hall of Justice and from there allow them to work in a few low profile missions. Now the only question that remained was which sidekicks would join Cage. Naruto had responded to a distress call by the police. Cheetah was back and she was out for blood. Naruto flew towards the humanoid cat's location. Wonder Woman had disappeared somewhere last night and Naruto didn't have the luxury of being able to contact her. Barbara Minerva aka the cheetah cackled as she began slicing the policemen's weapons, they had surrounded the shopping mall which she currently occupied. The sounds of gunshots scared the people in the mall into a frenzy which gave cheetah the needed distraction to get close and begin the massacre. Cheetah began chalking the last policeman and hoisted him upwards, she heard the familiar clicking of armor in the distance. A bloodthirsty grin placated her lips, Cage, it's been far too long. Naruto landed in a crater formed in the middle of the mall. I would have thought you would have learned your lesson by now, Cheetah. Cheetah threw the limp body of the policeman and turned to face her adversary, she grinned fairly, oh and what would that lesson be? Naruto unsheathed Kusangi, that you cannot beat me. Cheetah laughed, I've been upgraded. She dashed towards her long claws unsheathed, Naruto stepped backwards in surprise at Cheetah's newfound speed. He used his sword to block a powerful slash towards his torso, he jumped to the side to avoid another. Cheetah's claws ripped through an entire pillar holding them all. Damn! She is not just faster! Cheetah shouted, tell me where your master is, Cage. Naruto's visor flashed red and the Cheetah was sent to the ground by a wave of gravity. I am no one's slave, Cheetah. You sure fooled me. She cackled trying her best to rile the young hero up. Naruto kicked the downed beast and sent her through the opening mall and crashing into a car. She groaned as she slowly got up, I need to distract him. Naruto was suddenly in front of her, he was faster than her. Cheetah gritted her teeth as she went sent flying into the air and was sent back hurtling back into the street by Naruto's gravity pull. She coughed up blood, 
he was ruthless even more so than her rival, Wonder Woman. She got up slowly and saw a blue energy beam coming towards her with what little balance she had, she rolled out of its way only to be hit by an explosion of a vehicle next to her. She lay on the ground and saw Naruto's Kusangi pointed between her eyes, yield. She growled, never, and in a flash, she got up surprising Naruto and her claws clashed against his armor. Naruto dodged a roundhouse kick but was punched in the torso sending him flying into a car. The cheetah was getting faster and stronger. He flew into the air just in time to watch cheetah barreling into the dented car and hurling it across the street. A powerful jet of chakra flew from his visor and went towards cheetah but she managed to dodge it. In an act of desperation, Naruto increased the gravity hundredfold sending Minerva to the ground but also crushing everything in the block. Naruto was shocked to see Cheetah resisting the increase in gravity, her body was turning more and more into that of a beast. A sigh of relief overcame Naruto when a lasso whipped past him and around the Cheetah's neck. Cheetah was sent flying through the already damaged mall. Naruto returned the gravity to normal as Wonder Woman zoomed past him and towards the injured Cheetah. Naruto followed in suit. Cheetah was capable of keeping up with just Naruto but the deadly combination of him and Wonder Woman proved too much for her. She was knocked unconscious by a blow to the head by Naruto. Naruto said, Where were you? Wonder Woman replied, Metropolis, I was assisting Superman against Metallo and Lex Luthor. Naruto merely grunted, I am heading home, now. Wonder Woman shouted, Aren't you forgetting what today is? Naruto shouted back as he was about to take off, No I will preserve my excitement should it prove it to be everything that was promised. Of course. He cared very little about this little get-together that Batman and the other leaguers had planned for their little sidekicks. From his experience, Batman had a way of lying without actually lying. Hall of Justice Naruto and Wonder Woman arrived a few minutes later than Flash and Kid Flash, Kid Flash turned around to his mentor, Ha I told you we wouldn't be the last ones here. Naruto raised his eyebrow at the childish speedster but kept quiet, he wasn't acquainted with any of the sidekicks except for Robin. Naruto said bored. Shall we get going then Batman? I do have other things to do. It was too predictable even for the caped crusader. Naruto knew that Batman would be up to something and surprise. Surprise he was right. The Hall of Justice was a front for the Justice League whilst the real headquarters was in space. It was classified and he doubted that any of the sidekicks knew about it except for Robin. Green Arrow's sidekick snarled. Like what? Naruto looked at the boy with a lazy eye. He asked, what was your name again? Red Hood, Red, Speedy. That was it. Speedy's eyebrows twitched, you damned, he was silenced when he was faulted to the ground by Naruto flexing his arm. Naruto said, I can control gravity, Arrow Boy, there is nothing you can actually do that will harm me. Kid Flash announced, gravity manipulation, that is so cool. Naruto sighed and pushed past everyone as he made his way to the Hall of Justice. Batman and Wonder Woman both heard Naruto muttering something about immature brats and that he would collapse the building if he was put on a team with them. Batman sincerely hoped that Naruto wouldn't do such a thing. Inside Hall of Justice Naruto was reading a book written by Arthur Schaffenauer as he watched Batman and the rest of the Justice League mutter a few unimportant things. However Speedy or Arrow Boy had decided to get cranky and take out his justified frustration on the Justice League. Speedy or Roy Harper snarled, that's it? you promised us a real look inside. Aquaman replied, it's a first step. Martian Manhunter added, you've been granted access that very few get. Roy snorted, gesturing to the window above where many people were taking pictures. He snarled, oh really? Who cares what side of the glass we're on? Green Arrow pleaded, calm down Roy. Roy snorted, you're telling me to calm down. You and your pathetic league are treating us as if we're children. This isn't even the real headquarters. The last bit was directed towards the sidekicks. The sidekicks had a look of betrayal but nonetheless kept quiet. Aquaman said, You're not helping your cause here. But Roy looked towards his fellow sidekicks and said, Well? Robin spoke, Well, what? It's a first step. Naruto closed his book and looked at Roy. He said, What is your point, Arrow Boy? You're not going to change their mind. You're too immature to join the League. They think of every sidekick as cannon fodders that needs to be controlled. Roy looked at Naruto with a glare but nonetheless muttered, You're right, he proceeded to walk out of the door. No one tried to stop, neither the older heroes nor the sidekicks who were stunned by Naruto's comment. 
Batman's eyes trailed towards Naruto who was already seemed to be turning heel. Naruto announced, I am heading home. Please inform me on how the induction goes. His voice was dripping with a mixture of sarcasm and indifference. The sound of heavy armored footsteps echoed through the silent room. Batman narrowed his eyes at Naruto. He could have sworn he saw Naruto's visor flash red for a second. Hours later Naruto silently stalked the streets of Washington DC. He was hungry after doing his usual exercises and homework routine. People walking around him, hurrying to work or to whatever they were usually doing, humans. How odd it was that he said it with such disdain. After reading the minds of so many people, Naruto beginning to see why the Uzumaki clan decided to hide themselves from the world. Naruto trudged through the streets so busy in thought until he was interrupted by a beeping on his watch. He pressed a button and saw Robin's face appear, Cage, we need your help. Naruto sighed, what is it? We've been captured by Cadmus, I'll send you the coordinates. I'll be right there. With a burst of speed, Uzumaki Naruto had disappeared from the street as if he was never there. Unknown to him however, a small camera on the street sent a message to the owner and that was when Naruto had finally been recognized by the infamous Amanda Waller. Cadmus Naruto dressed in his armor flew straight towards Cadmus, his HUD identifying Robin, Aqualad, Kid Flash and an unknown friendly in combat with one hideous blue monster. A grin formed as he increased his speed. Superboy was struggling to deal with Blockbuster. The being was for some odd reason too strong for the Superman clone. Blockbuster grabbed Superman's arm and threw him into the far wall. Aqualad quickly moved to the side as a blur smashed into Blockbuster's chest. The being was sent through the wall and into the air. The blur continued to follow the trajectory of the blue-skinned monster. Aqualad asked Robin, why did you call Cage? We didn't need a him, the guy is probably going to kill Desmond. Robin face palmed, he muttered, oh shit, he is going to kill Desmond, we need to go after him. You're not going anywhere. A gruff voice scared the hell out of the teenagers, Batman and the Justice League had arrived. Robin turned around and quickly said, we can explain. Superboy who had just climbed out of the wall said, we don't need to explain anything. Batman and Superman's eyes traveled to the house of El Insignia placed on the boy's chest. A frown was etched on Superman's face. Robin asked, but we have to stop Naruto from killing Blockbuster. Superman answered, Supergirl is handling it, now please tell us what happened here. Robin scratched his head and said, well, back with Naruto. The beast landed in a children's playground, Naruto flew above it. So, you're the beast that Robin was talking about. You're not tough at all. I suppose it's time I finished you off. His silver blade glistened in the moonlight and he pointed it at the beast before beginning his descent. However, his HUD detected a blur about to him and he was forced to dodge, he hit the ground to the side of the beast. Naruto dusted himself and saw Supergirl look down at him. Ah Supergirl, what are you doing here? Supergirl spoke with an authoritative voice, I can't allow you to kill that beast. Why can't you? It's not even human. Yes, it is. It's a human transformed into a beast. Naruto questioned her logic, yes but it is now a beast. Supergirl sighed, I was told to stop you. Naruto grinned in his mask, so do you want to fight? I haven't fought a worthy foe in a long time. A very dark aura appeared around him and gravity increased around him. The swings bent and the metal poles started to bend towards the ground. He disliked the girl immensely, she was his age and yet she was allowed into the Justice League. He doubted that it was because of her skill but because Superman was her cousin. Supergirl warily asked her fellow hero to stand down. Cage didn't like her for obvious reasons, he said she was spoiled and had no skill, she resented him because of his comments but they never actually fought and she honestly didn't want to fight him. I don't want to fight. Also the Justice League is waiting. Naruto sighed, fine. You're going to take the beast then, and with those words he flew towards the destroyed Cadmus building. Supergirl looked at the icky beast, she thought, perhaps I should have let Cage kill it. Cadmus Naruto arrived to see Superboy standing up to the Justice League and demanding that they be allowed to do missions. Naruto laughed internally at idiocy of letting this group do missions but he knew that Batman was in a pickle especially when Robin sided with the clone. Wonder Woman approached her student, she hissed at him, please tell me you weren't involved with this. Naruto answered with a smirk, 
No sadly this isn't my handiwork although I must admit that they make a good demolition team but I would have wiped this building out of existence and the clone wouldn't be standing here. Wonder Woman nodded, we are going to talk about what you said in the Hall of Justice later. Naruto merely shrugged. Batman said, fine but there will be some conditions as to what you can or cannot do. You can be overruled by any member of the Justice League. That last bit was directed towards Naruto. Supergirl who heard Batman looked smug but decided to keep her expression neutral when she saw Naruto's visor flash red. Naruto said, if you excuse me, I have to head home. Everyone watched as Naruto blasted himself into the air. Superman gritted his teeth at the blatant disrespect the teenager held towards his elders and WW narrowed her eyes dangerously. Her protege was doing this on purpose and she would find out why, one way or another. Wonder Woman quickly flew after Naruto. She arrived at her penthouse seconds after Naruto. She quickly moved to grab Naruto's shoulders. She watched as Naruto's masked face turned towards her, his visor flashing red. Ignoring the threat of violence, she asked softly, Naruto, what is going on with you today? Naruto replied, nothing. Leave me alone. No I will not let leave you alone until you tell me what has come over you today. Naruto questioned, why do you care? Diana's facial expression explained it all she cared about him. I care about you Naruto. There is something bothering you, I just want to help you. Sadly, this is a matter that only I can resolve. Besides you are only doing this because I am only your so called protege. You and the Justice League just want me in the palm of your hands so that you can use me whenever you want and discard of me when you please. Diana protested, T that's not true. But Naruto didn't care. His apathy had only increased in the past few days. He saw no reason to care about these people. He saw no reason to live at all. His entire purpose of living had been destroyed. This is about Uzushi Obakure, isn't it? Naruto didn't even reply as he walked upstairs. His silence spoke for itself. Diana had expected this. She knew that Naruto would resent this world just like she had. She was surprised that it had taken this long for him to become depressed. She at least had her people, her family and something to fight for. Naruto had nothing and from the looks of things, he was beginning to question why he was fighting anyway. Naruto's room. Naruto stared at the only photo he had of his mother. He looked at how happy she looked, how happy they looked. His mind flashed to the memory of his mother being atomized and he unconsciously clenched his fists. Damn him. Why did he have to destroy everything? He hated Ryu for doing what he did. If only he could justice for what that man had did to his family, he would have made him suffer. Unbeknownst to the young Uzumaki, Ryu was helped by outside forces that wanted Uzushiobakir destroyed. Three days later Mount Justice Naruto, Kid Flash, Robin, Superboy and Aqualad all aligned up in front of Batman who explained to them the terms of service. You will do this on league terms. He pointed to Red Tornado, Red Tornado has volunteered to live here and supervise you. Black Canary will be your fighting instructor and I, only I will deploy you on missions. Batman finished with a tone of finality. He gazed at each of the young sidekicks and paused at Cage who gave him the tiniest of nods. You will be deployed on covert operations. Aquaman began to explain, the existence of Cadmus and their operations has shown us of the need for a team that is capable of acting under the radar. Batman finished, the six of you will be that team. Kid Flash excitedly exclaimed, awesome, I can't wait to kick ass. Robin asked the more obvious question, wait, you said six. Batman pointed to the Zeta tube and the team turned to see the Martian Manhunter escorting a young female Martian with red hair. That is the Martian's niece, Miss Martian. I believe she will be a unique asset on missions. Everyone began to introduce themselves to the new addition. Miss Martian seemed very flustered with all the attention. Naruto turned heel and walked towards the Zeta tube. Batman said, Cage. Naruto turned towards the caped crusader. What? Batman said, the Justice League has decided to put you on this team to see whether you can be inducted into the league, there are conditions. Naruto snorted, a scorching fire emitted from his armor. Do not think me so weak to beg, Batman. Batman narrowed his eyes as Cage left the mountain. Unknown location in the middle of a dark room, Several screens with silhouettes made out of light watched the footage of Cage fighting Cheetah and his attack on Blockbuster was played throughout the room. A deep and gruff voice asked, I thought all the Uzumaki had been destroyed. A childish boyish voice replied, 
he is the last one, I have been keeping tabs on him and might I say, he is more than I expected. A feminine voice said uncaringly, he was not responsible for the destruction of our Cadmus facility, I don't see what is so interesting about this cage. The boy replied, of course you wouldn't, you don't appreciate anything besides your goddamned hive. A growl was emitted from the screen with the silhouette of a woman. The first voice replied, from the intel we have received cage can still be swayed to our side. Another voice agreed, yes, he would be an irreplaceable asset and his unique physiology would allow us to create more powerful clones. No one voiced any opposition. The first voice announced, very well, it is decided, Uzumaki Naruto will see the light one way or another. They say that, knowledge is power, and it wasn't until a few days ago, that Naruto realized how much it applied to him. He may be a metahuman that could fight with the upper echelon of superpowered beings but he was destitute of information. Information that could provide him with the means to leave the Justice League. Currently, Batman had all the keys, he could always go rogue but without any contacts and any means of hiding, Naruto would be running without a sense of direction. He would essentially be blind and he would rather not have the Justice League hot on his tails every day and night, even he was not naive enough to believe that he could beat all of the Justice League. Wonder Woman was the only person that could kill him and some like Superman had enough power to severely injure him. He had therefore decided that he should procure some information on the Justice League. STAR labs were known to have a large database on metahumans, he had recently developed an affinity for computer hacking. He realized that STAR labs was virtually unhackable from the outside and so you would need to infiltrate the building. He was dressed in a common thief's clothes, a pair of gloves and a black balaclava. He had managed to already get into the building, it had been relatively simple. Many scientists did overnight shifts and since he was not exactly a metahuman he didn't trigger the alarm. He stole on of the computer scientist's eye. D badge and used short electric to bursts to disrupt the electric systems. He had already knocked out the security guard and placed a constructed loop. So here he was inside the main server room, he would install his already pre-programmed trojan into the server and download as much information as he could. He just hoped that everything would go according to plan unfortunately even the best laid plans could go awry. He had installed the trojan and subsequently began to copy all the relevant data, he sent out several other trojans and download irrelevant data to get star labs of his tail. When he removed the USB stick from the terminal and unplugged his laptop. It was time to pack it up and leave, he threw all of his gear into his backup and walked towards the server room door. He ran out of the room and ran to the stairs, he had around 5 minutes until someone noticed the unconscious guard. As he was approaching the last 5 floors, he heard from the bug he had planted in the security guard's office, Rick, do you still have some of, Naruto cursed, he increased his speed and jumped the last 2 floors. He heard, intruder, intruder on the ground floor. Shit. They would activate defense mechanisms, he would need to use his powers. The question is what powers should he use? he decided on electricity and super speed. He sped out of the stairwells and emerged in the lobby area, superhuman powers detected. A scanner was about to scan him but Naruto was not having that he released a powerful wave of electricity that short-circuited all of the equipment. Freeze. The clicking of a gun was heard behind him, Naruto sighed and in a flash the man's weapons were dismantled and Naruto was behind him. He saw the doors were closing and a metal door was beginning to lower. Using his superhuman speed, he ran through the door and sighed in relief as he managed to escape STAR labs, he would have thought that their security system would be advanced enough to tackle Superman but he guessed wrong. Then again, he was reminded why exactly they didn't need such an advanced security system when Supergirl appeared in front of him, she said calmly, turn yourself in and I won't have to harm you. Naruto didn't want to have to deal with her so he used the one thing he brought to counteract her. A very powerful flashbang. It would cause her to momentarily lose her sight. He threw it at her face and it exploded. A bright explosion of light covered her vision and she was forced to cover her eyes. By the time, she had recovered from it, Naruto had disappeared into an alleyway ten blocks away. Supergirl growled as she flew up into the air, she knew how he looked like, she would find him. Using her x-ray vision and superhuman magnification, she scanned the city. It was a slow process, she was looking for the man. Unfortunately, he had seemingly disappeared like a ghost. July 11th Mount Justice 10 AM, I tell you Batman, he was a pro. 
He didn't leave a single clue behind. Supergirl told Batman about everything that had occurred. He fried the security footage, he didn't leave any DNA and he managed to stun me. Batman was impressed although he would never express it, this young thief had showed the panache of an expert strategist. He had planned everything from cover to cover, even if he was found which would be very hard to do, he wouldn't be able to put him in jail. Any evidence the detective had gained beside what he actually stole would be substantial. Superman and Supergirl had two main weaknesses, kryptonite and magic. This thief exploited one of their strengths, he knew about Kryptonians' overpowered senses and he used that against them. Batman gruffly answered, I will look into it. He marched towards the Zeta tube intent on investigating this later on but he needed to head over to the company first. Supergirl wanted some food and she smelt something very delicious coming from the kitchen. Naruto was using his superhuman hearing to listen on the conversation, a smile played on his lips. Despite the minor setback and the fact that he never wanted to be seen by anyone in the Justice League, he was still happy that everything was going according to his plan or at least the rough outlines he had come up with. He flipped the egg and the bacon making sure that they were cooked to his standards. He heard, something smells good in here. Damn it. He turned around and he and Supergirl exchanged eye contact. She asked, who are you? It was of course the first time she had seen him without his visor on or his full body armor. Batman had advised that he need not wear his visor in front of his new team. Supergirl stared at the teenager in front of her, he was quite tall around 6 foot 3, he had gravity defying spiky blood red hair and glaring purple amethyst eyes. He had a very muscular build, not as muscular as Superman but muscular enough to tell Supergirl that he was a fighter. Naruto smiled, oh I forgot you don't recognize me without my visor, K. Okay. Supergirl almost stepped, Cage, yes, that's me. To Supergirl the awkwardness of being with her, rival, Cage was enough for her to want to leave. So tell me Supergirl, what is a member of the Justice League doing here? Supergirl sighed, it doesn't matter, I should probably get going. Naruto decided to cut the teen some slack, you can stay, I made enough for two. Supergirl said nervously, I don't want to interrupt your breakfast. Naruto chuckled, it's fine. Take a seat and I'll finish up for you. Supergirl looked at Cage with surprise. He seemed very mellow compared to his fiery persona as a superhero, if he hadn't given her the clues to figure out his identity, she would have sworn that he was a different person. Ah uh, thanks, Cage, Naruto said, my name is Naruto. Supergirl decided to reciprocate, I am Kara. A part of her wondered why he was being so friendly and a creeping suspicion was beginning to sink in before she quashed it. Naruto quickly plated the food and lead Supergirl to the dining room. This is great. Kara complimented his cooking as she finished her breakfast at record speed. Naruto merely chuckled as he sipped some orange juice, he asked, so what made you decide to come here? Kara replied, there was an incident in Metropolis last night and I needed Batman's help, her Justice League signaling device began to vibrate telling her that she was needed at the watchtower. She looked at him apologetically but Naruto gave her the briefest of nods and she flew out of the room at breakneck speeds. Naruto grinned. It was necessary for his plan that he acted as if there was nothing going on. He needed the Justice League to trust him and to feel as though he didn't hate them. He finished his drink and headed towards the exercise room. Recognized B03 Aqualad. Recognized B02 Kid Flash, B01 Robin. Naruto saw the three of them emerge from the Zeta Beam. They seemed rather unhappy but their venture to pick up Speedy and recruit to the team. Naruto could tell that they failed. Kid Flash sped up to Naruto. Is he here yet? Naruto replied, Red Tornado isn't but he should be here soon, I am going to the training room. Wally looked at his other fellow teammates, well isn't he peachy? Robin shrugged, let him be Wally, we both know he doesn't exactly want to be here. Wally bluntly said, or belong here, Aqualad looked at him with disappointment and Wally quickly finished, I mean it's just that he is too powerful to be here. I doubt Batman is going to let us fight any of the heavy hitters. Both Robin and Aqualad doubted that he meant it that way but kept their mouths shut before walking to the holographic computer. One hour later training room Naruto was about done with his katas, he had practiced his weapon throwing and his kenjutsu beforehand. He stopped when he heard the mechanical wearing noise behind him. Red Tornado's mechanical voice echoed throughout the room, you must be Cage. The other members of the team seem to be bonding without you. Naruto replied, and that concerns you. 
Red Tornado merely replied, yes, it lowers the odds of you being able to successfully work as a unit. Naruto turned the red mechanical being and shrugged, now, now we both know that the Justice League doesn't do a lot of team building exercises. I believe you are more worried about my behavior, that my apathy for my teammates would cause them to be in danger. An accurate assessment, I was told that you were quite perceptive, will that be a problem? Naruto grinned as he spun his katana, no, not at all. If they are useful in a mission, I will be sure to use them to their fullest capacity. It's like playing a game of chess really, for now they are merely pawns. Red Tornado finished, but they may promote to a piece of higher significance. Naruto smiled at the droid, exactly. He grabbed a towel and walked out of the room. Red Tornado muttered, a most worrying assessment but an accurate one nonetheless. Naruto's cynical view on how the team was viewed by the Justice League was relatively accurate but to Red Tornado it was worrisome was that if they weren't useful what action would Naruto take against them? Would he leave on the battlefield bleeding? Would he support them? He would watch the young teenager more closely? Ten minutes later, Naruto, there is a disturbance in the Happy Harbor power plant. The team has already been sent ahead of you. By the time Red Tornado had finished giving the order Naruto was already out of Mount Justice and was flying towards the power plant at Mach 3. With the rest of the team they were getting beaten left, right and center. This new android that called itself Twister was capable of generating tornadoes and high-powered wind blasts. Wally charged at the android but he was deflected by a powerful wave of wind. The android moved to its side to avoid a punch from Superboy before throwing him away. Twister was capable of reading their movements and their simplistic patterns allowed it to easily calculate the next mode of action. Where is Red Tornado? I didn't come here to fight children. Wally growled, we are not children. If the android were capable of making anyone it would have but it instead voted to simply blast Kid Flash into a steel beam. Robin shouted, Kid, he threw some batrangs at Twister's armor but found that the android's armor was too strong to be cut through. Twister fired a tornado at Robin who used one of the beams to acrobatically throw himself out of the way. He rolled out of the way of another jet of wind before throwing some pellets of smoke at the android. Robin showed it, now Superboy. Twister however had enough of playing around and grabbed Superboy's incoming fist and punched him in the abdomen sending him flying into the wall. This game has gone far enough. He flew out of the building and found himself moving towards the side as a blur smashed into the ground. Another child coming out to play. Cage grinned, since you were able to defeat the others, I will indulge you. Show me your best. Twister flew into the air, very well. Wind twisters blew out of his gauntlets and into the atmosphere. Naruto observed as the skies darkened and lightning began to accumulate around him. Kid Flash and the team who had regained their bearings ran out of the room. A jet of lightning began to rip through the air and was aimed towards Naruto who merely deflected with his sword. A powerful jet of energy zoomed towards Twister who merely threw a bolt of lightning towards it. An explosion rippled before Twister and in a second Naruto was before him and the two began a duel in the air. Twister's wind against Naruto's black fire. Kid Flash said in awe, did you know Cage could do that? Robin shook his head, it's a first for me. Twister dodged a sword strike but was kicked towards the ground by Naruto's high speed roundhouse kick. The android admitted, you are very powerful. Naruto instead of speaking flew toward the android at Mach 4 speeds with his sword ready to decapacitate its head. Twisters fired a powerful stream of wind towards Naruto but his katana was surrounded by black fire that lit the wind up as if it were oil. The team watched in fascination as a black stream of fire flew towards Twister and before the android could react his armor was melting. Naruto's sword impacted into the android's core causing it to die. With a snap of his finger the black flames disappeared. Kid Flash sped up to the standing Naruto and the now disassembled android, he said, dude, that was sick. Naruto's visor and flashed red, Kid Flash gulped as he saw daunting and threatening Naruto looked with his armor. I was just doing my job. Return the broken pieces back to the cave, I believe that Red Tornado would want to have a closer look. He turned to the others and said, I trust that you learnt your lesson now. Superboy growled, and what would that be? Naruto merely replied, that charging into battle without any strategy is a bad idea. There will come a time when I cannot swoop in and save you all. If you don't take this seriously, you will die. With that Naruto flew away from a team that had lost their jovial happiness about their victory as they came to terms with Naruto's words. 
he was after all correct. The truth as to why Batman hadn't assigned any missions began to enter their minds, they simply weren't ready. Hours later Washington DC Dojo Naruto flipped over to avoid a sword strike, he kicked Wonder Woman's back and she was forced to roll over to avoid Naruto's incoming heel kick. The two warriors duped it out, sounds of metal clanging and grunting could be heard from outside. The dojo was part of an abandoned warehouse that Bruce Wayne had brought and renovated for her use. The walls were soundproof and had multiple racks of different weapons in front of them. She grabbed Naruto's thrusted arm and in one fluent motion disarmed him, she spun her blade and aimed the circular hilt at his kidney. Naruto grunted at the jab but was quickly thrown into the wall. He grabbed a bow staff and spun it for good measure. Wonder Woman grinned as she dashed towards him at breakneck speeds, Naruto used his bow staff to keep the distance between her. She dashed underneath his jab and was about to hit him again but Naruto anticipated the movement and grabbed her arm in a twisting motion causing the blade to drop. Wonder Woman wasn't done as she swiped his leg and Naruto fell to the ground, she straddled him and with her arm held both of his arms above his head in a steel-like grip. Her other arm had already grabbed the downed sword and was pointing at Naruto's neck. Naruto could feel her hot breath on his face as she leant down and looked into his purple eyes with a mixture of mirth and daringness, as if she was daring him to escape. He said, it's your win, Wonder Woman. She smiled and released her grip on his hand, it was a good duel as always, Naruto. She threw him a water bottle to her side and Naruto caught it. Batman told me about your fight with the android named Twister. He expressed concerns about how you treated your teammates. Naruto gulped down some water. He responded, I told them the truth. They think just because they fought a few villains over the years that they can win any battle. They dived head first into battle and expected that they would emerge victorious. It's wishful thinking. Wonder Woman sat beside her partner, you must understand Naruto that unlike the two of us they weren't trained from when they could walk. They lead normal lives and for the most part, they don't fight villains. You can't expect them to fight as well as you and you can't expect them to fight as a good as the others in Uzushiogakure. When I first joined the Justice League I saw the same thing you see with your team, I saw a team of powerful people and capable of working as a unit. It was only due to Batman's tactical knowledge that we were able to win. So give them a chance. Naruto sighed, fine. Diana smiled. She stood up, I am heading over to Metropolis, I trust that you will be fine. Naruto merely nodded. He watched as she headed out of the dojo and towards the shower room, no doubt getting ready to go see Superman. Naruto found himself wondering whether he was beginning to develop feelings for Diana. He thought, that's absurd. I would never fall for an Amazon. Besides she was with Superman anyway. He looked at the fallen bow staff and picked it up, he spun it around his neck and impaled it into the wall. He quashed all of the emotions he was currently feeling as a darkness spread through his body. He had a plan and the plan was the most important thing right now. It was more important than the powerful feeling of loneliness that he was feeling. He thought, back in Uzushiogakure, you were royalty, you were important but here you were nothing. It had taken a while to come to terms with that but he realized that it had its perks. He was in an effect a ghost and ghosts didn't leave a trail. Wonder Woman's apartment DC Washington Batman had easily snuck into the apartment, Wonder Woman and Naruto both relied on their skill to ward of intruders rather any form of technology. He walked into Naruto's room, he saw a tripwire and jumped over it. Well it appeared Naruto was quite paranoid. The young Uzumaki's room was quite plain. A queen-sized bed was situated in the middle of the room. A rather intricate computer setup onto the left side beside the wooden wardrobe, he walked to the computer and pressed a few buttons. He narrowed his eyes when he saw the level of encryption that Naruto had put on the machine. He returned the computer back to sleep mode before walking around the room, he stopped at what seemed to be an Othello board with checker, chess and shogi pieces being placed around the board in a seemingly random way. The detective retreated from the room and thought, what game are you playing, Naruto? He couldn't stop feeling the nagging feeling that Naruto was planning something big. Back at the dojo, Naruto grinned as a kanji seal on his arm glowed red. He activated the camera bug in his room and found Batman walking out of his room. His experiment had worked. He figured out that Batman was a master of infiltration but he was incapable of detecting any of his seals. A weakness that Naruto would happily expose. It was time for his next move. Uzumaki Academy Branch. Classroom The Uzumaki Academy was where the branch members trained their children. They taught them how to use their unique powers. 
their abilities and most importantly how to wield chakra to its fullest potential. The royal family were more independent and were trained in the citadel, that wasn't to say that they never brought their children to the academy. The Uzumaki clan had a tradition of a yearly tournaments, the branch members would pit themselves against the royal family. In one classroom, the leader of the branch family Ryu Uzumaki was sitting in front of a classroom filled with children. He was giving them a lecture of the importance of learning how to control one's chakra. A student eagerly asked, Ryu sama, could you show us a jutsu? The old Uzumaki sighed and smiled, this technique is one of my favorite and most versatile in my arsenal. It's called the Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. He crossed two fingers from both hands in a cross like fashion and spiked his chakra. In a plume of smoke, two identical versions of Ryu stood on both sides of him. The image began to fade and another one became clearer. Ryu stood on a large pedestal in front of hundreds of people, he shouted, For too long we have suffered under the tyranny of the royal family. They take out as ours and claim it belongs to them, they brand as slaves whilst they enjoy their lavish lifestyle. I say no more, I say we take back what is ours. A roar of approval followed. Naruto. Robin's voice caused the Uzumaki to jolt of out of his dream, memory viewing. He was getting more and more vivid memories as of late, he was learning things that he had never learned before. Batman wants in the hall for a briefing. We have a mission. Finally, Naruto thought. Naruto followed Robin wincing slightly as information about the cage bunshin jutsu flooded his mind as well as the variations that other Uzumakis had created. Naruto had learned that he would get memories and information via certain cues, they were sometimes random but it was usually an object, a word or a place of familiarities. Isla Santa Prisca. This island nation is the primary source of a dangerous and illegal steroid, a strength-enhancing drug sold under the street name, Venom, Batman explained what the island was. He continued, infrared heat signatures indicate their factory is still operating at full capacity, but all shipments of venom have been inexplicably cut off. A holographic projection of the factory was showed to the team. Batman turned to the team, he told them the mission's objectives, this is a covert recon mission only, observe and report. If the Justice League needs to intervene they will. Naruto zoned out of the rest of the meeting. His HUD was accessing the League's database. He was currently reading files about Santa Prisca. They were not only the largest distributor of venom but were suspected of money laundering. A grin quirked Naruto's lips, he thought, where there were drugs there was usually a large amount of money. His plan was progressing rather well. Naruto saw the team heading off to the bioship and Batman walking away, Naruto asked, why us? Batman turned, he replied monotonously, I'm sure you'll figure that out. With that the caped crusader walked away. Naruto's grin faded, Batman had been keeping tabs on him ever since he had invaded his room. When Naruto returned back to the penthouse, he wasn't surprised to find the house was bugged and rather well. He would have shown it to Wonder Woman but considering that she was beginning to spend more and more time in Metropolis and only came to Washington when she had a diplomatic meeting or for their routine spar, he didn't really see the need. Naruto had seen the team were still edgy but were beginning to train more, Calder and Robin lead the team through a number of simulations whilst Naruto monitored their actions and flaws. He wouldn't say that they were combat ready or even capable of working as a unit but they were getting there. Bioship. Drop zone in 30. Calder stood up and pressed the golden trident on his belt, his usual red armor turned black, he said confidently, ready. Magan nodded and the bioship responded to her command. The floor in front of him opened and Aqualad jumped out into the ocean. The ship was already in camouflage mode. A few minutes later they heard Aqualad, heat and motion sensors are off. Remote weapon systems are down. Cage's voice echoed through the comms. It was his plan to fly ahead, he breached the system by applying seals on his body that made him look as though he possessed no heat signature. We'll rendezvous at drop zone B. Magan confirmed, roger that. She announced, Drop zone B. They all unbuckled. Kid Flash pressed his chest logo of the Flash and his colorful yellow and red suit turned black. He looked at Superboy and said, It's not too late to wear the new stealth tech. Superboy replied coolly, No tights, no capes, no offense. It totally works for you. Magan said dreamily. Superboy looked at her pointedly almost, which caused her to continue nervously, in that you can do good work in those clothes. Naruto's monotonous voice interrupted their little party, less talking and more moving. I am already at the rendezvous point. 
Megan and Kid Flash looked sheepishly as Naruto ordered them to get down. Robin frowned as he buckled up, it appeared that Naruto was already taking leadership of the team even if he had expressed to him privately that he doesn't want to command. He remembered their conversation a few days, flashback, training room, you're improving, Naruto moved quickly to dodge two batrangs and caught one with his fingers. Robin charged at the older and much taller teenager and engaged him in close quarter combat. Naruto showed his superiority by evading all of Robin's attacks. Robin growled, are you just going to dodge? Naruto smirked, you're not giving me a reason not to. A timer went off and Robin almost kicked the floor in frustration. Naruto said, as I said you're improving Robin. Robin grounded out, clearly not enough. Naruto smiled, this isn't about me anymore, is it? It was more of a statement than a question. Robin answered smoothly, I was reckless and stupid when I was fighting against Twister. I should have utilized the team's abilities more effectively. It was a lesson like any other Robin. You learned that even though you were trained by Batman that there are limitations to your abilities. This team doesn't have a leader, it doesn't have someone that can rally them at a single notice and as such it remains disjointed. Robin looked at Naruto with a curious expression, so who do you think can lead this team? Batman told me that he saw you as a very capable strategist. Naruto shook his head, I will not be the leader of this team, it will be either you or Calder. The others lack the focus and the strategical know-how to lead a team through covert missions. Robin smirked, so you think I can lead this team? Naruto reciprocated the boy wonder's smirk, we'll just have to see. Flashback ended boom. Superboy's landing had caused a large sonic wave to spread across a large radius. Superboy said, I told you I didn't need a line. Naruto's voice came from the shadows behind them, and yet you just announced a presence to everyone in the nearby vicinity. I know that you were just a few months old but did Cadmus not teach you the meaning of the word covert? Everyone turned in surprise as Naruto blended out of the darkness behind them. Robin was the first to notice the difference in attire as he stepped out into the light. He was dressed more like a heavily armored titan and more like a member of the League of Shadows. He was dressed in black garb made out of what seemed to be cloth, he wore armor around his knees, elbow, shin and a pair of gauntlets on his hand. The only thing that told them it was Cage was his visor. It made Robin wonder whether Naruto was trained to be an assassin, a shiver ran up his spine as he thought of Naruto as a more dangerous form of deathstroke. The boy wonder narrowed his eyes and decided to focus on the mission. Superboy growled at Naruto bawling his fists at the mention of his pervious captors, Naruto shrugged, I know they tried to make a clone of Superman but they should have really modulated your behavior better. It comes as no surprise that Superman doesn't want anything to do with you. Superboy was about to jump at Naruto but Kid Flash said, Um guys should we really be fighting? Superboy turned to Kid to glare at him but found that his momentary distraction allowed for Naruto to slip away. Robin noticed as Naruto gave a salute. Magan said, Aqualad, drop B is go. Aqualad replied, head for the factory, I'll track your GPS and rendezvous with you. Roger that. The group of four dashed into the forest disappearing into the night. With Naruto Naruto was doing his own work, he had tried and failed to create clones which would have helped greatly with his little side quest to find and acquire the money in the factory. He jumped from one tree to the next before stopping when he saw a squadron of two groups heading towards each other. They wore different clothes and seemed to be ready for combat, Naruto knew that they weren't looking for them which meant that they were going to attack each other. Well at least Batman was right, his HUD zoomed into the face of a large muscular man with what seemed to be wrestler's mask on. Information was uploaded, it came as no surprise to see Bane here considering he was the main user of Venom and the main distributor of it in Gotham. Oh god. Naruto almost facepalmed when Kid Flash stumbled in front of Bane. Both groups startled when Bane began starting shooting. Bullets could be heard throughout the jungle, Naruto sighed as he jumped down into the forest. Robin. Superboy and Miss Martian entered the fray, the skirmish between the two opposing groups halted as they combined their efforts in quashing the intruders. Naruto skillfully landed, the group of people wearing red robes began to fire rapidly at him. Naruto sighed as a beam of energy erupted from his visor, it knocked half of them a few hundred meters away. He ducked to avoid getting him by the back of automatic rifle before swiping the man's legs. His punch sent him sailing into the tree. 
One of them escaped running into the forest but Naruto was not worried about him considering that Aqualad was running after the escapee. He stopped a hail of bullets with his gravity manipulation and crushed them. Naruto mimicked a pushing motion with his hand and a wave of gravity knocked all of the group back to the ground and unconscious. Robin flipped over a target as he leveraged the momentum from his jump to throw one of the goons into the tree. He cried, why didn't you guys follow my lead and vanish into the jungle? Wally sarcastically said, is that what you were doing? We're not mind readers you know. Miss Martian became visible and knocked two goons into the tree with her TK. Kid Flash looked at her, well not all of us anyway. They heard a rustling from behind and then the crackling of electricity as Aqualad knocked his target out. Robin looked at the downed goon with the red robe, he said, wait I know these guys, they're from the cult of Cobra. Aqualad said skeptically, I believe Batman would have informed us if such a group as extreme as the cult of Cobra were running the island. Naruto replied, they took it forcefully. He threw a cultist into the ground, all of them saw the man muttering gibberish as if his brain were fried. Robin asked suspiciously, what did you do to him? Standard interrogation, the rest of the team looked apprehensively at the cultist and Naruto. Wally asked, what do we do now? Since you decided to inform all of the island of our presence Wally, we have two choices go to the factory and get ready for a large amount of resistance or withdraw and inform Batman that the team was incapable of performing a simple reconnaissance mission. Kid Flash shouted at Naruto, hey I know you don't want to be placed onto this team and all but you don't get to always mock us. We never wanted you in the first place. Superboy seemingly agreed with Kid's opinion. Naruto snorted, fine, find your own way into the factory. I am going by myself. He sped out into the forest. Kid shouted, can you believe that guy, he thinks he is all high and mighty. Robin replied coolly, well it was kind of your fault. Well excuse me if I don't stack up to your expectation. We are not all trained by Batman. It was true. Robin was the only one in this team that was trained in covert operations except for Naruto. The rest of the team were forced to improvise and the fact that this type of environment along with the pressure made them prone to making mistakes. Robin looked at his mini computer and sighed, Cage switched off his GPS. We are on our own now. Aqualad looked to his team, how will we get into the factory? Robin pointed to the tied up Bane, he'll help us. Factory Naruto had easily breached the security, he had opted for sneaking past the guards than knocking them out. The amount of product that they were currently moving was insane. He would leave the information gathering to Robin and the team. He needed to find what he came here for before the group breaches the factory. Back with the team Bane had agreed to help them get into the factory, he claimed that the enemy of his enemy were his allies for now at least. Robin knew that the Spanish-speaking wrestler would betray them the second they got clear but for now he begrudgingly accepted Bane's help. The factory would after all be on high alert after Kid Flash blew their cover. He just hoped that Naruto had knocked a large portion of them out before they had gotten there. Robin and the team stood on a cliff and he watched through binoculars as a large amount of shipment was being taken from the factory. He said, look at all that product. He surveyed the area that the shipment was going. A buy is going down but if Cobra is not selling it to the normal suspects. We need to identify the buyers. Kid Flash added, just what I was thinking. Robin replied sarcastically, because you're the thinker of the team. Wally interjected, sarcasm, dude. A real leader would focus on getting answers. Bane picked a large boulder and removed it from a cave entrance, he told the two squabbling children in the team, answers are this way. Oh great. Wally muttered, so now El Luchador is our leader. Robin shoved him in the arm to tell him to focus at the mission. The team walked through the tunnel trailing closely behind Bane, they entered a massive warehouse where venom was being pumped through red vats. Robin announced, all clear. He rolled to the side and disappeared as the team walked into the warehouse. Bane frowned, has the little fool already been caught? Aqualad sighed, no he just does that. Kid Flash put his infrared googles and said, wait here I'll get the information we need before the boy wonder returns. Aqualad tried to say, no kid, wait, but the young speedster ran deeper into the factory. Bane sarcastically said, great chain of command. The three remaining team members looked at each other. They needed a plan and fast. Bane lead them across the factory, they snuck behind the pipes and ducked behind a crater. They saw Cobra followers moving the shipment. They're only moving the new shipment, they aren't touching the old ones. 
Miss Martian tried to be helpful by adding, maybe freshness counts. Bane felt like snorting at the girl's stupidity but kept his mouth shut as Superboy announced, helicopters coming. They all locked towards the open hangar room and saw a helicopter arriving. Meanwhile Robin was currently hacking into Cobra's computer systems. Kid Flash sped into the room, find anything? He asked. Chemical formulas. Kid Flash sped up to the computer as he ate some of his bar. I'm guessing it has something to do with venom. Kid Flash pointed his chocolate bar at the screen. That's the chemical formula of venom and that's, no, that's the blockbuster formula from Cadmus. The combination makes the drug three times more powerful and permanent. Robin deduced. The buyer must also be the supplier then. They must have been looking to improve upon the original serum. He tried to speak through the communication link to his teammates, Robin to Aqualad, static. Someone was radio jamming them. They couldn't get communicate anymore. Rooftop as the military grade chopper landed, an infamous assassin stepped out. He wore what appeared to a gray hockey mask and arm length gauntlets. His vest appeared to laced with Kevlar. He marched towards Cobra, who was flanked by two of his most powerful henchmen. He greeted, Lord Cobra. The humanoid snake replied, Sportsmaster. A woman with bright orange hair held a briefcase. She opened it, revealing vials filled with purple liquid. The shipment is ready. Sportsmaster took a vial and inspected it, the new Cobra Venom. Finally, with this, we can fight the Justice League. In the air, Miss Martian remained invisible and watched the meeting. She relayed, Aqualad, I am sending the mental image of the buyer to you now. Aqualad replied, So what's the plan now? Bane smirked, I have a plan. He leapt over the ledge and began to attack the two Cobra henchmen below. Aqualad hissed, What is he doing? Cobra became alerted and Mammoth smashed through the window to engage in a brawl with the villain. Superboy and Aqualad's ledge was destroyed and they were sent to the ground. Cobra's henchmen began to flood the room. Cobra shouted, destroy them. He never noticed a shadow move behind him. Sportsmaster sensed a disturbance and was forced to dodge as a katana almost slashed his head off. The assassin grinned, a fellow assassin. Naruto had spent the better part of the last 20 minutes placing explosive tags across the factory. He had found where Cobra kept his money, a small vault in a hut outside the factory. He sealed what appeared to be close to half a million dollars into a scroll before heading back to the team. Sportsmaster answered, So you must be Cage. Naruto's eyes narrowed at the mention of his codename, Who do you work for? Sportsmaster replied, You'll have to beat it out of me. He draws out a metal rod that folds out into a javelin. He threw it not at Naruto but the invisible Miss Martian, she managed to dodge it but was thrown across the room when the javelin exploded. It would be my pleasure. The two warriors dashed towards each other but Sportsmaster soon found himself overwhelmed. Superboy rolled out of the way and attempted to tackle Mammoth to the ground. Mammoth however reversed the young Kryptonian's plan and threw Superboy into Aqualad. More Cobra henchmen entered the room and they found themselves getting overwhelmed. Aqualad telepathically shouted, Miss Martian, link us all together. A powerful gravity wave sent dozens of henchmen flying as they tried to stop Naruto from attacking Sportsmaster. The assassin flipped out of the way and replied, Using your powers against a feeble human, tisk tisk, I thought you had more honor than that cage. Naruto sheathed his sword and raised his fists for combat, I don't need my powers to beat you. So you say. Sportsmaster dashed towards him and Naruto was quick on his feet to evade a roundhouse kick before he grabbed the man's outstretched limb and brought him down to the ground. He jerked his leg with surprising strength causing the assassin's body to fly upwards and Naruto's boot smashed into his armored back. Sportsmaster groaned, had it not been for his armor his spine would have been severely compromised. Cobra meanwhile was getting tired of this nuisance, he saw the familiar face of the boy wonder and said mockingly, Batman must be getting desperate, if he sends you here. Robin pointed back towards all the fighting, the way I see it your buyer seems to be having a hard time against us. Cobra exclaimed mockingly, it doesn't matter. So long as I know the formula, I can always make more. Aqualad to all, we need to retreat and regroup. Naruto's cold voice echoed throughout his mind, no, you guys go, I'll hold them off. Everyone was surprised that Naruto was willing to do that for them. Aqualad replied, you heard Cage. Let's go. As each of them began to retreat, Naruto was forced to release Sportsmaster as Mammoth tried to barrel into him. He flipped over the beast and placed a tag on him, 
Sportsmaster, Mammoth, Cobra and his goons began to regroup in front of him. Naruto sensed that his team was a fair distance away. Cobra shouted, take the shipment and go. He threw Sportsmaster the case and ordered the assassin to run. Naruto was going to fly after him but Mammoth shot forward. He groaned as the beast grappled him to the ground. Naruto did a hand sign and said, Fuinjutsu. Fukusoku no Kote Ikaken. Mammoth screamed as his arms were bent backwards and what appeared to be steel crossing around him. He broke some of the steel off but found that it regenerated. Cobra decided to run towards the chopper but found the team there fighting off Sportsmaster and Shimmer. Naruto waved his hand and a massive amount of gravity threw Cobra and his goons to the side. Naruto replied, You have nowhere to go Cobra. The villain grew angry at the teenager in front of him. His plan had been foiled by mere kids. Such blasphemy could not be tolerated in his eyes. He would make Naruto bow before him. He took of his robe and raised his hands to get ready for combat. The sound of a chopper rang throughout the factory, Cobra chuckled. It appears your teammates are as not skilled as you believe them to be. You can either stay here and fight me or you can try and stop the shipment. Naruto flew out of the window to see Shimmer getting tied up by Robin. An injured Superboy was holding Miss Martian. Naruto saw the plane flying in the distance, his visor flashed red as a jet of blue light ripped from him and strayed at the chopper. Miss Martian grinned as she activated the C4 and the plane blew up. Naruto turned to see that Cobra had vanished and would most likely not be found. Naruto in hopes of catching Cobra decided to activate the paper tags that were placed around the plant. An explosion shook the area where the team, the chopper flying straight into the plant. Had Naruto been paying attention he would have seen Sportsmaster jump out of the plane and into the forest. Aqualad and Kid Flash appeared before them, Bane is secure. Aqualad told them, the Justice League should be arriving soon. Robin cackled, I'm glad I didn't take up the leadership position, he looked pointedly at Aqualad, I'd hate to have to tell Batman how this miss happened. Kid Flash slapped the Atlantean on the back, cheer up, at least we can say we took down a major villain. Only Miss Martian noticed Naruto vanishing into the night. Naruto heard in his mind, thank you. Not hearing a reply Miss Martian shut of her mental link with Naruto and peered into the night with a frown. Was he ever going to trust them? It took the rest only a minute or so to recognize that Naruto had disappeared. Kid Flash said, I swear to go he's like a ninja. Robin could merely nod, Naruto reminded him of Batman, Robin had still not gotten better at detecting his tutor when he disappeared. Naruto was just as good if not better at disappearing but that could be due to his super speed. A simple recon mission. Observe and report. Each of the team members lined up in front of the caped crusader dressed in civilian clothing. He walked around and said, you'll each receive a written evaluation informing each of you of your many mistakes. Until then good job. Apart from Robin and Naruto the team seemed utterly surprised at Batman's sudden praise. No battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. How you adjust to the unforeseen is what determines success and how you choose who leads determines character. He stopped and stared into Naruto's violet eyes not missing the small and upward quirk of his mouth. Batman said, do you have something to add, Naruto? Naruto smiled, Karl von Clausewitz, he pointed out that no matter how carefully one plans, on the battlefield, even the smallest of details can cause setbacks. Regardless of how well thought out it is, armchair strategizing only works in the realm of theory. Unexpected troubles can jeopardize an operation especially one as sensitive as an infiltration in Recon 1. You knew that the cult of Cobra was there but you wanted to see how we could handle it. All of them looked surprised at Naruto's revelation. Robin's eyes widened slightly as he realized that Naruto was telling the truth. Batman merely smirked before he left the mission room. Megan asked, how long did you know? Naruto shrugged, I had my suspicions all along. Robin facepalmed as he muttered, I should have seen it. Naruto informed them, Batman had his reasons for doing what he did. He needed to know whether you were capable of missions such as these. Covert operations are unlike the normal skirmishes you have with the villains in your respective cities. You aren't in an area of familiarity and the enemy has that advantage, you must be prepared for your plan to fail and when it does you must be ready to improvise. We did a good job, we took down the largest supplier of venom and may have saved innocent lives in Gotham or any other city it used in. Calder looked at Naruto and saw the fierceness in his eyes, he said, I want you to be team leader. Wally jumped in, 
Calder, we voted you team leader. Calder shook his head, Naruto has shown to be the superior tactician. Naruto replied, strategy is important in winning any battle but Calder you have gained the trust of your teammate and with it you have gained something that is even more important than any strategy I could come up with, loyalty. For that reason alone, I can say that you should be the leader. Calder nodded in respect to his fellow teammate. Naruto said, until next time. He walked off towards the Zeta tube and boomed himself back to DC Washington. Hours later Washington DC Park Naruto sat on a table moving the chess pieces on his own. He heard from behind him, Fisher and Spassky, Game 4, I heard you were quite the strategist. Naruto replied emotionless, considering the fact that you didn't even try to mask your presence away from me says that you aren't. A feminine voice melodiously chuckled as she took seat in front of him. I came here just to talk. Naruto's violet eyes looked at the slender, dark-skinned woman with dark blue eyes and long black hair. Naruto said, you have my full attention. We've been watching you for quite some time now, Uzumaki Naruto. You have caught our interest. She said, we wish for you to work for us. And who are you? The woman smiled slightly, people who can grant you your freedom. Naruto narrowed his eyes, I'm not in prison or a slave of any kind, my freedom already exists. She passed him an envelope, the Justice League has been monitoring your activities for a long time. They have already created enough contingency plans to subdue you should you go rogue. I have known of this for a long time, Batman has made it no secret that he doesn't trust me, you still haven't given me any initiative. Open the envelope. Naruto did as he was asked and saw a audio player, he played the tape. Diana, have you found Cage's weakness? He heard Wonder Woman's reply, it's me. Then it's decided. You will remain close to Cage, earn his trust. Batman's voice could be heard. Naruto's grip on the table increased until small cracks formed beneath the chessboard. She smiled, so do we have a deal? Her coy voice seemed to be almost mocking him. Elsewhere Sportsmaster said, I only managed to procure a single ampule of Cobra Venom. He stood in front of five screens with light figures. The screen allocated to L4 was switched off. The French voice of L6 said, perhaps the drug can be reverse engineered. L1 spoke, what of our young heroes? First, Cadmus, then Mr. Twister. Now, Santa Prisca. Once is happenstance, twice is coincidence but three times is enemy action. He spoke with voice filled with pure power, enemies of the light must not stand. Naruto stared intently at the dark-skinned woman, how do I know that you're not lying? Considering the fact that you managed to bug the Justice League's headquarters means you have a lot of power and resources. Surely someone of your stature has the resources to fake the tape. Queen Bee chuckled with mirth. Oh come now Mr. Uzumaki, I am sure you are intelligent enough to know that such a course of action is counterintuitive. She was right but Naruto was still apprehensive to trust her. She saw his apprehension and decided to elate it, perhaps some time to think would help. She smiled as she stood up, I'll be sure to contact you, my liege. She bowed royally before she stalked off into the night. He gripped the stone table harder as it strained to remain standing. She was mocking him, reminding him of what he was. The fall of Uzushiogakure left him with nothing except an empty title, a title that meant nothing anymore. He was after all a king of nothing. Kyoto Japan. C-1, in position and ready. C-2, in position and ready. Naruto surveyed from a hill the location that he was meant to be targeting, it was a relatively large Japanese-styled mansion, Batman had said that Intel had shown that the owner had used his connections to steal a Quake Pulsar. Batman wanted it returned to STAR Labs as soon as possible. The branch in Japan had authorized Naruto to take it to American soil in hopes that it wouldn't be stolen again. He had advised the caped crusader that this mission should be a solo one, it was after all too sensitive to send in a group of rookies into foreign soil to retrieve a stolen weapon from a man that had a large amount of sway in East Asia. Batman had seemed to agree after some research into the man. Naruto was not even allowed to wear anything remotely similar to his normal attire, if he was spotted, the US would more than likely extradite him to the Japanese and since he had no records, it would be rather easy for him to be silenced, if he were a normal human. So here he was dressed in a track suit with a balaclava. He had spent the better part of two days tracking the whereabouts of the Quake Pulsar. His clones had already flanked the building. They had placed seals across the building, he had created them specifically for this mission. 
The seals would release would release a powerful knockout gas that would flood the mansion. It would give Naruto a window of 10 minutes to get in, take the pulsar and leave. All without leaving a trace. All right. Flood it. C1 and C2 replied, Roger that. The guards unaware as the colorless knockout gas flooded every inch of the mansion and surrounding area. Naruto said, you know the drill. The two clones nodded and dispelled, his head throbbed as an influx of information entered his mind. Naruto jumped from the hill, his body rocketing towards the front of the mission. It took Naruto, eight minutes to find the safe that held the quake pulsar. He unsealed a scroll and began the process to seal the pulsar. The owner was on his desk, unconscious and drooling over his paperwork. Naruto packed it up and sped out of the house, bang. Naruto merely raised his hand and the bullet stopped right in front of him. Judging by its size and the speed that it had been traveling, Naruto assumed it had come from a sniper rifle and a very powerful one. He closed his eyes and pulsed out his chakra using it as a form of echolocation, he sensed nine people in the forest directly in front of him. He shouted, come out, you cannot hide from me. A demented laugh echoed as a group of eight people walked out of the forest, the last one was perched on a tree branch. Naruto stared at them, he knew a large portion of the group, they were all villains of major heroes like Batman and the Flash. He listed their nicknames in his head, Killer Frost, Harley Quinn, Captain Boomerang, Killer Croc. The sniper perched on the treetop was most likely Deadshot. He looked at the remaining four people that stood in front of him, he had not been able to recognize them. Harley Quinn swung a baseball on her back and said, Give us the Quake Pulsar and we may let you live. Her tone sounded like that of a jovial child but Naruto didn't miss the hidden deadliness undertone. No uniform. No swords. Minimal use of powers. Batman's orders floated to the forefront of his mind. Naruto's eyes narrowed and he remembered that each of the villains was meant to be locked up tight in Bell Reeve, one of the only facilities capable of holding these monsters. Batman to Cage, do you have the package? Batman's voice echoed through his comms. Naruto muttered, Yes, I do but I have a little situation. Do you have any idea why Harley Quinn, Killer Frost and a group of villains are here in Japan? Cage. Disengage now. They're the, static. Naruto removed the calm and crushed it with his boot. Harley Quinn shouted, Now, now, we can't have you calling in reinforcements. Naruto growled, Don't need any. But he guessed it was time to withdraw. He drew a flashbang and threw it on the ground. The team turned around for a few seconds before they turned their gaze back to Naruto's previous position only to find that he had gone. Waller, he's gone and he took the package. A woman wearing what appeared to be modernized samurai armor and a white porcelain half mask that covered the top half of her face approached the site of Naruto's disappearance. She saw a paper tag on the ground it was inscribed with a special writing, centering around the kanji for, explode. She muttered, by Kami, she turned to her teammates and shouted, everyone run they didn't have time as the paper tag began to ignite killer frost ran to her teammate and used her cryokinetic abilities to make a dense ice dome around the explosive tag the explosion shattered the ice as if it were glass killer frost muttered something about how her ice should have stopped the explosion from ever occurring all of the suicide squad heard this is waller prepare for immediate extraction and debriefing Amanda Waller had realized that her team's secret existence was probably severely compromised when the Quake Pulsar turned up in STAR labs in Gotham. Would Batman become more aggressive in his tactics to shut down the Suicide Squad? Why was the Caped Crusader using a covert operative to retrieve a very dangerous weapon? Amanda Waller wanted answers and she would get them, by force if necessary. Next day morning Washington DC Wonder Woman eyed her protege suspiciously, for the past few days he would rarely speak to her. When he did, he sounded tired and incredibly cold. What happened to him whilst she had gone to Metropolis, she needed to know. She said, Naruto. I made us breakfast. Naruto who had been working intently on a computer program merely gazed up from his laptop screen. He replied in a tone that seemed incredibly cautious, I don't want any but I thank you for making some. To Wonder Woman, his words never reached his eyes. He didn't seem at all grateful. She narrowed her eyes but before she could speak, her Justice League communicator began to vibrate indicating that she was needed. She gave him a pointed look telling him that they would talk about this later. Naruto let out a soft growl, he didn't want anything to do with the the Meiskeren. He heard a robotic voice from his laptop, 
I hate to disturb you at this hour, but I am sorry to report that I have absolutely nothing on the woman you told me. Her name is Queen Bee but that is just about it, her origins are unknown and whoever this group is, they seem to be smart enough not to leave a single trace behind. If I didn't know you, I would say that you were lying. Naruto merely muttered, thank you. The voice droned, anytime mate. Whilst it was true that Naruto didn't have any contacts that would be able to match the caliber of this mysterious organization, he did know a few people on the dark web that he had helped on more than one occasion. He didn't exactly trust them with his life or anything but they were the closest he could get to an ally at the moment. He walked towards his bedroom, he needed some time to think. He needed a plan but his mind was so addled about Wonder Woman's apparent betrayal that he simply couldn't think straight. His eyes narrowed at the Othello board, he knew for one that he couldn't trust anyone anymore even the mysterious woman he had met mostly likely had a secret agenda. The question that remained was, which one was the lesser of two evils, was it the Justice League or was it this mysterious organization? Or perhaps it was time that he walked his own path, he had much to ponder about and he was destitute of both time and information. Happy Harbor Mount Justice Zeta Chamber August 3rd. 13. Recognized B05, Cage. Recognized B04, Superboy. The two appeared out of the neighboring Zeta Beam chambers, they briefly looked at each other before Superboy turned away huffing. Apparently, the clone was irritated by something, not that he was in the mood to socialize himself. Megan asked, how was Metropolis, Superboy? The clone didn't even reply but instead continued to walk through a holographic hockey table that Kid Flash and Calder had been playing on. Naruto raised an eyebrow, it appeared that Superman wanted nothing to do with the clone. That was after all quite understandable, Naruto wouldn't know what to do if someone had made a clone of him, he probably wouldn't go near the abomination. Ahem. A small cough was heard from one of the tunnels adjacent to the Zeta Bam chambers. Ready for training everyone. The team turned to see Black Canary and the Martian Manhunter enter the room. Megan shouted happily, Uncle Jean, she ran up and hugged him. The elder Martian replied, Megan, I was in the area so I came to see how you were adjusting to life on Earth. A few bumps on the way but I am learning, Megan said. Glad to hear that. Naruto and Black Canary both observed as Superboy frowned and began to walk out of the room. Stick around. You might learn a thing or two. The superheroine told him. Class is now in session. She walked into the center of the circular projection pad and it lit up. She turned to the group, I consider it an honor to be your teacher. I'll throw a lot at you. Everything that I have learned from my mentors. She winced slightly as she took off her jacket. And from my own bruises. Both Superboy and Naruto watched with disinterest, one because he believed that the metahuman had nothing to teach him and the other because he believed that the heroine was much too weak to beat him. Are you okay? Megan asked. Black Canary dismissed her concerns. Just the job. She spoke as though to tell the sidekicks that their occupation was filled with potential hazards, not that they needed to be told. Now combat is an art and in order for you to win, you must dictate the flow of the battle on your own terms. I will need a sparring partner. Ooh, me. Wally said excitedly. He did a flirtatious pose that seemed to amuse instead of disgust Black Canary. Probably because she was dating the Green Arrow. After this, I'll show you my moves. Naruto almost shook his head in pure exasperation, he could see the minute details of Black Canary's body, her muscles tightening, her pulse quickening and her facial features beginning to slack as she entered a mode that allowed her to react passively to Kid Flash. It was obvious that her senses weren't quick enough to handle Kid Flash's speed, but she was trained to react the second he tried to attack her. Of course, this method had plenty of weaknesses, but it was her best bet and it wouldn't have worked against those with the full set of superhuman physiological traits, they would outmatch Black Canary with ease. Kid Flash was unprepared but Naruto saw her movements in slow motion, she began a frontal assault that led to Kid Flash stepping back, she saw the opportunity and swept his leg. The young speedster fell on his back. How pathetic. Naruto thought. He closed his eyes and sighed. He had no idea why he was still here. Superboy rant snapped him out of his stupor. Oh please with my powers there is no way I would lose. Naruto smiled. He had a chance now. For once I agree with the clone. You are a low-level metahuman, Canary. Both Superboy and Black Canary snapped their heads to the armored teenager. Black Canary seemed unfazed, perhaps a demonstration then, Cage. 
Naruto stepped onto the ring, he said monotonously, such hubris coming from you black canary. Allow me to bring you back down to earth. She never spoke but instead chose to charge him, Naruto merely dodged each of her attacks. Black Canary thought she was pushing him back, she aimed a kick to his knee, Naruto simply shifted his body forward and pushed her, she nearly stumbled to the ground. You cannot beat me, Canary, even if you were to use your pathetic bird cry. She growled and then she screamed but it never reached her vocal cords. Naruto moved at a blurring speed before delivering a powerful kick to her diaphragm. Canary was flung from her spot to the wall, Naruto's gravity powers stopped her from hitting the wall. A stunned silence filled the room and none of them even noticed the appearance of Batman on the screen. Naruto turned and said, perhaps you should assign a stronger teacher next time, Batman. He walked out of the room. The silence that permeated across the room was interrupted by Batman, I have a mission for you. Batman didn't need Naruto for this mission, he would talk to the kid later. With Naruto atop the ocean that once held Uzushiogakure, Naruto looked at the rampant tides and then back to the sky, as if he would get an answer to his unspoken question. He felt so hopeless, he didn't want to be here, he would rather he died with his mother than living in a world like this. His life in Uzushiogakure was a simple and fulfilling one, his life here was anything but that. It was complicated, everyone was out to get each other. A war that was fought in the shadows, one where the heroes were not heroes but a group of self-righteous warriors who fought for their definition of what was, justice. He had no idea how long he had been here, hours must have passed as he sat levitating over the ocean. His mind lost in memories of his past. Metropolis Diana had just arrived to see Clark walk out of the diner, her eyes went to Bruce Wayne who remained seated with a stoic expression on his face. She walked up to Bruce and said, what are you doing here? Bruce narrowed his eyes at Diana, her facial expression indicated that she was under a lot of stress. Superboy has become increasingly volatile and it is because Clark doesn't wish to take responsibility. His history with his clones makes him believe that Connor will turn out to be just the same. Bruce continued, Diana, I need to know, is Naruto going to turn on us? Diana seemed apprehensive, why would you believe that? Bruce narrowed his eyes at her apprehension. Diana began to feel uncomfortable as Bruce peered right through her. What do you know? He asked no demanded from the the Meiskeren. Nothing definitive or anything that could help you with your investigation. All I know is that he began to harbor a lot ill will towards me recently. Bruce looked into the distance, his mind trying to connect the seemingly disconnected points. Hmm, perhaps he believes that we are just using him or perhaps he knows something that would cause such animosity to arise. It's too real to be random. But why me? Diana asked. Bruce looked into her blue eyes and replied, he knows. He stood up abruptly and walked out of the room, leaving without his pie. Diana seemed all the more confused about what was going on. Shrugging she took Bruce's pie and began to dig in knowing that he wouldn't come back for it. She understood that Bruce Wayne now saw Naruto as a very dangerous enemy. God save them if Naruto were to access his demonic form. She would have to return to the Mischira in due time. Only Hephaestus would be capable of forging a weapon that could bring down an Uzumaki. Back with the team they had failed, failed to complete their objective. Professor Ivo's Amazo had been stolen from right under their noses by a horde of robotic monkeys. It was an embarrassing defeat, once again they had realized that they were weak. It seemed so surreal that when Batman and the other leaguers addressed them that they weren't ready to join the league that they would be so right. Right now, they made a bad strategical error as it was only a matter of time before Amazo would awaken and perhaps amass more power. This was bad, if Amazo became any more powerful they would stand no chance against the android. It would be helpful if Naruto was here. Superboy in blinded rage decided to chase after the monkeys and Amazo leaving behind his earpiece and a team that had no idea what to do next. Megan said, this Professor Evo if he is alive, seems to be two steps ahead of us. She asked apprehensively, M maybe W we should contact Red Tornado? Aqualad disagreed, Tornado always tells us to handle things ourselves, and the mission can still succeed if we recover the parts before they're reassembled. Kid Flash sarcastically, well, that's a great plan, except for the part about us not knowing where to look. Robin smirked as he contemplated the various ways to track the monkeys down, he explained, maybe we do. We'd have heard by now if the decoy trucks had been attacked. So how did these monkeys know exactly which trucks to target? 
Robin began to examine the robotic monkeys and found something. Ha! Huh? The parts have GPS. The monkeys can track the signal, which means I can track them with the one I captured. It looks both sets of parts are converging on Gotham City. Aqualad said, that far south, Magan and I will not get there anytime soon. Robin said, I am sending Kid ahead, I will join him later. He tapped his computer gauntlet and entered a code, he prayed that it worked. Static, Robin, what do you want? Cage, thank God. We were hijacked and some android monkeys took Amazo's body parts. I fear that they will assemble Amazo before we get there. Robin heard a deep sigh before Naruto spoke, fine, send me the coordinates. Naruto sounded tired and Robin hated it, he hated how much they had to rely on Naruto as a crutch every time they felt something remotely dangerous but if the stories of Amazo were true, then he suspected that Naruto would be the only one who could stop him. He just hoped Amazo hadn't copied all the powers of the Justice League yet or else this was going to turn into a massacre. Gotham Academy the entire team lay defeated on the cracked wooden floor of the basketball hall, at first they seemed to be winning, they even managed to attack Evo to depower Amazo but then it changed and some advanced protocol allowed it to access the full power of those that he had copied. With MM's psionic abilities and Adam's ability to manipulate energy and molecular transmutation, it was a losing battle. Evo cackled, each of you is pathetic copies of the originals. You could barely handle a weak Amazo let alone one that has access to the full power set of those it has copied. I guess this is goodbye, children. Robin ground his teeth as he tried to get up but he felt so tired, his mind barely hanging on to consciousness. Where was he? Did he leave them? The last thing he saw was Amazo charging up an atomic blast and a blue energy wave rushing towards the android. I guess I am late to the party. Heavy footsteps echoed as Naruto entered the hall. Evo felt the amount of power permeating from the armored behemoth. Naruto twirled his blades and said, I heard that you copied the Justice League's abilities. Let's see how much you compare. With insane speed, Naruto rushed towards Amazo, who had begun to fire a barrage of atomic blasts, but Naruto's blades deflected each of them. Amazo was forced to backpedal as Naruto almost cut off its head. Access Martian Manhunter his sword passed through the android but Naruto merely smiled as the blade began to vibrate and a screeching electricity emerged from the blade. Amazo sent Naruto flying by accessing its telekinesis but at the cost of the electricity frying some of its internals. Access Superman. A scorching beam erupted for each of its eyes but Naruto replied with his own optic blast. A large explosion rung through the hall as both Naruto and Amazo met in the center. No holding back. Naruto thought. He dodged a punch from the android and released a gravity-enhanced uppercut that sent it flying straight into the night sky. Naruto rocketed upwards and fired an optic blast that sent the android further into the sky. The android tried to halt Naruto's ascension by releasing a powerful gust of air from its mouth but Naruto's acceleration was powerful enough to rip through the wind. Amazo reacted in time to dodge Naruto's sword but found itself being launched straight to the ground by a kick. Naruto once again released an even more powerful optic beam causing Amazo to be forced to access Martian Manhunter. Naruto noted that there was a time lag before the android could activate its abilities, it was around 5 seconds. He grinned as he began to formulate a plan to destroy the android, he felt himself being jerked towards Amazo through some sort of telekinesis. Naruto let himself get dragged as he slowly enclosed gravity around himself and the android. The closer he got the stronger the gravity became and Amazo felt its circuitry begin to snap under the unearthly amount of gravity. Down below, the earth began to crack and the team who had just awakened found themselves being face faulted to the ground. Naruto grinned, under such conditions only he could function. Amazo tried to phase but found Naruto throwing his Tatsuka blade straight through it, a million amps were discharged from the sword and Amazo was shocked back into rematerializing. Severe damage detected. Access Super Arc. A dull thud echoed as Naruto's Tatsuka blade pierced Amazo from behind. Naruto said, Goodbye. A black fire ripped through the air and burnt the Amazo until all that remained were flickers of metallic dust. Meanwhile, a few miles away, the Justice League were approaching Gotham Academy. Batman asked, Status report. Superman, what do you see? Superman replied, Cage has destroyed the Amazo. Flash asked worriedly, what about the others? Superman's eyes glowed white as he scanned the area using his X-ray vision, they are currently in the basketball hall. 
They seem to be fine. That was all Flash needed to hear as he rushed towards the hall. Wonder Woman said, I am going on ahead, I need to speak to Na Cage. Batman said, No, Diana, wait, but she wouldn't listen as she flew towards where Naruto was levitating. Superman, Supergirl, Zatara, Captain Marvel and Captain Atom. I want you all stand by in case Cage does something. Supergirl questioned, Why would he do something? Batman seemed apprehensive, I made a mistake. All the Justice Leaguers looked at the caped crusader who was cruising on his jet in slight shock. Batman was not one to admit his mistakes. Careful all of you, if he could defeat Amazo by himself there is no telling what he is capable of. With Naruto Naruto heard Batman's orders and simply smiled, it appeared that Batman's deductive skills hadn't waned in the slightest. Naruto. He heard Diana shout and he merely turned to his mentor his visor flashing red and ethereal black flames dancing around his armor. What is it the Miskrin? Diana froze when she heard him call him that, she steeled herself and replied, tell me what I have done to receive such hatred. It sounded like a plea. Naruto merely chuckled, don't pretend to like me, the Miskrin. I know of the accord between you and Batman. Diana looked puzzled but then she remembered, the first day that she learned that Naruto was an Uzumaki. Batman had approached her and asked if she knew of any of the boy's weaknesses and she replied that it was her. Naruto growled, so you finally remember. It was a ploy wasn't it Amazonian, I thought that your people were one of honor, but I guess I was wrong. Diana said firmly, I acknowledge my mistake, Naruto but I ask that we move past it. You were like me, lost in a world that you had only hatred for and I know what that path leads down but after I got to know you, I choose to ignore Batman's orders. Naruto replied, then I can only assume you know what will happen now. Diana understood that this meant he was going to leave. And you understand that I cannot let you leave. Naruto grinned, is that so? A blue jet emerged from his visor and zeroed in on Wonder Woman. She raised her bracelets as they deflected the energy beam harmlessly into the air. Wonder Woman dashed towards him and they two began to fight in the air. Naruto flipped backwards to avoid Wonder Woman's sword strike and released a gravitational wave that knocked her back several hundred meters. Naruto unsheathed his swords as he blocked two incoming beams of heat visions. Diana who had already recovered was now standing with Captain Marvel, Superman, Supergirl, Captain Atom and Zatara. Superman said, his eyes glowing in ethereal red, give up Cage, you cannot win. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. 100 hundred clones erupted from the smoke. Scatter. They all said. Supergirl and Superman tried to scan each of them but found that they all looked the same internally. Instead, they chose to pursue them. Lasers erupted from their eyes and attacked clones that simply turned back into smoke. Diana closed her eyes and prayed for Apollo to show her the direction and he did. She followed in pursuit of 10 clones that were flying at Mach 300. Naruto smirked as he gave the clones a discreet signal. They slowed down and allowed Diana to halt them. Diana replied, Stop this instant Naruto. The clones said simultaneously, Okay. As Diana floated forwards to try and speak, the clones all made a single hand sign and shouted, Katsu. A colossal explosion struck Wonder Woman, who was stunned by the force of it. She could not react in time as Naruto tagged her before punching her straight down into the city of Brussels. Naruto made another hand sign. Another explosion resounded just above the city. He dive bombed towards where Wonder Woman landed, as she was getting up, Naruto smashed straight into her back, causing her to groan. Another kick to the midsection, and she was sent flying into a skyscraper. Wonder Woman raised her bracelets to avoid a jet of blue energy, but was sent crashing down by a wave of gravity. She could hardly react in time as Naruto raised his palms and released a thousand amps through them. She screamed. Naruto merely raised his palm to stop Superman's punch and with a gesture, the Man of Steel was flung through several buildings. Wonder Woman kicked Naruto's knee and as he body shifted, she quickly took him down. Naruto just laughed as she continued to punch against his gravity barrier, as much as I enjoy this fight, I have an appointment to get going too. He raised his hands in the same gesture as before and Wonder Woman saw her stomach glowing, she tried to rip it off, don't bother the seal is embedded in your dermis. It's a torture seal, I created. He gravity pushed her straight into the way of an incoming Superman. The two were flung into a building. Naruto flew into the air and saw Superman and Wonder Woman getting up. He thought, I really don't like using this seal, but I am running out of time. 
He activated it and Wonder Woman fell to the ground, thrashing in pain until she fell unconscious. Naruto shouted, I would take her to the Mischira only they know how to stop the seal. Superman growled, I will kill you. Naruto grinned demonically, so the boy scout does have a dark side that's good to know but wouldn't you rather your girlfriend survived? She may be unconscious, but the pain is still unbearable. Superman fired a jet of his heat vision at Naruto but Naruto just deflected it. You have two choices, follow me and she may die or leave me be and get your girlfriend to the Mischira. Of course, this was a bluff and Naruto knew it, he had altered the original seal so that it would only knock out the person and not kill them. I will find you. Naruto simply laughed, don't bother, I will find you Kent. Superman's eyes widened but before he could ask how Naruto was already flying over Paris. Hours later, crash. Batman avoided a punch that dented the wall of the watchtower. You're telling me that all of this was your fault. Diana who had since recovered stopped Superman's second punch, it was our fault, we kept pushing Naruto in the wrong direction, and he snapped. Batman grimaced, it's going to be league priority to find him but from what Wonder Woman has told me, it will be almost impossible. Hal Jordan said with a hint of anger, I am not helping you find him, he had the right to leave. Batman replied, he was a danger. For someone who claims not to be judge and jury, you sure do like taking the law in your own hands, Hal said angrily. He turned to the rest of the people on the table, I vote we give him time to settle down. If he does something illegal then we can act but until then leave Uzumaki Naruto alone. A show of hands for those who agree. A large majority raised their hands including Wonder Woman shocking those who hadn't raised their hands. Batman merely turned around and said, you're all making a big mistake, Naruto is more dangerous than you think. He left the watchtower without saying another word. An uneasy silence fell upon the rest of the leaguers. Penthouse Gotham Penthouse. I take it you are comfortable with your current living arrangements. A voice echoed from the TV screen. Naruto sat comfortably on the expensive sofa, it is more than adequate but I do hope for some action. Already, I see that you got rid of your helmet. Naruto replied, just need to make sure it isn't bugged. Anyway, have you found what I was looking for? I sent the file to your computer, I wonder what you wanted with the data of young metahumans. Naruto smiled, the young are the easiest to sway. And if they don't, he replied, no matter, they will see the light. The voice chuckled, welcome to the Council of the Light, Uzumaki Naruto. The screen switched off and Naruto walked towards the computer. He pulled up the file and began reading. A smile played on his lips, the game had begun and neither the Justice League or the Light were ready for his endgame. Naruto watched the sun rise above Gotham and smiled, he muttered, the Red Dawn is coming and with it, the Uzumaki clan will rise again. All there was for Miles was death, Uzumaki's dead, Amazonians dead. All for nothing, all for their pathetic pride. The stench of burnt flesh permeated the air and hung over the one living person like a cloak. The man's silhouette flapped in the air, dark flames flickered across his body. He heard a booming a laugh, and then the heavy footsteps of Amazonian soldiers coming towards him, what do you have left to fight for? The man stood there patiently waiting with his sword drawn as he felt the speeding arrival of the world's mightiest warrior, Hippolyta. Nothing, the man said. His purple eyes shifted into red eyes with concentric ripples and tomios. Amazonian. The man's fire spread away from him and he dashed towards them. His mind bloody with rage as he butchered everything in his way to get to Hippolyta. The woman stood above him, watching as her comrades were killed, as the young Uzumaki was injured from her battles. An ethereal blue armor surrounded the man as he activated his Susano, Hippolyta flew into the air, her eyes glowed a divine white as she screamed, for Olympus, for Timesura. The skies crackled with lightning, the wind blew with ferocity and the water around them raged in anger. The Greek gods had given Hippolyta their blessing. The young man could barely avoid Hippolyta's attack, her sword cutting his armor in half, leaving him exposed. She threw her lasso around him, containing him. You have done enough damage, Uzumaki. She threw straight into a temple and returned him back to her feet. He struggled fruitlessly against the divine hold of her lasso. This is the end, this war, 1000 years of bloodshed because of your clan. The man chuckled, It was you Amazonians who killed my mother, who butchered the elders of our clan. No, if you kill me here, it will only cause the war to escalate. Hippolyta looked down at the young man with harsh eyes, 
her sword slashed down and cut across his neck cutting his carotid. His last words still haunted her to this day, Amenemahashira. His body glowed an ethereal yellow, then blue. His scream of pain could be heard throughout the battlefield despite the blood in his mouth. Then he exploded, a pillar of energy shot straight to the heavens and then expanded, scorching the earth and disintegrating everyone. Hippolyta's world turned white as she awoke to a decimated island. That was the day that the Mischira fell, the day that the war ended. Naruto and Hippolyta awoke with a gasp, despite being in different parts of the world. Hippolyta frowned in sadness, she had taken an afternoon nap, as she looked outside her window at the now flourishing island, it seemed so long ago, that war had brought the worst out of her. She remembered her daughter being brought by Superman, that seal made her shiver and she had the urge to hunt the Uzumaki down, but she realized that it had been modified to only knock her out. Diana had talked about Uzumaki Naruto before, it reminded her far too much of the young man in her dream. He was a kind young man, who lost his family in the war, she killed his parents and sent them to Uzu Shiobakir in a brash manner. A vendetta was born and he became the leader of the clan whilst she became the leader of the Amazons. He killed everything in his way, with each kill, he became stronger as he sacrificed everything to his demonic alter ego, in an effort to kill her. Uzumaki Naruto reminded her of that young man, the very embodiment of obsession and rage. He lost his clan and she could only guess what was going on in his mind but she knew that the Amazonians would be out for blood. They took his attack on their princess as a direct provocation of war. Naruto awoke to a dream that felt so surreal, it reminded him of the other dreams that he had experienced over the past months. It was like he was that man, he felt what that man felt, his pain, his sorrow and his overwhelming anger to the Amazonians. He sighed as he wiped the sweat of his forehead, all of these memories that didn't belong to him were causing some serious damage to his mind. He was feeling fractured, like he was one personality in an ocean of others and he had no idea how to deal with it. Right now, for example, he felt the incredible urge to fly over the Mischira and crush it. He breathed in slowly as he calmed his mind. He felt the urge subside and hoped that it would never return. Batcave Batman rubbed his eyes tiredly, he sighed as he looked at the massive computer screen. Another negative, his search to finding Naruto seemed to come to an unexpected halt. The world's greatest detective had only managed to confirm a few certain suspicions, the first being that Naruto was helped by an outside source. Naruto was new to this world, he didn't venture far enough or spend enough times understanding how to remain inconspicuous in the modern world. His second suspicion was confirmed when he and Superman scanned the entirety of the watchtower, it was clear that either a mole existed in the Justice League or that they were able to plant some sort of device in the League that no one was aware of. Either Searstances scared him, this organization or group were powerful enough to infiltrate the Justice League and had enough resources to hide a powerful meta-human. Should I go out patrolling without you? Robin asked as he walked out of an elevator. There is no need to go out patrolling. Batman said gruffly. Besides, crime seemed to have slowed down in Gotham. His eyes narrowed, and he quickly began to research something on the computer. Robin watched his ward look at GCPD records, particularly a report that involved the arrest of Poison Ivy. What are you looking for? Nothing. Batman stood up abruptly, his eyes still affixed to the screen before he marched off towards the Batmobile. Where are we going? Robin asked. I'm going alone. He announced entering the vehicle. Robin sighed as he watched the sleek black care rise on a platform and speed out of the house. His eyes flickered to the screen. A cheeky idea formed in his mind. Batman must have been in a rush, if he didn't close what he was working on. Arkham Asylum The asylum was an isolated facility that existed solely to hold and rehabilitate the most dangerous criminals of Gotham City. Batman or rather Bruce Wayne funded a lot of the asylum, it allowed for him to keep track of the criminals' whereabouts and make plans if they ever got out which was a very common occurrence. Batman sneaked throughout the facility, the dark corridors shrouded his movements as he reached his target. Poison Ivy sat in a white padded room wearing a straitjacket and an inhibition collar. Oh, it's you Bats, she grinned. Batman's eyes narrowed at her, he growled, how were you captured? Why? Ivy taunted. Batman grabbed her from the hems of her jacket, I know that there is no one in Gotham that is capable of withstanding your poison. Ivy laughed, as expected from the world's greatest detective. A smirk played on her lips, though you were a few days later than expected. Batman threw poison ivy to the ground, 
surprise marred his face when her body disappeared in a plum of white smoke. He muttered, Bunshin. So, his suspicion was correct. Uzumaki Naruto was here, in Gotham of all places and he had Poison Ivy with him. The alarm flared to life, Batman grunted as he heard the guards run towards the cell. He needed to ensure that there were no more clones in place of the prisoners, but the presence of the guards forced him to retreat. A guard shouted, close the gates, Ivy has escaped. He looked around and found a small note on the floor, never noticing a silent shadow moving behind him and into the corridor. There would be chaos in the asylum that night, but it would allow Batman to see how many clones there were in the asylum. League of Shadows headquarter Naruto rubbed his head in pain as memories of his clone appeared in his head. Raz al Ghul looked at the teen with slight worry, Uzumaki, are you okay? I'm fine. He groused. Ross sighed, Luther has warned you off the danger of using your clones, Uzumaki. I can handle one set of memories and it was necessary for the plan. Naruto replied. Truthfully, using clones for a long period of time wasn't a particularly good idea despite his incredible regenerative ability because of the massive feedback he received from them and since regenerative abilities didn't come hand in hand with the ability to fix a fractured mind, Naruto knew that it was risk that he shouldn't take. I take it that Batman has figured out that Ivy is in our possession, Ross said. Naruto smirked, of course, Batman's the only one in the Justice League that poses a problem to our plan. Ross nodded. Then I shall tell Queen Bee and Luther to proceed as you have instructed. He gave Naruto a pointed look, for your sake. I hope that it goes well. He walked off to the comforts of his own chamber. Naruto grunted, stupid old man. They had forced him to play mastermind. Savage had said that the inner circle never did anything that would bring suspicion among them. Since he was affiliated with nobody, he was the logical choice in this plan of action. They wanted him to play the role of the diversion whilst they stole something. Naruto stood up and flew out of the window at Mach 20. I guess, it was time to show my face. He never noticed the red arrow that pierced the wall next to the window he just flew from. He would only be notified of the breach several hours later. Gotham Cape Carmen Poison Ivy was sitting in her newly bought apartment, after she had been released by Naruto and his unknown associates. She had been told not to contact her friends or create any havoc until they contacted her. Ivy. A burst of air rushed into the apartment as Naruto sped in. She grunted, can you not just knock? Naruto shrugged, I could but I chose not to. Ivy simply sighed at his pitiful excuse. I suppose it is time for us to act, she said, getting up and stretching her body. So, what am I to do? Naruto grinned, you are going to be the diversion for the bat. Ivy groused, Griad. I can raise forests but instead you want me to play the pet for the bat. He smirked at her, Ivy would have flipped him off but she knew the bastard didn't care for her feelings. Batman's first logical assumption would be that I broke you out, so if you start causing mayhem you'll be on his priority list for an interrogation. Ivy narrowed her eyes, she didn't like being thrown under a bus but Naruto soothed her worries. Don't you worry, I will have a clone ready for an extraction. And what will you be doing? Ivy asked, somewhat curious what all this planning was for. Naruto smiled, I'm afraid that's above your pay grade. Mimicking a government official. Ivy rubbed her head, wondering what she did to deserve all of this headache. Gear up, I have a present that will help you. Ivy raised a smooth green eyebrow somewhat interested as to what this present would be. Naruto threw a box towards her, she opened it and found a green bean in it, what's this? It's filled with my young energy, it will enhance your abilities. Naruto replied. Poison Ivy looked at the object with incredible skepticism. Why are you doing this? You can easily conjure up a clone to act as a diversion, she asked. Naruto replied, his form vibrating, think of it as a test. With that, his body glowed a bright blow before it simply rippled out of existence. Ivy sighed, great, another riddler. She casually strutted out of her living room, making preparations to cover Gotham in a forest. She eyed the bean in her hands. She knew how much Naruto's life force affected Naruto. Perhaps I found him. With that, she too disappeared from her apartment. Hours later Naruto was angry, he had heard that Dr. Roquette had been stolen from right underneath the League's noses. The plan doesn't change. Naruto said to his other counterparts. Savage groused, and what if Dr. Roquette manages to find a way to break the encryption? The boy grinned fairly, 
She'll be the distraction we need then. I have already instructed Ivy to attack Gotham. The Justice League will be helpless against her new control of nature and the young ones will be busy protecting the dear doctor. It should provide the window necessary to get what we want. Queen Bee replied, and what of the staff? That was only for my benefit, not yours. Naruto asked calmly. I shall get the staff on my own. I believe it Roz who is at fault if this mission goes awry. Roz growled but remained silent. Deal with the doctor. Savage instructed the master assassin, before the feed was shut off. Naruto's eye flashed red with anger, his plan had been disrupted because that idiotic assassin couldn't keep a doctor locked up. He bared his fangs and muttered, looks like I'll have to send a clone after the doctor, just in case. Night fell and with it an uneasy silence befell the groups, the young heroes were holed up inside school guarding Dr. Roquette. Artemis, the newest addition of the group was set to stand guard the perimeter alongside Miss Martian whose telepathy was constantly scanning the area. The heroes were all trigger itchy, not knowing where or when the assassins would descend upon them. Miss Martian felt something, she said, I sense someone. Aqualad ordered, everyone report, I see nothing on my end, Artemis and Miss Martian replied. Aqualad waited for a response from Kid Flash, all he heard was static. Kid Flash, though he was snapped into to focus when a blade whirled forth from the shadows, aimed at the doctor with lethal aim. He jumped, blocking the blade with his dense flesh. The assassin stepped out, that looked like it hurt, she mockingly added. Aqualad grimaced, drawing one of his water blade and getting ready to battle. Artemis, Miss Martian. The enemy is here. He said through the calm. She charged at him, easily moving under his inexperienced slashes and kicking him from under. Aqualad grabbed the water from his now unmaterialized sword and used it to throw her across the room. The assassin jumped onto the desk before she hit the wall, throwing one of her sighs at Aqualad's now heaved over body. Clang and arrow deflected the blade away. The assassin grinned, now this is interesting. Artemis replied, two against one. She fired several volleys of arrows at the assassin, all aimed to maim her target. The assassin laughed, moving with incredible athleticism and flexibility she spun around deflecting each of Artemis's arrow onto the doctor. It's over. What's over? Kid Flash smirked. The arrows lay in his hands, he ran at her with the intention to knock her over. The assassin jumped back but was thrown by Miss Martian's telekinesis. She grimaced. This was not a fight that could be won. A canister shot through the glass window, and a dark smoke filled up the room. The assassin was unprepared to be grabbed by a blur. The figure stopped a second later in the woods. She pushed herself away from him. Who are you? Her vision still blurry from the high speed movement. Boss. I got her. The figure said. The assassin muttered, Naruto. Cheshire. Boss says hello. The clone replied. Her vision slowly returned back to normal, in that moment, Cheshire grabbed Naruto's clone and growled. Why did you that? I would have escaped, I had reinforcements. Naruto growled, Boss says that Roz is too idiotic to see how much value the doctor truly has. He wants her mind for himself. Besides you wouldn't have been able to beat them anyway. His grin was far too sinister. I'm an assassin, she replied and I am a unicorn, he said sarcastically, now instead of killing Roquette, get back there and distract them long enough for Boss to finish his plan. The clone puffed out of his existence, leaving an angry Cheshire walking back to the school. Gotham Batman dodged another tendril from Poison Ivy. The woman moved at incredible speed or was it that he had become slow? She grinned, do you like my new pollen? Batman threw a grenade at a massive plant that was about to swallow him. The plant exploded, and Poison Ivy glowered, my poor baby, you'll pay for that Batman. She grabbed the box and ate the bean. Power rushed through her, the likes that she had never felt before. She felt attuned to nature, like she could feel every plant in the entire state calling out to her and she was drawing energy from them. Let's begin. Her eyes glowed a nefarious green, Batman would have been stabbed by a thorn that had erupted from the ground had it not been for the timely arrival of Wonder Woman. Diana cut the vine in half and blocked several other vines shooting towards her with her shield. She said, how is she so powerful? Ivy had never been so attuned to nature, she could feel it, it was almost like she was in the presence of Lady Artemis. Batman growled, she ate a bean, it enhanced her powers. Wonder Woman was about to charge Ivy when Batman said, 
No, we need a plan of action. We don't know how strong she is. Though it was far too late, trees sprouted out from the ground, vines crawled and twisted around the skyscrapers and in mere seconds, Gotham appeared to have been turned into Ivy's playground. She laughed wickedly, it won't help, I have the power of the green now. Her body melded into one of the plants and she disappeared. Batman and Wonder Woman stood anxiously, wondering where Ivy had gone. She sprouted behind Wonder Woman. The Amazon blocked the blow with her shield but was launched straight into a building. Batman threw one of his fire grenades into the ground. Vines burned around him, forcing Ivy to retreat inside the plant life. He said, Give up, Ivy. You cannot beat us, soon the Justice League will arrive. Ivy's laughter echoed throughout the entirety of Gotham. Then let's have some fun, Bats. I've always wondered how many gadgets you have inside that belt of yours. Vines grew once more, sharp sticks of wood launching themselves towards the helpless detective. Batman grabbed his grapple and fired it in the air, the thrones missed him, and the spikes embedded themselves into the soil. Batman landed into the cockpit of his plane, the Batwing dove downwards, firing volleys of missiles that lit up the plant life. Ivy screamed as her plants burned, she could feel them crying out in pain, it hurt so much. Vines shot forwards, ripping the machine apart into a fiery explosion. Batman flipped out, gliding towards Wonder Woman who was now cutting every vine in her way. He said, we need to burn it. Arif N. Rub Sivi Stnalp, Nrut Met Otni Hsa. Zatanna's voice shouted as he descended down towards the central plaza to assist Batman alongside Captain Atom, Superman and Flash. Ivy screamed further, the magic burned her plants before they disintegrated into piles of ash. She growled, her eyes glowing further. Energy pulsed out of her, she wouldn't let Naruto's gift surmount to nothing. Her body began to bulge, growing into the size of a giant. Vines surrounded her body, making her look more like a plant-shaped humanoid than a human. Captain Adam said, I sense some sort of energy inside her, it feels similar to nature, like. Chakra. Wonder Woman's sword glowed with electricity, Zeus was asking for this woman's death. Batman muttered, I told you, though his words weren't heard by the group because Superman flew towards the giant ivy in a fit of pure rage. Naruto. The man steel roared. His punch snapped ivy's chin back, forcing the giant to fall onto several buildings. Luckily for the man of steel's stupidity, Zatara had protected the buildings from damage with his magic. Superman pummeled the giant harder and harder, Ivy felt each of his blows crack the hard armor of her plants. She eventually had enough, several vines gripping the man of steel by his legs and throwing him to the side like a ragdoll. Captain Adam said, I'll eradicate her energy. He flew at a slow pace, deliberately trying to get Ivy to zero onto him with her vines so he could understand the molecular structure of her form. Vines wrapped around him, Ivy cackled, she said, how slow. Clasping her hands together, the vines squeezed against his form. Captain Adam's body leaped radiation, the plants began to wilt and wither. Soon the radiation reached Ivy's main body and Adam began to use some of his molecular manipulation to eradicate all traces of chakra inside her body. Ivy screamed, she could feel her power dwindling and radiation beginning to seep into her body. Batman shouted, Adam stop, she'll die. Captain Adam watched as Ivy's form exploded into a million pieces of wilted flowers and vines. She fell towards the ground, body raked in pain, Superman grabbed her and shoved her against the wall. Tell me where Naruto is, he cracked the wall with the force of his shove. Poison Ivy coughed, I don't know, static, Bruce, it's Wayne Tech, Alfred said through his calm. Batman punched a wall. Superman looked towards his friend, somewhat in concern. Ivy grinned, you fell for it. Ha 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 the almighty detective was too slow to realize what was going on. Tell me what he was planning, Superman hollered. Ivy smirked, you'll have to beat it out me, boy scout. His arm was cocked, wanting to smash her through several buildings but he was held back by Diana. Don't. She said. I'll be the one to get information out of her. Her lasso wrapped around Ivy's neck. She asked, what was Naruto planning? Ivy replied truthfully, I don't know. Batman continued, Naruto is intelligent. He planned for her capture, he knew she would attract our attention, used her as a diversion and provided her with no information as to clue as into his whereabouts. Ivy laughed, there is one thing that you should know about Naruto. 
he would never leave an ally to bleed on the battlefield. Diana smirked. Then why are you here? A mist began to settle throughout Gotham, it was barely noticeable at first, it began as soon as Ivy lost. Diana felt it, his presence was undeniable and her blood lurched for his blood. She drew her sword, on guard. He is here. The mist grew until it was thick enough that not even Diana could see through it. Adam. Superman and Batman used infrared vision to see through the mist but merely gasped. That's impossible. I can't see, Superman said. Adam commended the mist. Interesting, his chakra is everywhere. I'll have to use that. Wonder Woman removed her lasso from Ivy and began to spin it around, ready to capture any moving life form. She threw it and something was drawn towards them. Hey, hey, it's me, Zatara said. Diana replied, I'm sorry. Batman said, no, he's not Zatara. Zatara laughed, of course I am, I just fought with you. They all looked on edge. Why are you all on edge? It's not like Naruto can shapeshift. Batman grimaced. And that made them even more on edge. Zatara sighed, if we take Ivy, Naruto will have to follow. So let's take her to headquarters. Wonder Woman smiled, I agree. Naruto can't fight all of us. Zatara grabbed Ivy. I'll see you all there. A beam of radiation almost hit Zatara's chest. You're not Zatara, Captain Adam said. Zatara grinned demonically, want to see a magic trick? He laughed. A burst of gravity rippled and struck all of the Justice League members, sending them flying in opposite directions. And that's how you make a grand entrance. Zatara tipped his hat. He stared at Batman who had grappled onto a wall. I thank you for playing Batman. With that Zatara vanished in a blue energy form. Dark room. So, did we manage to get what we wanted? Savage asked. Raz al Ghul grimaced, thanks to Naruto we managed to procure the Star Lab data as well as some useful Wayne tech. Naruto replied, even after all that help, you still couldn't breach the Wayne tech database. Savage supplied, it doesn't matter. The young heroes have interfered once more in our plans, so it's fortunate that we have an operative. On the inside, Roz smirked. Naruto answered, We have a new ally to cause, Poison Ivy. Queen Bee chuckled, After today's spectacle, none can argue that she was a worthy ally. So it begins. Luther finished. Outside Gotham, several armored figures landed gracefully on the roof of a skyscraper. One of them said, This is the last place, I felt his presence. Her eyes glowed an ethereal white as she stared at craters formed by Ivy. The Uzumaki was here. Another spoke with a growl. Sisters. We must remain calm. His time will come. The leader spoke. Today is the day, Uzumaki Naruto dies. She said. Her spear struck the ground and magic surrounded the city. Naruto felt it. He shivered at the hideous feeling. Unbeknownst to him, the gears of war had finally begun to turn and Naruto would realize very soon that he had fired the opening salvo. Chakra and celestial magic were polar opposites, one given by forces of the divine and the other birthed from demons. Ever since he was a child, he had been taught to hate the Amazonians, their history had been riddled with that of blood and iron. Despite this, Naruto had understood of the arrangement that his ancestors had agreed upon, the treaty had been overseen on the plains of a neutral ground said to have been the divide between hell and heaven where neither divine nor demonic forces had authority. Queen Hippolyta and the boy king Uzumaki Kazuya stood before each other as they both shook hands agreeing that those who broke the rid would be killed and forever disowned. For centuries thereafter, the Uzumaki and the the Miskerns lived apart in relative peace. The Uzumaki began to grow apart from the world, like the Amazons, they hid themselves on an island hidden amongst the whirlpools. It was however foreseen that in the end both dynasties would fall at the hands of each other. Such a prophecy was nonsense to the young warrior, Artemis. She swore vengeance as that flying alien swooped in with Princess Diana in his arms. She had never seen anything like it, the proud princess of Amazon reduced to a seizing and bubbling mess, her body twitching and curling in agony from the Uzumaki's cursed mark. Even when the queen forbid against action, she still swore for vengeance. Her sisters had agreed, he was the last of his line. The last Uzumaki, should he perish would finally put a rest to the torment they suffered at their hands. Alas, it appeared that Uzumaki Naruto was in favor of the gods. Celestial magic poured throughout the city of Gotham, 
invisible to all eyes except those who possessed an affinity for the arcane. Its golden light flowed through the streets like a river of gold. Artemis's eyes closed, her magic guiding her to the location of his demonic chakra. She found it, and they descended. Naruto had never seen it coming, or at least that was the impression she received when the boy had woken up to the smashing of his window. Seven Amazons standing at the foot of his bed, swords and shields drawn, they killed him before he could make a move. Only for him to smile and say, your gods will not guide you here. Then he exploded, the building went up in smoke and Artemis lay on the ground, despite the ringing in her ears and the blood that poured from her wounds she managed to find her sisters. They had been buried in piles of rubble. She screamed to the heavens in pure anguish, why had they forsaken her? Diana awoke to alarm bells and a desire for blood. It was said that when an fellow Amazon had been slayed in battle, the remaining sisters would feel it even if they were a million miles away. This time it had felt as if she had lost more than one, her feeling had become true as she was called back to Gotham by Batman. She frowned, I don't see anything. Batman merely picked up a sword, her eyes wandered on the blade of Amazonium and she realized what had happened. What is going on? I can't have more of you running around my city. The bat stressed. He truly was a fool, but none more so than her. He killed them. She muttered. Batman sighed, Naruto, I thought you said that your people wouldn't take action. We can't have another war. He had already had enough of the war of attrition taking place in this corrupt city. She steeled her gaze, gripping her lasso and sword with anger. They attacked him and he killed them. I'm afraid that not even my mother can stop more of my sisters from seeking out vengeance. Batman muttered, I have something else to show you. He guided her through the rubble, into the broken home. Diana felt her heartache. The walls had been stained red with blood and laden with the weapons of her sisters. This was the bedroom, from the angle of impact and blood pattern, it appears the focal point of the explosion came from the bed. He gazed harshly at her, I don't care much for your war, I care for Gotham. Your sisters attacked Naruto in his sleep, only Naruto had realized in advance that they were coming. He set a trap for them, I thought you said you wanted peace but rather your people seemed to seek war. Diana growled back, he is one boy and we are a thousand. We will not fall so easily, she began to tread away, her head spinning from the detail and the gore of what she had just witnessed. And what would you do? I wish for answers, she replied. I must return to the Mischira before my mother finds out what has happened. Batman narrowed his eyes as she flew away from him. He never told her of the hidden message that Naruto had left. That would only further the conflict that was brewing. Whilst Diana would be going to the Mischira to stem the fires of war, Bruce had a much more pressing matter to deal with. He had to find Naruto before any other Amazonian did. Whether to seek punishment for the murders that Naruto committed or to help him to avoid them, he didn't know. All he knew was that the young Uzumaki would be in grave danger if he didn't find him soon. A sudden thought had manifested in his mind as he retreated from the scene, how did they find him, and was Naruto ever there? Trust no one. They'll all betray you in the end. The whispers were growing louder and louder by the day, Naruto could do nothing to silence them. His telepathy didn't work. His meditation didn't help. And worse of all, his dreams were only haunted by memories of ancient men and women from his clan. It was a maddening thing. Yet he enjoyed it anyway. They provided him with comfort and often some sound advice. It had been only because of them that he had even felt their presence. Amazonians curse the lot of them. If they were willing to murder him in his sleep, he promised he'd give the same courtesy. But first, he needed to retreat, away from everyone. Here, it's here. He heard a whisper. I must be going crazy. Naruto thought, there was nothing there apart from a small clearing enclosed by a forest. Can't you feel it? The magic. The voices hissed once more. Naruto closed his eyes, letting his chakra seep out of him and into his surroundings. His mother had taught him the most basic of sensing techniques, something he found that he had absolutely no talent for. Still, it did come useful for time to time. He felt nothing still, so he pumped more chakra out, saturating the world around him in his energy. He was sure that this was a particularly bad idea, he surmised that the, the Miskerns had only managed to track because of his usage of chakra, just like how he could feel their presence nearing his. They were like opposite ends of a magnet, except instead of feeling attracted, all you felt was pure dread. That feeling quickly returned as his chakra finally detected something, 
In front of him was a structure that was invisible to the naked eye, yet he couldn't deny its presence. By using his chakra in small waves, Naruto could sense tiny disturbances in the world around him. Unlike some of the most gifted sensors, he was unable to visualize or discern what those disturbances were. Though Naruto felt like he didn't even need to use his chakra, the air around him was filled with magic so divine that it made him sick. The staff Naruto obliged, he summoned it from the seals in his arm, and a blanket of smoke enveloped him. Naruto twirled the stave in his arm, it truly felt magnificent for something that appeared as nothing more than an aged piece of wood. The staff of Essus it was called, the historians had believed it to be merely a monument of druids in Gaul but those who could sense magic were able to understand the vast power it held within its hollow and inscribed frame. He closed his eyes once more and summoned his chakra through the staff, the runes inscribed onto the wood glowed an ethereal blue as he slammed it upon the ground. The world around him shimmered, he felt something rip open and in almost an instant, he was swallowed up by the ever-increasing black void of space. As he was whisked away, and slowly began to fade away from consciousness, Naruto decided that if there was one thing, he resented more than the Meiskerans, it was magic. Tower of Fate The tower existed in its own space, in between worlds, it was said to house instruments of magic and power that could rip the world apart should they be used by the forces of evil once again. It had stood firm for over one million years, it was said that those who could perceive it were able to see its true size, never ending and constantly shifting as if to warn those who entered that they would never escape. Are we there yet? Clarion the witch boy whined at his posse, he didn't like being in the presence of such magic. Always so impatient, Kent Nelson said demurely, that must be why you decided to come here without any backup. Shut him up, Abra, Clarion demanded childishly, I don't want to hear the old fart speak again. Mute. Abra Kadabra said, waving his wand in such a fashion as if to trick those present with his magic. A black collar wrapped around Kent's neck, it glowed a menacing red as it locked onto his voice box. Kent tried to speak but found himself unable to do so. His eyes however twinkled as he felt the presence of the young heroes, perhaps he might still be able to stop Clarion's ploy. The witch boy stared into distance, stroking his cat with a sadistic smile. He hopped forwards and gave Kent a feral gaze, I'd say that odds just went in my favor. Kent looked at the Lord of Chaos questioningly, until he felt its presence. The old host of Dr. Fate couldn't help but shiver at the sheer expanse and power of the demonic energy that was filtering through this domain. He hoped that young heroes could fight against the darkness that was coming or else order would have finally been overcome by forces of chaos. With his hands bound and his mouth rendered mute, he could only direct a tiny amount of magic into a spell. Clarion's eyes bored into his, what did you do? He growled. Abra sensing his master's anger switched on the collar's shock setting and Kent's felt 100 volts run through his entire body. Do it again and I'll increase the voltage by 10. Don't think your old heart could handle it. Abra taunted. Kent grimaced in pain, he found himself being pushed and dragged towards the top of the tower. He might be old, but he had at least succeeded in summoning them. In one of the neighboring planes, Kid Flash shivered in the cold rot on from the icy world around them. Frustration was quickly mounting as he and the team were unable to find any escape from this hellish weather. Well all except Aqualad who seemed to particularly enjoy the cold. This is all your fault. Artemis stressed with some anger. You nearly got us cooked because you didn't believe. Megan stared at him with some lost expression, you don't believe. Of course, I don't. Kid Flash acquiesced, magic is a lie. Really now? Aqualad argued then explain how we managed to find ourselves in this place he gestured to the never-ending expanse of the icy plain i don't know kid flash waved his hands annoyedly maybe just maybe this is a pocket dimension he rolled his eyes at their disbelief oh come on i can't believe you think magic is real i come from atlantis aqualad deadpanned as if it explained everything yeah and i'm faster than sound doesn't explain anything Kid Flash found his gaze settling into the horizon in front of him. If we don't escape here soon, we'll all freeze to death. Talk for yourself. Superboy countered, the Kryptonian would undoubtedly be one of the few in the group that could actually survive this absurd cold. What's that? Megan spoke softly. Kid Flash turned around to the floating walking stick, he smirked and said sarcastically, let me guess, you'll be saying that's the old man's wand. 
Artemis snorted as she moved towards it. Maybe it is. Kid Flash rolled his eyes and sped towards the stick in time before Artemis could touch it. They both grasped the cool metal and looked at each other. Kid Flash grinned. See, it's just a walkie. He couldn't finish his sentence as he and Artemis vibrated away in a flash of light. Aqualad, Megan and Superboy looked towards each other in surprise. Superboy asked, did we just get left behind? Megan stared at spot that her friends had just been. Um how do we get out? She wondered. Her physiology couldn't handle this level of cold any longer, though unlike fire, it wouldn't actually kill her. That might be a start. Aqualad gestured to a powerful light streaking through the sky, it came barreling towards the ground with incredible speed. Get down! Superboy shouted. The streak impacted the ground with the force of a meteor, creating a wave of heavy pressure and snow to spread everywhere. Megan grabbed Aqualad and flew them away from the incoming snow avalanche. Her eyes could barely perceive it, in the fissure she saw a boy, no someone far more familiar to her. She gasped, Naruto, Aqualad questioned, what? His voice filled with a greater uncertainty, they had heard what happened between the Justice League and Naruto. They couldn't beat someone like him in a fight, not when they had no possible route of escape or any tactical advantage over him. Come on. She flew them towards the fissure, she felt slightly excited to meet him again. Naruto and she had never been close friends, but she had a lot of respect for her fellow redhead. The truth however was she like every member of the young team wanted answers for why he had done what he had done. Betrayal, some of them said but Megan had always known that there were always two sides to a story. They landed in front of the crater and found Naruto in the middle of it laying incredibly still. She asked, is he okay? Aqualad grimaced, it would take a lot to kill Naruto. He remained unmoving for an entire minute. Superboy eventually landed beside them, his gaze settled on the still body of Naruto. Is that, yes. Aqualad replied. A groan slowly brought their attention back towards Naruto. He slowly got up, murmuring, God, I hate magic. Though he appeared to be none too aware of their presence. Naruto. Megan said softly. As if one cue, Naruto jumped back in response to realizing that he wasn't alone. His staff pointed towards them. Megan? He croaked out. She hummed in response. What are you doing here? She asked. I could ask you the same thing. He replied, but if you must know, I have a meeting with fate. She rolled her eyes at the cryptic answer, some things it seemed would never change. She forced some anxiousness down before she allowed herself to say it, it's good to see again. He grinned, miss me, Marshall. His eyes seemed to lack that distinct playfulness that they used to have but she still understood the jest. You bastard. Naruto shifted his body and turned to avoid the slamming punch from Superboy. Calm down. Naruto gestured, his arms high up in the air to signify his surrender. I'm not here to fight. I've actually only come to stop a war. That made Superboy stop in his tracks, he looked at the Uzumaki with a quizzical expression. After what happened during my fight with Wonder Woman, he said her name with a spiteful venomous tone, he quelled his bloodlust before continuing, they want me dead. Aqualad looked skeptical, surely, Wonder Woman wouldn't allow for such a thing. Naruto spat, Diana is of the Mysgrin, they are my mortal enemies and I am theirs. They wish for the last remaining Uzumaki's head to be at their feet, for my line to end. Only then will this be satisfied. Aqualad said, and what does this tower have to do with anything? I intend to end the war. Naruto stressed. It sounded like a peaceful gesture to both Megan and Superboy but Aqualad had sensed the dull undertones in Naruto's voice, he had heard of the Uzumaki in his training at Atlantis. It was one of the reasons he tried so hard to become friends with Naruto, if anything to prove his people that they were wrong, that the Uzumaki weren't just a people of war and demonic tendencies. Aqualad asked, and how will we get there? Magic, of course. He slammed the staff onto the ground once more, a door opened up, presenting them a staircase that seemingly led to a tower. Naruto muttered, I guess they were right. A thousand steps to victory. Yes, boy. Get the amulet. It's the only way. They murmured to him. Naruto scrunched his eyes closed, trying to neuter their voices before any of the others picked up on his glazed expression. Well then, let's get going. Naruto said. The three of them looked at him with a questioning gaze. Megan asked excitedly. You can do magic. Well everyone can do magic. 
He corrected, I can't really do spells or whatnot but my chakra is enough to make this hunk of wood work. Aqualad replied, I'm not so sure, I thought you had to have an affinity for the mystic arts to use magic. Naruto chuckled, that what they teach you in Atlantis. Heck, Wonder Woman can't use magic but that doesn't mean she can't use magical items to perform magic. Superboy stayed silent as they walked the steps leading to the tower, he wondered, what side are you truly on? It had meant to be a thought, but he had accidentally let it slip. What side I've always been on? Naruto replied, and which side is that? Aqualad asked. My own. He grinned before frowning. Atop the tower, he could see the faintest flashes of red and gold. It had already begun. Dr. Fate would be summoned soon and he had to stop it before it happened. He looked back, I'm sorry, I have to go. Wait, Megan tried to say but Naruto had already launched himself into the air. We never got to ask him why he left. Aqualad consoled her, we'll find out after we save Kent. Though his tone remained unsure, he gazed at Naruto's flying form watching him reach the top of the tower, he feared that the next time that they met, there wouldn't be much time to be civil. Clarion growled as he dodged yet another blast from Kent Nelson, you can't think that your pathetic attempts at magic can hope to defeat me. He raised his hands, gesturing in a finger gun motion. He grinned, let me show how it's done, as if his hands were guns, he fired a barrage of chaos magic onto the golden shield surrounding Kent in the mask. The barrage of magic cracked Kent's weak shield and shattered it like glass. Kid Flash watched in shock as Clarion's arms swung as if he were throwing a pitch, Clarion's sickening smirk seemed to grow, the speedster couldn't react in time to the invisible ball of energy that struck Kent in the chest. Red electricity arced upwards from Kent's body, electrocuting Kid Flash and everything in a 5 meter radius. Kent had enough energy to grab his staff and slam it onto the ground, generating another shield that blocked out several more energy blasts sent from Clarion. Boy, the mask, he tried to gasp but was unable to stop the electricity from stopping his heart, he fell to the ground unconscious and dying. Clarion screamed, no, no, he watched Kid Flash grab the helmet of fate and began to send out dozens of energy blasts towards him. Give it to me, I want it, he roared but the shield stood strong, it appeared Kent's sacrifice had strengthened the barrier with far more powerful magic than Clarion was used to. Kid Flash felt the power in his hands, he grinned childishly, is this what you want? He placed the helmet above his head. Hey kid, if you put that on, you're never going to get it off. Clarion tried to placate the teenager from running his plans. You hurt the doc, Kid Flash said angrily as he placed the helmet on his face. Clarion growled angrily. You'll pay for this. But as per usual, instead of fighting a child with the power of fate, Nabu floated above him, basking everything in his gold light. The Lord of Fate had always tended to be extravagant in his use of powers. Nabu sneered at the witch boy, you have come to my domain, Clarion. His hands glowed in an ethereal yellow, I don't enjoy trespassers. Golden energy rushed forth and smashed straight into Clarion's red shield. Clarion responded in kind, his power increased, and he whispered an incantation. Nabu couldn't dodge in time, his host's affinity for much was so small that he was required to use the barest of spells. A pentagram spread behind him, and out of it came several bullets of red electricity. He roared in pain. Clarion generated a whip that he sent sailing through the air, its studded end pierced into Fate's leg and he forced it to come down. The Lord of Fate smashed into the ground with outstanding power. Your domain? You've grown rusty, Nabu and I've only gotten stronger in your absence. The witch boy waved his arms in a maniacal fashion, can't you feel the forces of chaos, they've become more powerful. Order is always the same, predictable and so, very boring. His grip on his whip increased as he sent Nabu sailing through the air. Nabu's eyes flashed gold, he would not be demeaned in such a fashion. Clarion's eyes widened, you wouldn't. Leave my domain, the Lord of Fate stressed. Clarion's lips tightened, you can't beat me, Nabu. But Nabu didn't have to, he charged his magic once more and released into a blast the scorched the earth that Clarion was standing on. The witch boy erected a shield that protected him easily from the blast but his familiar, the cat wasn't so lucky. Clarion felt his power decrease, his presence began to wane, he felt the damage that his tickle had taken. He glared at Nabu, I can't believe you'd hurt a defenseless cat. Nabu merely raised his once more, intent on banishing the lord of fate's presence from his domain. 
With the death of your cat, I can rest easy that your return to this plane won't be for a very long time. Clarion teleported towards his cat and grabbed it, he erected another shield to protect himself from another blast. Nabu was however far more intent on defeating Clarion. Gold chains spurred from the ground and began to wrap themselves around Clarion, coiling around his feet and arms. Tikal fell to the ground, the cat whimpered feebly at the incoming beam of light that head their way. Doden Doryuheki, something moved in front of Clarion and his cat, Nabu narrowed his eyes as the figure slammed his hands onto the ground and a twenty feet wall of earth and mud blocked his energy blast. I thought the Lord of Fate was meant to be all good, the figure joked, his fangs barred angrily, and purple eyes glowed sinisterly at Nabu's casting. You are not meant to be here, demon. Naruto laughed, wait, little ol' me, a demon. I think you're mistaking me for someone else. Gravity shifted and Nabu found himself being thrust downwards by Naruto's immense gravitational pull. Clarion growled, get me out of these chains. Naruto gave him a sideway glance, he said, if I'm a demon then what are you? He gestured towards the bound boy, I never knew Lord of Orders liked to kill children. Nabu glowered, that is no child, boy. Move or I will deal with you as well. Naruto's eyes widened in pure shock as Nabu merely waved off his gravity. Impossible. Clarion watched as Naruto jumped away to avoid a torrent of golden chains before releasing a powerful surge of chakra to ripple away from his eyes. A golden onk appeared in front of Nabu, blocking the energy beam and absorbing it. Naruto couldn't react in time as his own chakra struck him square in the back, Naruto groaned in pain from the blow. I can't win this fight, Naruto admitted to himself. Clarion's frown turned into a smirk as he felt Nabu's concentration on the chains begin to wane. He used that momentary lapse in judgment to shatter them and grab Tikal. Nabu turned toward him and conjured more chains but Clarion was ready for them this time. Not this time, Nabu. Clarion said with a childish laugh as he teleported away. Naruto gulped as he felt Nabu's presence begin to focus onto him. You have made a grave error, Nabu said. His arms began to raise themselves once more and Naruto was struck by an invisible force that sent him spiraling into the air. The amulet. Naruto began to look for it but found he had little time to complete a surveyed observation of his surrounding as Nabu began to summon thousands of different chains from the air around him. Naruto dodged, dancing in the air and avoiding each of the chains from wrapping around him. Fool, it's a trap, he heard a whisper, but Naruto couldn't react to it. Nabu slammed his hands together and the chains coiled themselves into a ball-like shape that formed around him. Naruto felt the ball tighten around him, the divine chains began to burn his skin. Arg! He had barely enough wits about him to summon the staff once more and pump his chakra into it. Nabu narrowed his eyes, he had thought that his victory was assured but the boy had summoned a powerful magic instrument to counteract his divine magic. A blue and gold explosion erupted in the air blanketing the air in a wave of light that he could barely see through. Out of the light, emerged hundreds of Naruto's rushing towards him with swords and weapons alike. The being of order should have banished them all away, but something happened that blocked his magic from working. His gaze settled on the Naruto in the middle of the pack, barely making out the etching on the wooden stave. He knew then that Naruto possessed one of the few items of destruction and chaos, the Staff of Esses. You are an instrument of chaos. Nabu questioned. Naruto frowned, I am what I have to be in order to survive. I didn't come here to fight. The being would have snorted if it could, Nabu's magic streamed forth and delved into Naruto's mind. The boy's mind was incredibly powerful for that of a non-gifted psionic, but it was not powerful enough to counteract his magic. Naruto's eyes rolled back in pain as he felt Nabu's presence pierce into his mind. You come for an exchange? Nabu asked. The amulet of Anubis for the staff of Esses. Naruto croaked out. Nabu replied, You cannot ask for such a thing. Naruto challenged, I can give this to Clarion if that is what you want. I'm sure he'll love to be reunited with one of his favorite toys. He had hoped that Nabu wouldn't realize his folly. Nabu said, I cannot give you an instrument of order. Naruto narrowed his eyes as Nabu raised his hands to begin for another battle. But you will not be leaving this plane with that staff. Naruto smirked. He split half of his shadow clones into a separate contingent and exploded the others to create a huge smokescreen. Nabu could follow the magic of the staff as Naruto launched himself into the air, 
Nabu followed in pursuit, leaving behind the amulet that was secured around Kent Nelson's neck. The amulet of Anubis was one of the most powerful instruments of magic, it had one feature however that Naruto wanted to use, its ability to make the user undetectable to magical detection. Nabu and Naruto launched themselves into a battle of wills, both wielding instruments opposite to that of the other. Nabu's magic proved futile against Naruto's and Naruto's blasts were nothing to Nabu. Boss, I got it. Naruto dove down to the earth, his unexpected turn in direction surprised Nabu who couldn't get his teleportation magic to go quick enough to reach Naruto before he reached his destination. Naruto's second surprise for Nabu was to use his clones as a momentary distraction, the Lord of Order would no doubt feel nothing, but Naruto didn't intend for that. Nabu emerged from his onk and he found himself surrounded by a dozen clones. He found Naruto grasping the amulet of Anubis from Kent's prone body. The Lord of Order wasn't prepared for Naruto to throw the staff towards him. Naruto shouted, and Uzumaki always keeps his promise. With that as Nabu conjured forth his chains once more, Naruto gripped the amulet and whispered a name that was far too familiar. Amon Ra, the starry blue interior of the amulet glowed a powerful gold, Nabu tried to break through but like his own magic, Anubis's charm was that of a much higher calling. Naruto's body was wrapped in a golden hue and then he exploded into a million flutters of light. Gone, Nabu couldn't even track him. It didn't make sense, the boy knew far too much about the inner working of order and chaos. How did he even know about this tower or where to find it? He would have to ponder on such matters. But first, he had a fake magician to rout and some children to save. Diana had spent days at the Misira, when she arrived, she had found a grand council had been put in place and Artemis kneeling in front of her mother. I beg your forgiveness, my queen. Artemis knelt. Her tone remained firm yet soft. I did what I did to save our people. You servanted my authority, Hippolyta said tightly. He attacked the princess, branded her with his torture mark. She spat. I and our sisters will not stand for such a threat to go without warning. And how did that work out for you? Diana said angrily you started a war. Artemis stood up and howled, he started it when he stood against you. When he broke the treaty, she turned to her sisters, who here wishes for retribution. Uzumaki Naruto is the last remaining Uzumaki in the world. His death will only bring us peace. I say we fight. Fight for our dead sisters, what say you? She said icily. The Amazons remained quiet for a brief moment before they howled in response, arms in the air. Artemis rounded towards the queen and knelt once more, we can win this, my queen. We cannot tolerate his presence anymore. I will not allow for war to break out again. One of the sisters replied, you are afraid of one boy. Hippolyta scowled, have you seen him fight? She fidgeted at the braces of her throne, thinking deeply on how to resolve this situation. Uzumaki Naruto will not be touched, the treaty will be honored. Artemis bowed but spoke against her counsel. The Grand Council must decide for us, my queen. Hippolyta said, all against this motion. The majority of the council raised their hands, they had all wanted Uzumaki's blood for what had happened. Artemis smiled. She would get her opportunity to avenge her sisters. To war. She roared and they all roared in response. Diana's frustration peaked, her fist found one of the pillars in the temple. Artemis looked at her old friend and said, you should be happy. We are doing this for you. Diana hissed, you've doomed us all. Do you not know what happened during the last war? Or that Naruto houses enough chakra to fight for a hundred days on end? Artemis remained silent. He has alleys, he hides in secret. We can find him. Artemis replied, I already did. Hippolyta addressed that, after your failed assassination, he will take extra precautions not to be found. And how can he do that? One of the council members asked by seeking out the amulet of Anubis. A soft voice spoke from the front of the temple. They all rose and knelt in the presence of the Queen of Olympus. Hera said, Rise, my children. Hippolyta gulped, he sought an instrument of order, is it not under the protection of the lords? We cannot see him anymore. Blasphemy, one of the council members shouted. He seeks to undo us. Hera's smile turned into a frown, he seeks what he cannot have. And what is that? Family. Diana's eyes widened at that. Naruto sought to unravel reality, he sought to return his family from the dead. 
she had heard of such powers being manipulated before. The revival of Thamisaira after their death at the hands of the Uzumaki was one such example. Hera stressed, the Uzumaki must be defeated before he accomplishes such a thing. Artemis nodded, her quest had been set and she had now been given authority by something beyond that of their queen. Diana rushed out of the temple. Hera's gentle smile had a sickening undertone, the final Uzumaki. His death would give her great joy. She had sought after him, following every trail that Batman had given to her but to no avail. No one could find him. Zatara's magic couldn't trace his location and Adam had detection no significant permeation of chakra. It seemed all lost. All except one, Batman had detected something in Japan. So here she stood in front of a monastery deep within the forested area around Kyoto. She searched the abandoned building and found nothing once more. I've heard you were looking for me. I hear you've been looking for me. Fear wasn't something that was familiar to Diana. In fact the Amazonian feared nothing except for the gods but she couldn't help but feel a sense of dread as Naruto simply appeared out of thin air. Her magic didn't even appear to respond to his chakra like it should have. Yet despite this sudden turn of events, she chose to draw her blade and attack him. A foolish mistake, Amon Ra. Gold chains flowed forwards from Naruto's body and quickly wrapped around Diana's body like a snake circling its prey. Don't take my presence here as an admission of surrender. Diana struggled against her bindings, her eyes grew cloudy and Naruto watched in amusement as but a tiny little flicker of electricity wrapped around her. You stand upon the sacred ground of the Shinto, your gods aren't welcome here. Diana said angrily, I sought you out in peace. And yet it was you who attacked first. Naruto said with a grin. Diana roared out in pain, you killed my sisters. Naruto frowned as he watched her shatter the bonds that held her in pure rage. Her sword reached his throat, tell me why I shouldn't kill you now. Naruto gestured downwards, revealing that he too had his blade against her heart. He sighed in relief as Diana let her blade go. You know, I'm sorry. He said softly, I thought they would return, I didn't know that they would die. Diana looked into his purple eyes, so full of sadness and anger that it broke her heart. She had failed him, as a mentor, as a confidant and as a friend but her heart never yielded to the guilt it instead stood firm as she did against any foe, no matter their relationship. You have started a war, she said angrily, a war that will either end in a singular outcome, your death or the demise of Themyscira. She raised her blade, ignoring the oppressing feeling of chakra that began to seep around them. You were mistaken, it is not I who started this war. Diana's body fell to the ground as the very earth around them cracked in response to his gravity. Naruto followed her in kind his sword touched lightly against her neck. It was you. Diana choked out, if you think I am so far gone, if you think that our bond wasn't true then I can only be seen as your enemy. She stared intensely into Naruto's eyes, her gaze remained unflinching even as his blade threatened to spear right through her throat. She gave him an ultimatum, then kill me. Naruto froze, what? His gravity wavered in response to his shaky will, Diana could have run in that moment but she remained on her knees. I am the princess of Timesira, daughter of Zeus. By killing me, you would have eliminated the strongest threat that you would face in the coming war. She reasoned, if I am truly this evil manipulative woman that you believe I am then why not just end me? He faltered again, Diana pressed harder, or do you remain so cowardly that you are only able to kill when your enemies' backs are turned? Naruto roared in pure rage. His blade came crashing down onto Diana who simply closed her eyes in resignation that her pupil had lost himself to the darkness. Yet no such relief came, instead, she felt Naruto's gravity simply dissipate, her eyes fluttered open in kind, finding Naruto's hand gripping his sword arm, the blade was but a hair away from ripping into her neck. She grasped the blade and gently lowered it, we aren't enemies, Naruto. You lied to me. He growled as she stood up. I have simply bestowed upon you the mercy that of which your kind wouldn't give me. Diana muttered, truly, I regret my actions. Perhaps when you arrived, I had been overcome by biases but in time I saw you for who you truly were. Naruto shivered as she placed her hand on his cheek. I am not good person, Naruto. I have killed, I have maimed, I have destroyed any enemy that stood against my people. But even if we are ourselves not pure of heart, we can still protect those that are. Naruto frowned, you sought to protect me, 
Diana smiled softly, I have nothing to gain by lying. She stared at her bracelets and muttered something in ancient Greek that Naruto couldn't understand. My sisters are hunting you at Hera's behest. By telling you this, I invoke the greatest dishonor I can upon myself. I am aware, Naruto said simply. She asked quizzically, how? Diana's eyes widened, something shifted in the air around her, it was something that she couldn't quite understand. It felt old, no, it felt as if it belonged to something far beyond her, an entity that transcended humanity and gods alike. Naruto grinned, I hold the amulet of Anubis. She stared at the amulet with a frown, Naruto hadn't even begun to understand the very power that he held around his neck, but she feared that like all things, this power came with great consequences. The amulet has a very interesting ability, it allows me to see anyone I've tagged with my chakra. That was somewhat incorrect, the amulet simply gave him visions of what it wanted him to see and it didn't take long before Naruto realized that the visions were directly related to people who he had used his chakra against. Diana muttered, that's how you've always been one step ahead of us. She looked at her student with a curious expression, why tell me this? Naruto simply answered, how else will you be able to convince Batman if you don't give him some sort of actionable intel? He threw her an object, wear that, it'll allow me to contact you. She caught it and found it was a golden ring with a black onyx stone. The stone was inscribed with some sort of kanji, that she vaguely recognized as sky. What will you do? She asked. Don't, Naruto couldn't finish what he was saying before a jet of scorching red heat slammed into his armor and flung him back several meters back. Diana. Superman's landed into the ground in pure rage, get away from her, he roared. Naruto was less interested in the bestial Kryptonian than he was in the interesting magic spell that had been cast around him. Diana hissed, you fool, you shouldn't be here. Superman didn't listen. He flew straight into the kneeling Naruto. Naruto grunted at the brute's strength. Fighting the normal man of steel was already tall task but to fight. I don't know if I should be honored, you sun dipped for little ol' me. Naruto grinned sadistically as he was driven into the middle of the field. He raised his hand and with a mere flick, his gravity flung Superman straight into the forest. I know you're there, Batman. Naruto announced. His amulet glowed a menacing yellow underneath his armor as the air began to shimmer revealing Batman floating down with Zatara and Jon Stewart. He raised an eyebrow in amusement, this is your idea of a hit, I seem to recall that I beat you with a greater force. Batman's lips twitched. Naruto jumped back immediately as he felt a beam of radiation erupt from the sky above him. His body spun in midair to avoid the speeding Superman, he grabbed him by the cape and spun him around intent on throwing him into the air but the bastard had other ideas as he led a howling torrent of ice and wind to freeze the ground beneath him. Naruto raised gravity once more, the ice cracked but not before he felt a presence behind. Martian Manhunter's telekinetic ability spiked, and Naruto felt his gravitational field strike against an equal opposing force. He growled in anger, eyes flashed red as a beam of concussive force struck the Martian in the chest. Adam, now, Captain Adam landed. His metallic husk of a body crunched against the ground allowing his quantum field to expand and grow around Naruto. Naruto didn't have to see Batman to know that the man was grinning at the outcome, the idiot must have believed that he had won. Adam's quantum field elapsed, and Naruto's body was forced into the ground as chains of metal began to grab him. Naruto grunted, IW won't go so as. Zatara stepped forward and slammed his stick onto the ground. Several hundred runes began to scry from the stick and began to wiggle their way around him. Naruto felt a chilling darkness edging across his vision, the runes were beginning to consume his body like a child scribbling erratically across a page. This was ancient magic, one that even the amulet refused to undo. Yet despite the fatigue that overcame him, Naruto let out a chuckle. It came out as a soft giggle that sent shivers upon all of their spines. That laughter reminded them of someone each of them of a man that they wished they never met. Captain Adam questioned, what's so funny, kid? Naruto's groaned out, why you think I see came alone? Superman reacted first, get down. But it was too late, a loud bang was heard and a canister fell onto the ground. Smoke rose from the ground, Captain Adam merely raised his hand and disintegrated the smoke. Adam's momentary distraction allowed for his control of his quantum field around Naruto to quiver, 
allowing for something akin to a crawling darkness to creep through the field and wrap around Naruto. Batman frowned, he couldn't understand what the point of that intervention was. Surely, Naruto was smart enough to know that such a distraction wouldn't work against them. He stared at Naruto almost inquisitively, trying to ignore the young boy's crooked smile as he tried to discern what his intentions were. Then it happened, as sudden as a flash of lightning, darkness began to spill throughout the world around them. Zatara was the only one to see it, a teenager cloaked in a garb that only allowed him to see her face, yet her presence was undeniable and it was all too familiar to the wizard. He whispered, Trigon, and just as the darkness came, it soon dissipated leaving the Justice League confused and in disarray. They stared at the scorched ground upon which Naruto was once bound, it was empty, he was gone. Batman grunted in silent anger. Superman punched the ground in frustration. Zatara stood, stiff and shaking from what he had just felt. However, it was Diana who moved, grabbing the caped crusader and slamming him against a tree. You lied, she said angrily, you told me that I would get to talk to him in peace. Batman narrowed his eyes, I knew that he would reveal his presence to you. Diana snorted, and how did you know that? Batman smiled sadly, you're not just his physical weakness, you're his anchor. Diana froze in shock, her grip slacked around his cape allowing Batman to lower her hand gently. Have you ever asked yourself, why he reacted so badly? Diana frowned, because I, we betrayed him. We, he never cared about anybody else except you. Batman addressed the elephant in the room, and I'm guessing you reached that conclusion on your own. He saw you as more than just a mentor. Superman chose to intervene, and that's why we couldn't trust you with him, he could have killed you. Diana instinctively touched the ring on her finger, Batman saw it but never made any indication about her latest addition to her jewelry. Her eyes drifted to her boyfriend, glaring at the two men, she said with utter confidence, I am the daughter of Zeus. I don't fall so easily. Superman tried to placate, W we know that, Diana's sword drew to his neck and the man of steel gulped. For two men who preach about honesty and loyalty, you sure are good at betrayal and lying. They remained silent as she flew off. Superman made way to catch up to her but Batman stopped him. He shook his head, and Superman simply sighed in resignation not knowing what he had done wrong. Diana was flying without direction. Her mind was abuzz with so many different questions yet the loudest of them was a simple one. What did she mean to him? No, she thought in slight resignation. Batman's line of inquiry appeared to be directed to her as well. She wondered to herself, a somewhat morbid thought began to form. What did Naruto mean to her? The answer was something that she dreaded to find out. Bang! Three people hit the ground in an unknown location, two of them groaned in pain from the awkward landing. Ing hell, must you always teleport us like that, Raven? The cloaked woman simply smirked, I'd have thought you'd get used to awkward landings by now, Ravager considering your father and all. Ravager stood taller than Raven, her armored body literally towering over her. The woman sneered, you can't talk to me about daddy issue, miss my dad is an evil demon who wants to rule the world. Raven's cloak expanded and darkness seemed to pull out and into the room. Naruto sighed, must you two always fight? Yes, the two of them shouted without ever breaking eye contact with each other. Poison Ivy giggled as she entered the room, Seems like I missed the memo to your little gathering. Naruto grinned, you get it. Ivy simply gave him a snarky little smirk, when have I ever let you down? She gave Naruto an inscribed box, he inspected the Egyptian letters and whispered the words of Amon Ra. The box glowed gold and it opened with a click, revealing a red gem. How did you know that big red and blue would be out of his city? Naruto shrugged, it was a hunch. I assumed Batman had an ulterior motive to helping Diana find me. Ravager raised an eyebrow as she took off her mask, Diana. Already on first name basis with Wonder Girl. Raven corrected, it's Wonder Woman, you idiot. Naruto shot them both a look before they devolved into another argument. Though he felt somewhat out of place when he realized that all three women were looking at him expectantly. He sighed, it's not like that, sewer. The girls all said in unison. Naruto grunted, as he headed up to his room. Ravager turned to her compatriots and smirked, bet you they slept together. I can hear you, Naruto shouted, they just giggled, before they headed their separate ways. Naruto had deemed it important that they were rarely seen together, 
something that Ravager and Raven understood even more today after seeing how powerful the Justice League were. Naruto sighed as he finally got some peace and quiet, he shouldn't have seen her, he thought to himself. It was the most tactical approach, he needed someone to help him with his the Meiskern problem and she was the only one who could help him. Diana's pleas didn't help either, she was stubborn and strong-willed, it's why he liked her. Yet she was willing to go down on her knees just to prove a point. Naruto lay on his bed, confused and incredibly frustrated at her actions. But he neither had the patience nor the time to dwell on such tedious affairs. He had finally got the second part of the puzzle, the Eye of Osiris. A simple but large red gem with several golden etches inscribed all over it. He grabbed the amulet of Anubis and placed the eye over it, and he began to recite the enchantment that he had been told to. Nothing happened. He grimaced and recited the words once more. Still, however, no reaction occurred. Naruto gritted his teeth in frustration, nothing was ever simple. He spoke, despite nobody being present. You said that was all I needed. He heard a harsh whisper echo through his mind, foolish child, Osiris's gem doesn't work unless you also possess Isis's piece. Naruto rubbed his head from the powerful mental presence. He peered at the box, and a small thought formed in his head. He placed the gem back into the box and placed the box on top of the amulet. What are you doing? Naruto grinned, it's just a hunch. Naruto began to incant, this time, the box glowed a menacing gold and red, he watched it, intermingle with the necklace. A bright light blinded him for a moment, before it died down to reveal an ornate necklace piece that was reminiscent to that which pharaohs wore. The necklace was made of pure gold, red gems spread evenly across the gold along with several hieroglyphics that Naruto vaguely remembered to represent the name of the three deities. He placed the necklace on, and felt a familiar power rush through him, except it felt a thousand times more powerful than when he had adorned the amulet of Anubis alone. It was like he could feel himself to be one with the power that the amulet held. A dark grin spread across his lips, as he breathed, three down, two more to go. Good going, kid, Naruto winced in pain as heard the many whispers being to reverberate across his mindscape once more. He quickly chose to shut his connection off, something he was thankful that the crazy bastard Clarion taught him. Naruto was beginning to understand just how powerful the upper echelons of beings were. Clarion and Fate, now Atom, Naruto knew that he couldn't beat them in a fight. Captain Atom especially, Naruto had assumed that the stoic hero was only able to manipulate energy but Lex Luthor explained arrogantly that Atom's power lay in his ability to manipulate strong and weak nuclear forces. Today, he felt exactly how powerful his quantum field was, it reminded him of that bastard Ryu. The ability to disintegrate anything, manipulate atoms as if they were your playthings, such a power was beyond even his own. Still, he was somewhat glad that Adam was bound to the Justice League. He shuddered just imagining fighting an evil Captain Adam. There was a part of him that wanted Adam on his side, having an ally with the ability to manipulate the strongest forces in the universe was indispensable. Naruto pinched his nose as his thoughts drifted to the three, well four members of his team. He remembered meeting Ravager last week. Flashback Rose Wilson dodged a knife strike before the man's shirt and throwing him over her and into the ground. She broke his wrist before grabbing his head, she demanded, tell me where it is. Where is what? Someone walked out of the shadows of the alleyway. He wore what looked to be heavy armor and visor helmet. Impossible. How had she not detected this person? Is it perhaps this? The man held a ledger in his hand. Rose quickly drew her pistol and said, If you know what is good for you, but a simple gesture and she was flung straight towards the wall. She growled and fired her pistol, emptying her barrel. Each of her bullets stopped a centimeter from the man's body and head, he commended, You have good aim. I have been watching you. She said, I don't give. You have been here for about three months. Looking for daddy dearest, are we? This ledger is your last clue, I wonder what would happen if I burnt it. A flame danced on the palm of his empty hand. Rose gritted her teeth, what do you want, I want you to join my organization. What's in it for me? She replied. A life free from the shadow of your father, he said. He threw her the ledger and she caught it, so do we have an accord, Rose Wilson or is it Ravager? A grin played on her face, so long as I get some bloody action. She had a feeling that this man wasn't going to take no for answer and Russia was getting boring. 
The man extended his hand and she shook it. So what do I call you? She asked. Cage, he said simply, we should get going now, the police are on their way. Don't tell me you're scared of the police, she asked looking at him as if he were crazy. No, but I am sure that you would rather not fight the entire Justice League, she shuddered slightly, maybe it was excitement or maybe it was apprehension, Rose didn't feel like finding out. So what is this organization called? A smile played on his lips, Akatsuki. Rose looked at him quizzically, Don, is that meant to have some kind of dual meaning? Think on it, she groaned, oh great, he was just like her dad. And Raven on the other hand had found him. Naruto could remember when he found a shivering teenager in front of his door asking for help. Ravager tried to kill her the second she opened her mouth. The girl really did believe in the mantra shoot first ask questions later. Apparently, Raven was the daughter of a powerful demon named Trigon. Naruto didn't believe her at first, well at least until a demon appeared from the shadows and tried to take her. Despite his best sense, he allowed the girl to sleep in his apartment. As for Ivy, the woman was just crazy always muttering about how good it felt to be in his presence and that he was an embodiment of the green. He didn't have much options, so he kind of just let her join. He would have more time to begin gathering members after he stole the last two artifacts. The new necklace gave him an even more intimate connection to the remaining pieces, he couldn't just feel them now, he knew exactly where they were. If he were feeling vindictive, Naruto would have enjoyed watching Rose spending a week trying to find a hidden temple in the Sahara. But time was of the essence, and if he knew anything about Batman was that he knew about the heists by now. He guessed he was heading to Sudan, next day Mount Justice. 6 a.m. Batman arrived at the headquarters with a tight grimace, whilst he had been busy plotting to find Naruto. He had allowed for several heists to go unnoticed, the smallest semblance that he could muster was that it hadn't been stolen from Gotham yet. Zatara had confirmed it though the man was still afraid of something that he had seen during their time in Kyoto. He warned him that the person collecting these instruments wasn't interested in selling them, sure they were priceless but to collect them all would simply alert all authorities about the thefts. No, Zatara said that they were interested in using them for something. What it was? Neither of them knew but Batman was sure that he would be damned if the last two pieces were stolen. He had asked Zatara to track the unknown piece whilst he would have a team to guard to the one in Gotham. Thankfully, he had just the team to do such a mission. Batman walked into the training room with a raised eyebrow, it was amusing to watch the teens gathering and practicing their hand-to-hand -hand combat. Robin and Artemis were locked in a fierce duel, dodging and weaving around a flurry of blows, Batman felt a sense of pride swell within him as Robin used his superior athleticism to twist his body away from a surprise back kick before spinning around and delivering a sweep kick that knocked Artemis to the ground. The group chuckled at Artemis's fall, to which she glared angrily at them. Batman frowned. They still hadn't accepted her. He decided to intervene before anything worse came from the altercation. Cough. The team all turned in complete surprise at the bat's presence, many of them wondering how they hadn't sensed him. I have a mission for you all. They stood at attention, watching as a hologram of the world appeared. Recently several high-value heists have been conducted across the globe. Each time the perpetrator or perpetrators have taken some powerful magical artifacts. Another heist is going to happen tonight at the Gotham Museum. I believe they are trying to complete a set, of which, the Bow of Ra is the last artifact. Each artifact is worth millions but together they could be sold for billions. Supergirl will be assisting you on protecting the bow. Wally asked, couldn't we just you know move the bow? Batman said, the museum have accepted help from the Justice League but declined moving it. Robin asked, what makes you think that it's going to happen tonight? Calder nodded in agreement, wondering how the caped crusader could know such a thing. Batman grimaced, whoever is stealing these artifacts has been getting more and more anxious. It's just a hunch but I believe they wish to complete the set as soon as possible. He stared them with hard eyes, this person or persons are metahumans. He showed the footage in Metropolis Museum and they all saw a security guard stumble towards the glass that held the box, shattering it with his gun, he grabbed the box and ran out of the room. The camera shifted to outside the museum, they saw the man give it to a hooded woman who simply melded into the muddy ground. She can control minds so you will need Miss Martian with you at all times. Superboy snorted, all she can do is control minds and teleport. 
We can beat her, we don't need Supergirl. Supergirl appeared on the hollow machine with a smirk, would you like to tell the group what happened the last time you tried to go against a telepath? Superboy sneered hatefully, Amazo didn't count, that monster was something different, surely this woman wouldn't be able to do such a feat. Supergirl took his silence as a token of her victory, she said, we have a lot of work to do. I'll be waiting for you all at Gotham. Batman said, you've been briefed, get ready and meet Supergirl at the museum. I will also be keeping an eye on you all. This made them all gulp. His cold gaze seemed to make them rush out of the room as quickly as they could. Wally whispered, something is definitely up. Robin agreed with his friend, Batman seemed different almost morose. Supergirl stayed on the line, her holographic clone looked at Batman with a raised eyebrow. You didn't tell them. Batman frowned, we aren't sure. It could have been any number of Earth elementals. And how many do you know that can manipulate people and meld into only mud? Supergirl questioned. If it is indeed Poison Ivy, we have to assume he is involved. Batman frowned. He tweaked his thumbs in quiet contemplation. There is no proof, he stressed. Going overboard will only deter the thief from coming. Supergirl shrugged, just no, if Naruto does appear, I will not risk the safety of the team just so he doesn't get the bow. Batman gave her a cold gaze, if you he does come, you run with it, he will chase after you. Supergirl sneered, and get myself killed in the process. I'm not some lamb you can just put to slaughter. My son dipped cousin could barely hurt him, I'm not even a fraction as strong as him. Batman didn't get a time to reply. Supergirl shut of the connection in anger but also understandable anxiety. Bruce Wayne let out a breath that he had been holding in, he rubbed his head in slight frustration. This situation was getting out of hand, he needed to end it. Too many variables were at play here. What was Naruto's plan? What did he say to Diana? Why was he defeated easily at Kyoto? He remembered confronting Diana along with Zatara at the headquarters. He let you beat him. Did you really think the gods would have allowed you to sully the ground with their ancestors' blood? Zatara's face had paled to the point that he thought that the man would faint. Batman understood the implication of what had occurred after doing some research. Attacking Naruto on that ground was akin to fighting Wonder Woman in ancient Greece. It was pure suicide. He pressed a button the machine, Adam, I need your help. He might come to regret this action, but he needed to ensure the safety of the team. There was still time for one more play. Meanwhile Metropolis Rose Wilson spun around the staff of Horus, she said, you know I have no idea why anyone would want this piece of junk. The eye of Horus glowed an ethereal red and Rose was sent crashing into the wall. How many times do I have to tell you to stop playing with the artifacts? Naruto said amused at the groaning Rose. Hey, how was I supposed to know the staff has a mind of its own, and besides, I wouldn't have touched it if Raven wasn't hogging the shower. You know I can hear you. A female voice spoke in both their heads. Rose snarled, get out the out of my head, you damned witch. Make me, she said. Naruto replied with a laugh using his own telepathy, good to know that you girls are bonding. Two voices spoke at the same, off. Naruto grinned succinctly at their hostility. Save all that anger for tonight, Rose asked, couldn't you just like get in there and take it? Naruto said, Batman's smart. He already has a team of covert operatives watching it by now. Raven said, and you expect us to fight the Justice League. Rose sneered at the girl as she walked down the stairs with just a towel wrapped around her body. Wear some clothes, nobody wants to see your body. Raven grinned, I can think of one. Naruto merely stared at her for a moment longer before coughing and quickly saying, regardless, Batman is unlikely to send any Justice League member. He's going to send his little team of sidekicks. Rose guffawed, you mean to tell me you want us to fight a group of League wannabes? Naruto nodded, curious as to what had caused her immediate excitement. Dad has always said that I was weaker than them. I'm going to show him today, she said as her tone turned from angry to jovial in a blink of an eye. Naruto facepalmed and Raven whispered, talk about daddy issues. Naruto said, but you are weaker than them. Rose grabbed her sword and narrowed her eyes at Naruto. Look, unless you have a piece of kryptonite in your arsenal. Superboy is going to steamroll right through you. Rose just grinned, well you're in for a little surprise then. Naruto didn't really bother asking what the bipolar woman was talking about. Instead, 
he simply told the two of them to get ready and to meet him at Gotham. His plan depended on Batman not knowing that he was involved, he'd rather not fight Captain Atom or Superman for as long as he could. Unluckily for him, it seemed other parties had also gotten wind about the robberies. Especially one vicious little kitty cat. Night had begun to fall, the museum was finally closed and that meant it was time for the team to enact their plan. Batman had given them several of his microscopic cameras which they had embedded across the room, the cameras had infrared which allowed them to see even if say someone threw a smokescreen. Miss Martian was stationed in the room, invisible to the naked eye, so that she could ambush the intruders if necessary. The others were in a control room watching the room whilst Supergirl was in the sky taking an aerial view of the area surrounding the museum. Unbeknownst to the team, there was also another invisible presence in the room. Captain Adam stood bored as he watched the Martian girl float around the room. Children, that's what they were, the soldier didn't understand the need for them. He could have done this mission alone. Crash. The alarms blazed all over the museum, glass shattered everywhere, and Captain Adam frowned as he was unable to discern the cause of what had just happened. Batman had said that the Uzumaki boy was involved yet he couldn't feel his chakra, instead he could feel a growing darkness. They say emotions are a bitch. He heard a whisper, I think yours might just kill you. Before Captain Adam could react, he saw a shadow slowly wrap around Miss Martian's form and her eyes to glow a distinct red. Empath, he thought. Adam moved in time to avoid a telekinetic blast that cracked the wall. Okay, she was far weaker than her counterpart but he was slightly impressed with her power. She growled, I'm going to kill you. Adam merely raised his hand and his quantum field enveloped the girl, knocking her out clean. The door burst open, and the team rushed in, Wally said angrily, what did you do to her? Captain Adam stared the boy down, she was possessed by an empath. Keep your guard up and your minds clear. Calder raised his blade, how do we know that you're not a shapeshifter? Captain Adam raised his hands, he transmuted the glass cases to an indestructible metal. Does that satisfy your line of inquiry? Calder nodded, good because I want you all in pairs. It takes a while for the effect to occur, so knock the other person out before they attack. The team looked at each other, who is going to take Superboy? Adam narrowed his eyes at the impulsive boy, I will. Now go, the darkness has to be coming from somewhere. Superboy said, couldn't you just turn it into something less harmful? Captain Adam's lifeless eyes seemed to take a very dangerous edge. My powers aren't a toy, I only use them when necessary. What good are, like now, he said. Superboy felt a cloth wrap around his mouth, muffling his speech, go, find it and bring it back to me. Adam was intrigued by its power, the darkness felt so real yet it possessed no atomic structure. It was almost immaterial as if it came from, the astral plane. Oh no, this was bad, he had just taken out their only telepath. He froze when he felt an incoming mass, it was falling at almost hypersonic speeds. Above, a few seconds earlier, Supergirl watched uninterestedly with her atomic vision and infrared vision picked nothing out of the ordinary. No had entered the building and all seemed fine, that was until her comms went to shit and it was revealed that there's some sort of empath manipulating Miss Martian. At least, Captain Adam was there. Surprise bitch, she heard as a sword pierced straight through her chest. She turned around and saw a white-haired girl with Deathstroke's mask covering the top half of her hair. The girl had emerged from a darkness so suddenly that it was impossible to react. The sword ripped out of her chest and she gurgled some blood, I am possible. She muttered weakly. That's what he thought as well, he thought I was crazy as well. She said with a loud laugh, waving her sword around. Anyway, boss wants you out of the picture. She moved to thrust her sword but Supergirl moved faster and grabbed the girl by the neck. The Kryptonian's chest was already healing despite Rose's ability to dampen her invulnerability. Slink. Unfortunately for you, she isn't the only one capable of wounding a Kryptonian. Two swords erupted out of her chest, Kara Danvers gasped in pure shock. Pain unlike anything bubbled through her body. Except my Tatsuka and Kusangi are special. The damage lasts for a very long time. Blood poured out of her mouth, her body refused to heal and was in a constant state of deterioration and failed healing which seemed to induce a far greater pain than she could ever imagine. 
She turned and looked at the perpetrator with wide eyes, and Naruto, why? Naruto sneered, you were in my way. He ripped his blade out causing her to scream and channeled all of his power into his fist. Kara was sent to the ground with a sonic boom. Rose grinned bloodthirstily, I like this look on you. Naruto felt bile rising through his throat, but it kept in there. He couldn't waver now, he was so close to his goal. The Uzumaki had but one rule, family above all. Smash. Now it begins, he said as he peered downwards hoping to see a crater but instead was greeted with the silvery hue that undoubtedly belonged to Captain Adam. Rose stepped back into the shadows, Raven and I will deal with the brats, you steal the bow. Naruto felt her disappear and frowned, I don't think it will be that easy anymore. Captain Adam had sensed Kara's flickering solar energy as she came closer towards the ground, he phased upwards through the glass ceiling and grabbed Kara's unconscious body. His metallic hands felt the distinct sensation of blood pooling against them. Someone had managed to mortally wound Kara. No, she was healing, he could feel her life force was fighting against the wounds. He inspected the wounds, his hands glowed a silvery hue and he found himself frowning. It was minute almost impossible to detect but it was still there. Chakra, Uzumaki Naruto had caused this. The boy had gone too far, Adam's power flared beyond that of which very few of his foes ever saw. He ripped the tiny amounts of chakra out of Kara and watched as her body healed itself back to normal. Captain Adam made the mistake of not using his full power against Naruto. He should have ripped every last bit of chakra out of his system when he had the chance. Adam wouldn't make the same mistake again. He peered down at Kara's sleeping form and the faint moving forms of the team in the hallways. He would take responsibility if he had to. He would do what a soldier was meant to do. Adam flew straight into the air, his speed so fast that it appeared almost instantaneous. He could feel the chakra in the air, around him, settling around. His quantum field expanded and took the form of a black hole. Everything was drawn in, everything except Naruto. You should know gravity is my domain. Naruto's metallic voice echoed. Adam's body glowed, that wasn't my aim. Naruto jumped back as he felt Adam's presence right next to him. Naruto was alarmed as he was caught into an expanded quantum field. There is no mercy for people like you, he said in a cold voice. Naruto screamed in pain, his very essence felt as if it was being stripped apart atom by atom. Naruto gasped, they will never accept you if you kill me. Captain Adam's voice was disembodied, I won't kill you, I have the ability to control atoms, like a puppet on a string, everything that you are belongs to me. Quote. Naruto grunted in pain. His chakra rippled through the air violently and struck at Adam who merely raised his hand and absorbed it as if it was his own. Your chakra, your body, your mind, your life, they are mine, Adam said, you are nothing, you will spend the rest of your life in prison for attempted murder, I will make sure that you will never escape. Naruto laughed, his body heaved under the power of Adam's quantum field. You and I are alike. Captain Adam's power spiked in anger, I'm nothing like you boy. Naruto's grinned bloodthirstily, oh but we are, like you, I also control the fundamental forces. It was Adam's turn to laugh, gravity is the weakest, crack. Adam jumped back as his quantum field was disrupted, Naruto's eyes glowed a celestial golden color, he could feel the boy's body ripple with golden energy. What have you done? Adam said in shock, a staff appeared in Naruto's hand, Adam could feel two very different energies fighting against each other inside Naruto like oil and water, they refused to mix but they didn't need to. Naruto slammed his staff down, red chains erupted forwards and began to twirl around Captain Adam. Adam disintegrated each of them, but he felt his field was going into disarray. You like, at first, I wondered why exactly the power of order didn't work on you. Then I realized that the problem didn't lie within your power but rather your control. Adam growled, his quantum field expanded and consumed the very skies around them. Naruto raised his staff in time as Adam converted every atom around him into shards of north metal. Naruto raised his hand, Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. A thousand clones spurred forward from a plume of smoke, Captain Adam's eyes widened when he saw them all raise the same staff. Red lightning spurred forward from them as they channeled their chakra into the staves. Let it be known, Shin. Amatsu Mikabashi, they roared. The skies ruptured, 
The air around Adam grew heavy, the very air around him swirled and became agitated before it was consumed by an unholy red fire. The north metal shards didn't even stand a chance against the heat, Adam's quantum field began to fray as he tried his best to consume the chakra but there was something in the chakra that made it impossible to control. It was if the energy was in a constant state of chaos. His eyes widened when he realized what was about to happen. Adam had no choice but to expand his quantum field as far as he could, he needed to protect the city below. The air didn't just catch fire, no, it literally exploded, every molecule of oxygen had been imbued with Naruto's chakra and the power from the staff of Horus. Captain Adams was forced to consume an explosion equivalent to that of 200 atomic bombs. That would have been easy for someone of Adam's ability, in fact, Naruto surmised that Adam's energy absorption was endless. But the chaotic nature of the staff made his field begin to distort and disrupt. Adam was struggling to contain the energy, he was going to explode. Naruto realized that this was his best opportunity to get rid of Adam at least until he managed to reform, someone who could manipulate molecules was virtually impossible to kill unless you managed to remove all the molecules around them. Naruto gripped the frizzing Captain Adam before he could regain his bearings and threw him straight into the sky. He turned to his clones and grinned, and that's how you beat an unbeatable foe. The clones snorted, if he can't be beaten, how did you beat him? Naruto rolled his eyes at the smartass comment, he released them all and immediately grabbed his head in slight pain from the influx of memories. His gaze fell upon to the museum, he needed to get the bow and get out of Gotham as soon as he could. His fight with Adam surely alerted every single magician, in fact, he could feel their presence inching closer by the minute. The the Myskarans were coming. He dove towards the ground, he was all but a streak of blue and black crashing straight through the glass ceiling and into the museum. He couldn't feel Rose and Raven's presence, it made him worried. He closed his eyes and allowed for his chakra to echolocate, he couldn't sense anyone, everything was deathly still. He rushed towards the room that held the bow and found it empty. He had been tricked. This was Batman's plan all along. They hadn't just taken the bow, they had taken Rose and Raven as well. He closed his eyes and tried to connect to them through the rings, he found himself unable to. Naruto gripped his two blades in pure rage, a black fire consumed the very earth around him. You took something that belongs to me, Batman. He gazed into the tiny cameras in the room there will be consequences. Batman's voice spoke through the machine, you will never see the bow or the girls. Naruto's voice became disembodied, demonic and reeked of pure evil. Then I will become the very devil you sought to prove I was. Black fire screeched, consumed the machines, erupted all around the walls burning everything in its path. By the time the Justice League arrived a few minutes later, the fire hadn't just consumed the museum, it had disintegrated it. Zatara muttered, Enrut K. Kalb Arif O. T. Rita, his magic spread and managed to consume the black fire, instead of doing his bidding, it simply caused more of the fire to appear. So powerful, he channeled more magic until eventually a very fatigued Zatara managed to quell the flames. Batman stared at the collapsed ruins, his eyes hardened at the declaration of war. Do you understand now? He turned to the other Justice League member. Uzumaki Naruto can't be left alone he must be contained. The others voiced their agreement. Batman's eyes fell upon Wonder Woman's own, and found himself frowning as he saw her disappointed gaze. He couldn't stop her from blasting herself into the air and flying away. He had just lost his greatest weapon against Naruto. He was sure that she was already on her way to him. Superman asked, where did Diana go? Batman picked up her Justice League communicator and Superman felt a sickening thought ripple through his entire body. I should have known, he said in defeat. Bruce said, this is good, we can us. Clark raised his hand, that's enough, you've done enough damage. You almost got my sister killed and now you've made me lose Diana. The man of steel's eyes glowed a hollowing red that ended the conversation. He had enough of his friend's games. Batman's head hit the back of the wall. He couldn't understand why nobody saw what he saw. Nobody saw the threat that the boy was, his quest to acquire objects of power, his willingness to work with beings like Clarion. He was right. The Uzumaki were evil. Batman should have headed the words of his old master. A plagued mind was often one that was easily swayed. Bzz.
Batman picked up his communicator and found a text message that sent him spiraling into an even greater frustration. His plan had only been half successful. Someone had reached the bow before either of them. The one in the museum was a fake. His gaze hardened as he moved back towards the bat cave. The detective never saw the sloshing distortion behind him. In the shadows, a humanoid ink-like figure grew and grinned toothily. Humans. They were always so easy to play with. Everything was going according to its plan. Selena Kyle was an opportunist, she benefited from whatever the world gave her, and she took whatever she could in excess. It was a philosophy that had served well, allowing her to outgrow her so-called destiny to be forever trapped in the circle of poverty that plagued Gotham. So, it would come as no surprise that when she caught with that a new thief was looking to get their paws on an artifact to complete a very coveted and expensive set that she decided to play the fence by stealing it. Of course, that was until she realized who the two prospective buyers would be. One was her ex-lover, a man that she knew wouldn't even consider for a second placing her in jail in order to get what he wanted and the other was a maniacal teenage boy with the power set that was equivalent to some of the strongest heroes and villains on the planet. Selena knew that neither of them was planning on fencing the artifact and if what she had seen was to be taken as fact, she would rather not make an enemy of a person that could erase a park-sized building in a few seconds. So, she made the right play. She was a survivor after all. Are you sure? She asked Poison Ivy. Ivy's green lips quirked in a smile. I'd give it to him but he would just hunt you down anyway. Catwoman felt a lump grow in her throat as she knocked against the white door. She felt the door creak open, exposing a dark living room that she could barely see around. He's not here. Selena hissed at Ivy who also seemed to be frowning. Ivy muttered, something's wrong. She could feel the veritable darkness smothering the air around her, Naruto's usual warm nature energy was tainted with something colder, something evil. I told you we should have simply held onto it until it blew over. Catwoman traversed the empty apartment, it was plain with very little evidence that anybody even lived here. It seemed like Cage didn't enjoy staying in any one place for too long. Her green eyes fell upon a crate with some ancient markings, her thief side was itching to take a peek inside. Her hands caressed the engravings with piqued interest, eventually soaking to her curiosity she lifted the top of the crate and peered inside it. Catwoman licked her lips at the dozen of artifacts inside, each of which would be invaluable when sold to the right individual. She moved to grab the golden scarab, didn't your mother ever tell you the tragic tale of the curious cat? Catwoman froze when she felt a blade touch her back. Tell my I shouldn't pierce your spine. Ivy quickly helped her friend. I brought her here to give you something. Both women sighed as Naruto withdrew his blade and sheathed it. Selina turned around. Her lips quirked in a naughty smile though she couldn't stop it from faltering as she stared at the armored hulking in front of her. I've brought you a little gift. She slipped her bag over her shoulder and gave it to Naruto. Steam hissed from his mask as it popped off his face revealing the teenage boy that she had only encountered once before. You were the kid at the docks. She looked at her friend with almost a gaping expression, you're working for him. Ivy shrugged, we have a give and take relationship. Naruto opened the bag, expecting all manners of things except the one object that was in front of him. The bow of raw lay wrapped in a white linen just like in the museum. His amulet vibrated loudly signifying that this was indeed the original. Purple eyes bore into green eyes for a short while. Selina felt like the boy was reading into her soul and she couldn't help but suppress a shiver that ran up her spine. Why? Selina frowned. Don't get me wrong. I didn't do this as some sort of token of friendship. If I could, I would have kept the bow and sold it but I'd rather not get hunted by the Justice League and you. Naruto smiled. It was an empty sort of smile that Catwoman recognized. Hum, very well. Ivy can show you out if you want. Selina wasn't the type of person that left any business opportunity unexplored, even if she was confronted with a foe much more powerful than herself. What about my payment? Naruto raised an eyebrow at her blunt and foolish request, and what makes you think I will honor such a request? She gave him a coy smile, stepping close enough to him that Naruto felt the need to backpedal. His back hit the wall, Catwoman purred whilst leaning her face till he could feel her hot breath tickle his ear. Didn't your mother ever tell you not to cross a black cat? Her sharpened claws caressed his chin, we can be very vicious, she drew her face back so that her eyes were level with his, or we can be quite friendly. 
Naruto blurred, flipping their positions with such speed that Selina didn't register it until her back hit the wall. He leant in, his lips inches away from her own as he said, your seduction games might work on Batman but they won't work on me. Catwoman's eyes widened in pure shock, her body stiffened under his towering presence and power. H how did you? I have some telepathy, I give you credit, your mind is very strong. Both of them felt incredibly hot despite the chilling cold that settled throughout the apartment. She smirked, you find anything interesting in there. Naruto drew back enough that they both had space to breath. He frowned, just that I have more use for you than you'd think. He pointed to the crate, that's your reward. Selina looked at the teenager in surprise, a part of her wondering whether he knew about how much it was worth. As if sensing her thoughts, I expect 60% of the profit you get. She frowned, 60% was a lot especially considering that her fence would take a 15% cut. Perhaps she could convince Lola to take a smaller cut this time. She peered upwards at him, you know Cage, you're not as bad as they make you out to be. She moved forwards and planted a chaste kiss on his cheek to tease the boy. Naruto tried his hardest to suppress a blush but somehow managed to maintain his hardened exterior. Creak. A sudden creak from the door snapped their attention to the culprit. Catwoman and Ivy both froze in shock as Wonder Woman stood with her sword drawn. Get away from him s. She growled, dashing towards Poison Ivy first. Ivy gulped as Diana's fist was mere centimeters from pasting her brain onto the ground. Naruto grabbed Diana's arm, she looked at him with surprise when he shook his head. Diana's striking arm eventually laxed, Ivy sighed in relief. She looked at her boss with an inquisitive gaze, not that it's any of my business but what's Wonder Girl doing here? Diana's eyes narrowed at the plant-wielding mutant though Ivy, now behind Naruto never let up her mocking smile. Naruto looked at Diana for an explanation and the woman found her gaze falling to the ground for a brief moment. Can we talk? She asked. Naruto nodded, he shot Ivy and Catwoman a look that told to leave. Selina gave Diana a sneaky smirk as she headed out of the apartment. Diana shouted, is this your idea of a team, Naruto? Criminals. Naruto shrugged, you get what you order. Besides, Ivy has always been um, a passionate activist. Diana snorted at his reductionist account of Ivy's criminal activities. And the thief, she asked. He raised the bow giving it to Diana who hissed in pain as soon as she touched the powerful magical artifact. Naruto whistled, seems like the Egyptian gods aren't fans of your gods. Diana simply glared at her protege for finding her pain amusing. He took the artifact and said, regardless of her intentions, that thief gave me the one thing I needed to complete the ritual. He summoned the staff of Horus, the eye glowed an intense red as it recognized the bow. They watched in intrigue as the bow began to melt and like a snake began to coil around the golden scepter. The staff was now almost half of his own height, the symbol of Ra and Horus planted all across its exterior. Diana stood fascinated but frightened by the sheer volume of magic she could feel from it. She asked, what ritual? Naruto sighed, do you know why your people were raised after Thamisaira was destroyed? Diana shook her head, her mother had never told her about what happened that day. Your gods actually aren't gods, Diana's sword was immediately at his throat as soon as he uttered those blasphemous words. Careful, she warned. Naruto raised his hands in surrender. He said sheepishly, okay, maybe I might have overstepped a little. Anyway, I'm sure you've realized by now that different pantheons whilst worshipped by different people almost always have a mirror version of themselves. Take Zeus for instant, his domain is supposed to be the sky, but other religions have gods that possess the same domains. The question you should be asking is whether your gods are the omnipotent beings that they'd have you believe. What are you saying? Naruto grinned. When a pantheon is no longer worshipped they quickly lose power until eventually they die. He raised the amulet and the staff, the Egyptian gods died a very long time ago but instead of simply fading, they chose to leave objects imbued with their powers hoping that someday they would be raised once more. Diana's eyes widened in pure shock when she realized what her student was about to do. You're going to use those to resurrect your family. Instead of raising the Egyptian gods, I am going to use their power to return my family back from the plane of death. And you think death would allow it? Death is bound by its agents as they are bound to it. 
The power of the Egyptian pantheon will give me control of their domains for a short amount of time. The boundary between life and death will be meaningless to me. What you describe is a ritual of blood, Naruto. You would anger the very forces in the universe that you seek to manipulate. They will kill you, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the day after but they will eventually destroy you. Naruto's eyes hardened, I'm aware of the consequences. I would gladly suffer for eternity if it meant I could spend another day with them. He looked down and Diana noted just how broken he was, a boy lost in a sea filled with sharks and piranhas. Except like her, he was too prideful to ask for a life raft, he'd rather drown than be seen as weak. Her hands gently grasped his balled up ones and she lifted them, Naruto looked up towards her and saw her stern expression. And you are sure that is the only way? Naruto nodded. Diana felt herself waver for a short while before she finally adopted her hardened exterior. Then we shall raise your family and with their return my sisters will have no choice but to resign their futile quest for vengeance. You want to come with me? He asked in surprise. What about the Justice League, you would be thrown out? Diana smiled sadly as she remembered what had happened before her arrival. I've already given my resignation, Bridge Batman has changed, and I fear that this change stems from something other than his obsession with the greater good. I will not entertain such foolhardiness. Naruto snorted despite the glare that she sent his way. You find it funny. He chuckled at the irony, very. She punched him on the arm, grinning as he groaned in pain. Thanks, Diana, he said honestly. She gave him a bright smile in return, it was one that Naruto hadn't seen on her face in a very long while and one that he hoped she'd never lose. We should hurry then, he quickly said. Where are we going? To where it all began, he said, Diana wondered exactly where that was. You didn't tell the girl, he heard the whispers in his head say. Naruto's fists tightened and his eyes hardened, he knew what would happen after the ritual. Nobody could know, especially not Wonder Woman. If she knew about the cost, he doubted she would ever forgive him. For there was one rule that nothing in this universe could escape, the law of equivalency. Watchtower. So boring. Rose Wilson smashed her fist against the metallic wall. Keep it down will you? Raven said. I'm trying to meditate. Rose sneered, and how will meditation help us in escaping? She pointed at the collar on her neck, this stupid ass collar is preventing our powers. Raven didn't make any motion to argue, instead she merely raised her hand to show a swirling ball of darkness. How? Raven shrugged, beats me. Rose looked at Raven for a short while wondering what was so different about her that made the collars not work. She facepalmed in realization, I must be getting slower. There's something we can agree on, Raven said with a smirk. Rose growled, I'd kick your ass if I wasn't so. Shaking her head she continued, never mind that. I'm guessing the collar only works on metahumans. That's good and all but it doesn't help our predicament, Raven told her. Rose said, well couldn't you like just teleport us out of here? My teleportation abilities work through the astral plane, I can't access the plane because the Martian is practically jamming me. Rose raised an eyebrow as if asking how such a thing was possible. Raven sighed, ah. I'm not a strong telepath but telepathic jamming is actually a very simple technique. A stronger telepath can block another telepath from using their powers by placing a block on their ability to influence psionic energy. Surely there's a way, that's why I'm meditating, Raven said harshly, now will you shut up or do you want to stay here forever? Rose raised her hands in surrender, have it your way princess. Bang! What did I? Raven said opening her eyes to see Batman marching into the room. He grasped her by her clock and slammed her harshly against the metal wall. Where is it? He growled. Where is the bow? Raven struggled against his strong grip, I comma I don't know. Hey head. Batman let go of her. Raven gasped for air as Rose's back kick was caught by the caped crusader. He pulled her leg forward and Rose felt herself flying towards him before he delivered a powerful punch into her diaphragm. Rose landed painfully on the metal ground, her back creaked in pain from the impact. His eyes narrowed behind his mask, I know of you, Deathstroke's daughter. The girl assassin with a hundred deaths on her hands. Rose spat, so you know what my dad will do when he finds out you're keeping his daughter locked in a cage. Her eyes swam with mirth, 
Or did you forget what happened to your precious city the last time you pissed my dad off? She took Batman's growl as a token of remembrance, he gave them one last look. You were both going away for a very long time. He peered at the kneeling Raven, but I can be very lenient should you give me some information. Raven quelled the need to access her astral plane, just so she could make this man feel true fear. Instead she spat at him, I'd rather die. Batman was impressed, such loyalty in such a short period of time. He muttered, no matter, there were other ways to get what he wanted. Jean, it's your turn. Both Ravager and Rose froze as the Martian Manhunter walked into the room. Rose tried to run but his telekinetic ability had her rooted in her place. The alien had a soft frown adorned on his face as he said, Forgive me child. I'll kill why. Her words died in her throat and her eyes glazed white as he touched her temple. Raven didn't want to do it but she had no choice. Batman anticipated her movement, he said, You can't escape. Raven's eyes glowed dark as her darkness whipped powerfully around them. It's a good thing I can. Batman rushed after her but she simply faded into the darkness, leaving Rose at the hands of Batman and Martian Manhunter. Forgive me Rose but they cannot see into my head, Raven thought as she disappeared from the watchtower. Rose gasped as she felt Jean's presence withdrawing from her mind, her attention quickly snapped to the loud bang derived from Batman's fist drilling into the wall. Jean quickly said, Batman we have to stop, Batman growled, she's already gone. Rose frowned. Raven had abandoned her. She had been burned. He stared angrily at Deathstroke's daughter, you knew about this. Rose laughed maniacally at the detective's failed attempt, seems like Raven tore a page out of Boss's notebook. Divide and conquer. Her words died in her mouth. Darkness began to spread to the corner of her eyes. Sleep now, child. Jean assuaged. Minding BITC, she fell to the ground unconscious. The two leaguers looked at each other. Tell me you at least found something. Jean shook his head, except that he wanted each of the artifacts for some sort of ritual. He's learned well from you, Bruce. Batman nodded. Too well. The detective stared at the unconscious girl and a plan began to form. Sometimes in order to catch the big fish all you needed was a little bait. I have a plan. Meet me in Gotham in an hour. Jean Jones was adept at matters of the mind, he had spent his entire life training his psionic powers. It stood to reason that he would sense a great disturbance spilling out of his teammate and friend. Something was wrong, he surmised, and he believed whatever it was would reveal itself sooner rather than later. Kyoto Diana and Naruto floated above a Japanese monastery deep in the mountains. She asked, and this where it all started. She wasn't particularly impressed. The monastery looked abandoned despite somehow being in great condition. Its walls were dulled, the earth around it looked withered and dead. Naruto nodded. Mother once told me of a tale that once the Uzumaki were a prominent clan in Japan. They even ruled for a time though it was under a different time. This is the closest origin point I could identify. He settled onto the ground. Diana watched in amazement as the earth responded. Plants began to grow in response to the very presence of his chakra. It was as if the earth was connected to him. He said, Once I begin, I cannot be disturbed, they will come for me once they sense my magic. Who? Everybody, Naruto said. He gave her a sympathetic look that she despised, you understand that, don't you? Diana didn't need him to explain for her to understand the consequences if she stood with him when they arrived. The Mischira had a very bloody history when it came to traitors. She drew her sword, I promise you none shall pass naruto nodded he didn't tell her that none would be able to pass the magical barrier anyway but he appreciated the sentiment regardless and so it began diana watched as he slammed the staff onto the ground around him a circle with hieroglyphics glowed a sinister red she had to cover her eyes as a dome of golden energy rippled out of him his scream echoed throughout the mountains naruto felt like his body was burning as if he had just been thrown into a vat of acid his skin cracked under the sheer power that he was channeling. Despite the mind-numbing pain, he still managed to speak, in infirmitatum, et vires invenies. The earth shook, his magic quelled for a moment as he spoke the final words of the incantation, in mortem, sum renatus. Diana watched as her student fell to his knees, his eyes glowed a powerful yellow and his mouth began unhinged. A stream of blue billowed out of his mouth like smoke wrapping around him. 
Many different voices echoed in the clearing, in mortem, some Renatus, repeating the incantation over and over. Another voice boomed, it was more distinct and much more powerful than the small whispers surrounding Naruto's prone body. You dare use our power? Diana tried to rush to save her student as the staff and the amulet in his hand began to melt. Our curse is upon you, an eternity in hell. Diana was met by a powerful barrier, her body was repelled back with a thousand times the force of her entry. Sister. Artemis and a hundred of her sisters arrived in a pillar of light, no doubt by virtue of Apollo. But Diana's gaze was rooted on her mother's frozen form. Hippolyta muttered, Oh no, no, she kept repeating the same words over and over again. Hera was right. Wonder Woman said, We need to stop him, but a barrier is in the way. Artemis reached for her bow, she fired a scorching arrow towards Naruto. The arrow hit an invisible barrier before it was sent hurtling straight back towards her. Artemis caught the arrow in surprise. Hippolyta said, the barrier is impossible to cross, the boy is as good as dead. Diana's eyes widened, it all made so much sense now, his veritable attitude, why he didn't seek to rescue his two fallen comrades before going on to complete the ritual. She guessed it was a mercy for them not to see this but that wouldn't stop her. Lightning flashed above, Diana rose into the air and channeled the full power of her trinity form. A bolt the size of a skyscraper appeared above her. Her sisters watched in awe as she threw the lightning bolt. It smashed straight into the barrier, barely even cracking it before the electricity was absorbed harmlessly into the air. Artemis said in shock, by Zeus, how is such a thing possible? A sudden scream rippled throughout out the air. Their attention was drawn back to Naruto. Melted gold was running down his chest, his body was being scribed with hieroglyphics as blue specters continued to chant lowly. What's happening to him mother? Diana asked in worry. Hippolyta said softly, The law of exchange, Diana. One cannot revive a soul without first having given something equal in exchange. All of the sisters looked at their queen in shock, what did this mean about their resurrections? It appears the Uzumaki must have given his soul in exchange for the others. Diana said, No, he would not do something so foolish. He has a plan, he must do. Hippolyta truly sympathized with her daughter. She remembered vividly what happened after the Mischira was destroyed after the Uzumaki's suicide attack. The cost of their revival would forever haunt her to this day. The soul of a beloved in return for her family. She contemplated the choice every day, reminded by his sacrifice with each walking moment. For a long while it overwhelmed her, but she was a queen. And a queen always did what was best for her people. Just as this boy was doing for his. She smiled sadly, if only he was born in a different time. I'm sure he would have been a great king. Diana sent her mother a caustic glare. Hippolyta had never seen such a passionate look from her daughter for another, not for Superman or that human Steve. Boom a dozen sonic booms emerged from different locations. The Amazons drew their weapons as heroes swam into the clearing. Captain Marvel and Black Adam were the first to arrive. Both of them smashed against the barrier but found themselves unable to crack it. The gold was now rising. Naruto would be covered in it in a matter of moments. Black Adam sneered at his counterpart, that power is mine to wield. Captain Marvel growled, I will never allow that to happen. Black Adam moved to attack him but Captain Marvel said, if we don't stop the ritual from completing, we are going to have a magical backlash that could open the gate to some very dangerous beings. Black Adam laughed, I'm aware. Other heroes had arrived by now, Superman, Captain Adam, Green Lantern, Martian Manhunter and Batman all stood beside Captain Marvel. Black Adam looked at them and he pointed towards Naruto's prone body. It's too late. The boy was submerged in the gold, his body had all but been mummified. The blue specters continued to chant as their bodies began to glow more brightly. Their forms were becoming distinct, soon they would be returned. Captain Marvel said with a smirk, if the ritual is complete, the power of the Egyptian gods will fade completely. You will be powerless, he knew that would garner the attention of the former champion. What do we have to do? Adam said. Batman looked at the frozen kneeling teenager, his expression was one of shock and pain. Even without vocalizing it, he could tell that he was in an unbearable state of torment. They may have their differences, but he was sure no soul deserved such a punishment. He said, Adam, I need a read on the composition of the barrier. Captain Adam said, already done. It's composed entirely of magic. 
its power is being drawn from Naruto but I can't seem to break the connection, the barrier is stopping me from reaching him. Batman nodded. That's good. How exactly is that good? Captain Marvel questioned. Wonder Woman said, it means that if we can cut the power source, we can stop the ritual. Batman said, if we can create an opening for Adam, he can disrupt the ritual. Marvel and Adam both rose into the air and moved in almost sync-like manner. They screamed, Shazam! Lightning bridled the air which Wonder Woman immediately tapped in, her power as the daughter of Zeus gave her very limited control of her father's domain. The bold lightning imbued with the power of two different pantheons struck against the barrier. The barrier creaked and a minute crack formed upon the point of impact. Jean, Superman. They nodded. Jean's eyes turned red as he used his telekinetic ability to keep the crack from regenerating. He looked towards Superman and panted, H hurry, it's too strong. Hal Jordan grinned, don't worry, I've got you covered. Diana, Captain Marvel and Black Adam scrambled as his lantern ring created a meteor-sized construct. The object slammed straight into the barrier. Hal Jordan felt the impact force his body to fly back but it did what it needed. The crack grew and gave Superman the window to use his strength to smash straight through it. Captain Adam zoomed straight past the opening, they watched as his body was sent flying to the ground by Naruto's intense gravity though that only worked in his favor. Intruder. The specters whispered. You cannot stop what is happening, we will be raised. Captain Adam shook his head, you've manipulated the child for too long. His quantum field expanded and consumed the entirety of the circle. Adam's body glowed an ethereal silver that clashed against Naruto's contained golden aura. Diana watched as Captain Adam's form shimmered violently, his armor was ballooning from the sheer density of the magic and chakra that he was absorbing. He couldn't hold it in for much longer, the chaotic energy was disrupting his ability. No. The ghosts of the fallen Uzumaki screamed as the entirety of the field inside the barrier began to quake. Captain Marvel shouted, Get back! They barely managed to retreat before a nuclear-like explosion rippled out of Captain Atom, the barrier shattered like glass from its force. Martian Manhunter and Green Lantern erected one of their own to try and limit its impact on the surroundings but they were also unable to. Batman saw a familiar darkness ripple from the corner of the forest. Raven walked into the opening. Superman shouted, get back, but the girl didn't care to listen, her astral form squawked as it flew towards the epicenter, unaffected by the melding of Adam and Naruto's chakra. Batman said, Manhunter, you said the girl was psionic, right? Manhunter nodded, yes, all of her abilities are dependent on her access to the astral plane, the detective's plan didn't have to be said before Manhunter flew off and landed beside Raven's quivering form. G get away from me. Relax child, I'm only here to help. He placed a hand on her temples. Raven gasped as an overwhelming psionic power flooded into her body. Channel me. His voice echoed inside her mind, she growled barely able to hold his power inside her. Her astral form expanded till covered the entirety of the field. Pop Raven's body was thrown back by the sheer force off what she had teleported. Two husks lay frozen on the ground, Naruto and Adam both covered in a distinct cocoon of gold and silver. Captain Marvel asked, what's happening? Hippolyta answered, they both share the same fate. The gods have cursed them both. Diana muttered, no it should have worked. She stared at Batman who merely smirked, what? Do you really think the gods can hold both Captain Adam and Cage? Batman asked. Blaspheme. Artemis thundered, I should cut your tongue from your mouth. Superman blocked the angry Amazonian from even approaching Batman. Artemis stared at her sisters, we have the opportunity to kill the last Uzumaki, yet you stand there like frozen seagulls. Green Lantern muttered, I wouldn't do that if I were you. They all turned to see the lantern scanning their cocoons. The ring is reading a rapidly rising energy level from the both of them. He shook the ring in confusion as he stared at the data that he was receiving. I think we have a very big problem. He jumped back in time to avoid the earth around them begin to melt and corrode as if it had been touched by acid. Batman's eyes narrowed, Adam's leaking radiation. Green Lantern nodded, it's not just any radiation either, it's imbued with Naruto's chakra. It can kill a human in a matter of seconds. Hippolyta's eyes hardened, then we must finish them off. Artemis nodded, agreed. Batman turned to the Amazonians, you can't kill Adam. Once Adam is killed, all of the energy that he has stored has to be released before he is able to regenerate. 
Artemis sneered, what does that have do with anything? Superman answered, do you or do you not want to return home? The Amazonians didn't relent, they stood in front of the leaguers with the intent to attack them should they stand in their way. Black Adam said, if I were you, I'd get as far and fast as you can from them. Jetting across the sky as an audible crack resounded from the crater. Everybody watched as the energy around the two hardened, then cracked. They closed their eyes as a bright light erupted from their cocoons and the two men gasped for air. Naruto. Diana rushed at her keeled over protege, his skin red and badly burnt from the eruption. She hugged him, don't ever do that again. Vision began to finally clear as Naruto looked around the deep crater. He couldn't hear them anymore. He couldn't even feel their presence. The lack of souls in his mind made him lighter but his failure weighed upon him even greater. He said weakly, and no I, I, it wasn't meant to go this way. Tears ran down his eyes. The artifacts were on the ground, dull and without power. The souls of the fallen Uzumaki had vanished. Diana hugged him tightly, she murmured, it's all right, you'll be all right. Captain Adam who had finally recovered stood in front of the pair. His gaze settled onto the crying boy. Your plan was always doomed to fail. Naruto stared at him angrily, you caused this, I would have succeeded if it wasn't for you. He clenched his fist in pure rage, I would have my family. He roared. Diana was thrown back by a powerful gravitational pulse. She landed smoothly beside Adam despite the surprise response. Batman asked, at what cost? The magical backlash of your spell would have raised half of Japan to the ground. Naruto looked down in shame, is that what you wanted? To orphan children, to rip families apart, to make others feel as you do now. Naruto shuddered, I, no, nobody was meant to get hurt beside him, his soul was worth a million people. Superman said, kid, I know that you and I aren't exactly friends and that my situation wasn't exactly the same, but I too lost my family, my planet. His gaze softened, it's hard yes but sometimes you have to let it go to truly move on. Naruto gripped his sword and stood up on both his feet, eyes burning a demonic red. There will be no reconciliation, this just a mere setback. I will find a way, even if it takes a million years. Batman frowned, I understand I truly do, Naruto. I have spent every waking moment of life trying to seek justice. But you must see that there is a line between what is right and what it is you want. Swish Naruto dodged an arrow fired from behind him. He stared at the dozen or so company of the Miskerns standing there with weapons drawn. He drew his blades, I might be weak but I can still kill you all the same. Enough. Hippolyta spoke, as she flew towards Naruto. The boy stood tall against the familiar presence of the Queen of the Amazons. I believe it is time the boy and I had a talk. The two monarchs stood in front of each other, neither made a move towards the other but the leaguers could see the distant look in their eyes. Jean? Batman said. Martian Manhunter shook his head weakly, holding the unconscious raven in his arms. She drew too much power from me, I can't enter their minds. Diana growled, and you will not. I will. She marched towards her mother in Naruto's frozen form and used the special telepathic bond between Amazons to enter her mother's mind. Hippolyta and Naruto stood in front of a wasteland, Naruto could vaguely identify it as a ruined version of the Mischira. They both watched as a younger Hippolyta awoke to the desolate island. Naruto asked, why did you bring me here? Hippolyta said, just watch, and he did. Naruto saw Hippolyta crying on the ground, her hand massaging the ashes of her sisters, of her people. A ghost appeared before her, you have failed, Hippolyta. The being of light spoke with so much authority that Naruto could feel it through the dreamscape. Hippolyta begged, I couldn't have known he would resort to such extremes. Please my lady, I beg of you return them back to life. What you ask isn't possible. Naruto frowned as he saw Hippolyta crumble onto the ground, the parallels of their situation was alarming. At least not without something in return. The young queen's eyes shined with hope as she stared up towards the being. Dire consequences await you, should you choose to resurrect your fallen sisters. I will do anything. I beg of you, Lady Hera. The being nodded, very well. She plunged her hand into the ground, Naruto watched in fascination as time itself slowly reversed. The island itself changed from the desolate wasteland back to the lush paradise that it was. The ashes began to rise, slowly forming into human-like constructs. What he witnessed was almost prophetic. Hera stared down towards Hippolyta, it is done. 
And the cost? Hippolyta asked. Hera pointed to the pile of ash near the queen's body, one family for another. Hippolyta stared down at the ash, her breath hitched in her mouth when she saw the ash covered ring. She grasped the ring in shock, her eyes bridled with pain. No, why you can't do this? Hippolyta screamed. Hera didn't look at all impressed with the woman, insulted that one of Olympus's servants would act so brazenly to her, she spoke evenly, it is done. Hippolyta drew her blade, I will kill you for this, I will kill you all. Her rage whilst audible enough to be heard throughout the forest meant nothing to the goddess in front of her. Hera's power flooded the entirety of the island, the earth itself gave way to it. The goddess said, don't forget who you were speaking to. It was your actions that cost you today. Hera found her eyes softening for a small moment, it is a queen's duty to do good by her people, regardless of how much it costs you. Naruto turned to Hippolyta, you lost your beloved. The queen nodded sadly, I lost far more than that. She twisted the golden ring in her hand. What do you think she meant by one family for another? Did Hera just steal Hippolyta of her love? Those two weren't equivalent, Hera would have taken much more from the queen. His eyes widened in shock, she took your ability to ever feel love. Hippolyta nodded, I cannot love another romantically for as long as my people draw breath. She looked at him expectantly, do you understand young Uzumaki? I is that true, mother? Naruto and Hippolyta spun around in surprise at the presence of another soul in their minds. Diana. Hippolyta roared, what are you doing her? She never got to finish her sentence as her daughter hugged her. Naruto smiled sadly as he watched mother and daughter interact. He slowly slipped his mind from Hippolyta's own, knowing that this was a private moment between the two, one that he no doubt wasn't invited to nor did he wish to be. Naruto's body was the first to move, it had felt like an hour inside his mind but in reality, it had only been a few seconds. It was always a weird sensation when your body caught up to your mind. Diana and Hippolyta returned almost a few seconds after him. The two of them looked at Naruto with accusing eyes. He said telepathically, Hey, I haven't told a soul. And you will not. Diana said, If you do, I will gut you and flay your skin. Hippolyta's glare was enough to prove her sincerity in her threat. He decided he would rather fight Darkseid together than fight the enraged duo. He looked evenly Batman, What do you want? Batman quashed the urge to say that he wanted to see Naruto in chains, despite still being suspicious of the young man. He'd rather not escalate the already tense atmosphere between Naruto and the Amazon warriors. He said slowly, Come with us to the watchtower. I'm sure we can figure out a comprise, maybe even return you to the team. Naruto shook his head, We both know that I will never be accepted in the Justice League. He stared at the other League members who were also uneasy around him and grinned sadistically, Besides, I'm thinking of retiring. Superman raised an eyebrow, Retiring from what? From this talk, Naruto raised his hand and the unconscious raven flew towards him. I will come for Ravager tomorrow, Batman. None of the leaguers made a move towards him as his disappeared in a plume of smoke. Captain Marvel asked, should we have let him go? Batman said, I'm not so sure we had a choice, he narrowed his eyes at Wonder Woman. Diana watched as Superman approached her, it surprised her how much the Man of Steel looked unlike himself. His face marred a saddened and uncomfortable look that was unlike his usual cheery and charismatic demeanor. He asked, Diana, can we talk? She nodded. His eyes softened for a moment, you know, I love you but I, he swallowed his nervousness, I think we should take a break. Diana nodded somberly, she said, I it was good that you said it first. Superman looked at her in surprise and Diana quickly corrected, we've grown distant Clark and after yesterday I'm not sure I belong in the league anymore. I guess I also felt we needed to take a break, at least to understand what we are to each other. She leaned in and gave Clark a soft peck, barely able to stop herself from crying. Hippolyta watched as Diana flew away and Superman looked brokenly onto the ground. She became unduly aware of the shattered bond between the Great Trinity. She feared that the three greatest heroes would be unable to return back to what they once were. She smiled bittersweetly as she prayed to Artemis to guide her daughter but instead of the euphoric feeling of power that would run through her after she prayed, all she felt was dread. Pure and utter dread. Hippolyta's gaze flickered to the moon, it lasted for a brief moment, but she was sure that it happened. The moon's usual silvery hue was bathed in crimson. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Naruto sympathized greatly with the quote, 
Despite all his planning, despite his power, he had failed. He wanted to lash out, he wanted to make them pay for stopping the ritual but after seeing what happened to Hippolyta, he found himself somewhat grateful that they had stopped him if only to free him from the Egyptian god's control. He had never felt pain like that before, it was as if he was lifting the very weight of the earth upon his shoulders whilst someone was pouring acid onto him. Still, he had gained something particularly special during his time in hell. He had seen it, he saw something that he was sure he wasn't meant to see. He saw a wall of energy, or rather something akin to an ocean. Naruto couldn't describe what it was, it lacked form, but it called to him all the same as if it had consciousness. A part of him was sure that it was the only reason that he had returned to the world of the living without any lasting damage. And it was strong, in fact, Naruto had no doubt that it was an entity of sorts. One that transcended any and all domains. Perhaps if he could reach it, he might able to persuade it to return his family. He shook his head from his thoughts, he couldn't go down that road until he was stronger. Still, Naruto felt much lighter without all the voices in his head, it took him a while to understand how much of an impact they had on his mental state. In turn, he guessed he felt somewhat lost without their guidance though Naruto was given very little time to wallow in his misery. The light wanted answers for his actions. You broke the one rule, I gave you. He heard Savage's voice ring through the computer. Naruto growled, and I told you, it wasn't my intent to attract so much attention. Oh really? Then perhaps you can explain to us, why your game of cat and mouse across three continents has led to several different agencies trying to locate you. Lex's voice appeared smooth and calm, but Naruto could practically feel the deadly edge. Naruto smirked, says the bastard who tries to kill Superman every other week. Lex's frown seemed to egg Naruto on, or the fact that Queen Bee's hive controls an entire country. He pointed at each of them, you all have your own agendas for being a part of the light. Seems like the only thing that has banded us all together is that we are unable to succeed in them alone. Stay your tongue, boy. Raz al Ghul spoke gruffly. Savage stayed quiet for a moment. Naruto could practically feel the immortal's gaze ripping into him despite being hundreds of miles apart. Then the man smiled as if he had discovered something that he hadn't before. Hmm, perhaps a little leeway should be given to the young man. He stared hard at Naruto, after all, he did accomplish something in his brazen efforts. He managed to divide what we couldn't. Queen Bee nodded, yes, yes. Even if I don't agree with his methods, the Justice League is more divided than ever. She gave him a little smirk that no doubt was meant to antagonize him. We should be focusing on capitalizing on that weakness. Luther and Roz didn't look pleased but were left helpless as the other members agreed with Queen Bee's perspective. Savage nodded. As you have already placed yourself in the limelight, Naruto. I expect that you will keep a low profile. Naruto grunted but gave no sign to argue, Savage saw through the fake bravado. He knew to which the depth of Naruto's despair lay. Worry not, I have more important matters to talk with you about. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that but received no response as they shut off the connection. Bastards. He mumbled under his throat. The light's end goal was still a mystery to him and from what he knew, it seemed like neither did the other members truly know what the organization was about, well all, except Savage of course. He practically assembled the group using their and his hatred against the Justice League to form an organization that thrived in the shadows. Ironic wasn't it? He opened the door from the secret room hidden in his bedroom with a worn down sigh, perhaps Savage was right. Some downtime never hurt anybody. His senses were immediately hit with the powerful scent of burning and waffles. Naruto rushed downstairs and found Raven in the kitchen trying her best to qualm the smoke. He shook his head in amusement and channeled his chakra into his mouth, a burst of air spread through the room clearing the smoke. What have I told you about cooking, Raven? Raven groaned, sorry. I saw them make these on TV and I wanted to see what exactly they found so delicious about them. She looked at him with a pouty smile and wide eyes. Naruto knew what the little devil was trying to do but found himself giving in regardless. Fine. I'll make them for you. He relented. Raven gave him a crooked smile, almost proclaiming her victory over him. But only after you clean the dishes. He said, grinning as the smile faded from her face. Raven grumbled as she took to cleaning the dishes. Naruto merely tapped the desk and headed out to check on the other guests staying in his apartment. Wonder Woman was busy spinning her blade in the courtyard of the secret house that Savage had gifted him. He guessed she found it easier to track him without the amulet now. 
You know that's not going to bring him back, Naruto said softly. Diana glared at her protege, but it'll stop me from doing something reckless. How very monk of her, Naruto thought. Where was this version of her when they met? She said, it was a mutual decision anyway. Sure. Naruto murmured to himself. He stared evenly at his mentor, you still haven't told me what you were doing here. I'm not too sure myself. She replied, more so to herself than to him but Naruto didn't attempt pry. Why? Her lips quirked in a teasing manner that Naruto rarely saw, trying to get rid off me so you can spend more time with Raven. He chuckled briefly at her little jab. Why? Want to watch? Naruto mirrored with his own smirk. Diana's cheek flustered for a short while, her response was a soft punch to his bicep. Come in, after you're finished. I'm making breakfast. Diana nodded somewhat before returning to her training. An idea popped in Naruto's head. Diana was thrown of her set by a loud plume of smoke and several dozen Naruto's staring at her. He peered back at her as he entered the house, have fun. Diana smirked. Her blade edged in a controlled form as she stared at the clones. Well come on then boys. Half an hour later Naruto rubbed his head in slight pain as a wave of memories from the last set of clones entered his mind. He grimaced, ouch, that must have hurt. He was thankful that he didn't have to feel the pain that his clones felt, otherwise he would probably have to stop using the technique. The front door opened, and a somewhat battered Diana entered the house, she groaned in pain as she seated herself on the sofa. Raven shifted uncomfortably at the presence of the warrior woman, whilst she had really never interacted with Diana before, she still found herself anxious considering what the other leaguers tried to do to her and Naruto. Diana gave her a strained smile, which served to simply increase the weird tension between the two strangers. Food's ready. Naruto shouted from the kitchen. Raven sighed in relief at not having to endure any more of the uncomfortable silence anymore. She moved to the dining room which was conveniently connected to the kitchen and found a plate of pancakes and syrup being placed on the table. Naruto placed a jug of orange juice on the table before he took his seat, Raven sat beside him and immediately dug into the pancakes. Wow, Raven. Slow down you might choke. Raven didn't really stop, she enjoyed the taste of pancakes too much to care what Naruto was saying. How had she not tasted something like this before? Azareth had tasty food as well, she thought, but this, this was beyond anything that she had tasted. She gawaffed, so good. Naruto shook his head in amusement, his smile faltered as he saw Diana enter the room. Her gaze and posture remained stiff, he had hoped that she may be more inclined to forget Superman if she were preoccupied but clearly that hadn't worked. He guessed only time would help. But for now, Diana, sit he said, she did, and he plated some pancakes for her and poured a jug of orange juice. Raven didn't like the somber atmosphere that washed over the table, both of her seniors were troubled by their own problems, their presence together only seemingly furthered their depression. Naruto frowned similarly, his memories briefly flickering to a similar time during the civil war in Uzushiogakure. They had their problems, Uzumakis were prideful people and he guessed that was what had begun all the tension between the branch and the royal family. But that wasn't at all near the truth, he had been plagued with dreams that told two very distinct tales. Uzushiogakure was an enclosed environment, no Uzumaki could travel beyond its borders and as such the branch members felt trapped in a life where they felt below the royal family who served as the island's monarchy. Perhaps its traditionalism was what stirred the very flames that his uncle took advantage of. It made him wonder why such a thing didn't happen to the Mischira where the sisters satisfied with simply serving for all of their immortal lives. Naruto shook himself from his thoughts in time to see Raven sighing as she finished her meal. The girl stood up and walked out of the room, her gaze settling on him as she said telepathically, you guys have a lot of problems to sort out. At this point, she'd rather spend time with Ravager though she would never admit it. They did but it wasn't so easy that he could just address them openly, their problems were inherently one of trust and the like. Diana asked, do you want me to go? Her voice was soft and whilst it clearly was guarded, Naruto could sense the vulnerability in her tone. She looked up from her plate, you asked me why I was here? He nodded, what if I told you I feel responsible for everything? You're no, he tried to placate her but was silenced by her even stare. Let me finish, Naruto, she said, it was my responsibility to guide you, I spent my time between Metropolis, I left you alone too often with the guidance that you clearly needed. Instead of trying to accept you, 
I plotted against you with Batman. I guess I'm not as good of a mentor than I thought I would be. Naruto sighed. Diana and he never really had the type of relationship that the other sidekicks had with their mentors. Their relationship felt more like a partnership than anything. I misjudged the situation, Naruto admitted, immediately finding the patterned cloth on the table more comfortable than looking at her. He laughed awkwardly, looking back, I might have overreacted. And he did, he was willing to admit that such a reaction only served to not just distance them but also begin a war that he wished no part off. Diana frowned, I cannot blame you for reacting the way you did. I betrayed you and so did the League. Naruto sighed. Perhaps it's easier to admit to myself now or maybe I've gone completely crazy but I understand why Batman did what he did. Her eyes widened in pure shock. How would you react if you found an unstable teenager with the power to level an entire continent? Diana snorted at his self-praising comment but she did see the logic in his words. Where is this coming from? She asked. What do you mean? A few days ago, you wanted to kill Batman for messing with your plans. She noticed the way his eyes glazed over in sadness upon mention of his failed quest to save his family. Naruto didn't understand this newfound clarity but it was quite clear that he had lost himself with the burden of having to carry all of those souls and memories from the orb. They hadn't manipulated him but it would be foolish to say that they didn't play a hand in his spiral. He understood that more and more each time he pondered about it. I guess, I must have lost myself. She raised an eyebrow at his admission, no. He fiddled with the tablecloth as he tried to form the right words, it would be more accurate to say that I lost myself in my mission. Nothing mattered to me more than reviving my family. I come I would have done anything, even if it meant I spent a thousand years in hell or if I had to kill everyone just to get them back. Diana stayed silent, contemplating and registering what he had said. Had he really fell so much that he was willing to contemplate murder? But I realize now that maybe, just maybe, it was that very mindset that had led me down this path. It was a difficult pill to swallow. It was easier to assign the blame to everybody around him but Naruto had never been the type of person to deflect. Diana said, so what do you plan on doing now? Naruto said, I come I don't know. He felt empty inside, it was easier before when he had a goal but he had no such thing anymore. He could could continue to pursue the goal of resurrecting his family but until he found a way to do so without so much collateral, he had to put it on hold. And he didn't trust the light, with some research on the most public figure among them. Lex had an almost uncanny resemblance to his uncle. Both wanting to shape the world into whatever they wanted, free will and damage be damaged. But he didn't trust the Justice League either, especially Batman. Batman had a way of burdening everybody with his own sense of justice essentially proclaiming it to be for the greater good. Of course, the greater good was just whatever Batman wanted to be. He saw everything in black and white, you were either guilty or you were not, intentions be damned. Once he judged someone as a threat, he went above and beyond to ensure that the threat was neutralized. He snorted internally, all of that work just so they could break out of prison and plague the streets of Gotham once more. Naruto knew that a part of the bat found such conflict necessary, he doubted he'd function without it. Bruce Wayne needed the jokers of the world to keep him busy from realizing the futility of his quest. His quest for justice. He guessed that's what made a hero different than a villain, the ability to sacrifice yourself so that others could lead better lives. But, he wasn't a hero nor did he see himself as a villain. He just was. And that's precisely what made him dangerous, the ability to transition so seamlessly between acts of good and evil. It was after all, what he had been trained to do. He remembered his mother's words, to be a king was to be willing to do what nobody else was. And he was, but he understood another lesson that he had failed to come by, one that made him realize why kings and the like always had counsel. You did nothing wrong, Naruto, Diana assured, but I did. Naruto shouted. I killed them, he choked, barely able to hold himself together. You don't understand how it feels, I had to because they died because of me. This was the first time, he had ever told her about on the island besides the whole civil war point. My uncle, he killed my mother and I lashed out with my power, I destabilized the orb and it killed everybody. His eyes appeared wild for a moment and Diana understood why he had gone to the lengths that he had. And now, now I've lost them forever. She said softly, I understand. She did. She had fallen for the same obsession and it consumed her to the point that she was willing to kill a god. Things happen, 
Accidents occur but at the end of the day, they are still accidents. I know it wasn't your intention to destroy Uzushi Obikir. You couldn't have possibly known that was going to be the outcome. Her hand outstretched across the small table and grasped his own. He looked up towards her as her graceful features drowned in sorrow. But all you can do is move on. If you don't it will consume you. He snorted internally, he had been consumed by it, heck he went through literal hell because of it. He smiled slightly feeling a little bit better. Thank you. Diana nodded. BZZ Naruto's stupor was interrupted by a loud buzzing from his cell. He gazed at the number and the distinct coded message that he had been accustomed to getting. The message decoded to coordinates and a time stamp. Savage must really want to keep this a secret if he wanted to meet him in Nanda Parbat. He stood abruptly surprising Diana, I have to go. Make yourself at home, if you want. She asked, Where are you going? He gave her a tight-lipped smile before he disappeared altogether. Some part of her wanted to follow him if only to satiate her curiosity of what made him leave in such haste but she wanted him to trust her. Diana sat bored in the dining room, she wondered what she would do for entertainment. With the league, there were always threats to deal with almost every day but now she had nothing to do. It was, liberating but boring at the same time. She guessed she'd return to Washington, she had some meetings to take care of anyway. Nanda Parbat night had befallen the city hidden in the mountains, Nanda Parbat stood silently and gracefully as it had for a thousand years. Thanks in no small part to its history with Vandal Savage. Over the years, the immortal had founded and helped build several similar cities across the world, isolated from the world and loyal to him. A blue streak crossed the sky and landed effortlessly in the empty streets of the city. It was cold and dead, with the few signs of life occupying the monastery. Naruto hated it, but understood its merit none the same. Nanda Parbat was no normal city after all. I can sense you, Savage. Naruto announced. Savage's gruff voice spoke as he came out of the shadows, I wasn't hiding. Naruto looked at the burly man, flanked by a woman and a man that were unfamiliar to him. Come, we shall speak more inside, he said. He entered the monastery, the guards gracefully bowed as Savage walked in. Why have you brought me here? Naruto asked. The two beside Savage expressed their discontent at how their master was addressed but Naruto didn't fear action. Guidance. Savage spoke. He led them into an ornamental room, it was bare like the rest of the monastery. Naruto guessed that the monks here tended not to care for material goods, besides what good would such things do you when the world outside was isolated from you. Savage turned to his company, you may leave. The two bowed and left Naruto in a room with the brutish immortal. Savage stood tall for a moment, how did you know how to revive your family? Naruto groaned internally, he should have known that this was Savage wanted from him. He lied, research, and Clarion was most helpful. He didn't trust the man. Savage like Batman were two sides of the same coin. Savage peered at the young Uzumaki for a while before he decided to be seated. I wish you would have come to me before you attempted such a thing. He rolled up his arms and showed Naruto a mark that Naruto didn't recognize. I once attempted a similar thing. The man's tone once turned wistful as he pondered on a time that had long since passed, I was young, I had outlived my entire family but I sought not to resurrect them but just one soul. Who? Naruto asked. My wife, Savage said gruffly. I remember very faintly, I had researched, ventured across the world in search of divine instruments that could return her to me. I found them, and to my joy, I had managed to succeed in finding a witch to complete the ritual. His smile almost turned bloodthirsty, I'm sure you've realized by now that such a ritual requires a costly penalty. Care to guess mine? His rhetorical question remained unanswered as Naruto looked with disinterest at him. I had to erase an entire civilization just so I could get her back. Naruto frowned, the law of equivalence requires an equal penalty. A soul once returned cannot find peace, young Uzumaki. Savage lectured. So, I sought to make her equal to me to make her immortal like I a thousand souls for a thousand years. I don't see her, Naruto said. Sadly, her immortality wasn't as complete as mine. She was vulnerable to injury and as you might have guessed once my enemies had learned of my invulnerability they instead tried to take her from me. He said, anger beginning to boil through his voice. I wouldn't give them the satisfaction. Naruto looked as if the man was insane. So, you killed her? Naruto asked incredulously. Why go through all that trouble just to kill her anyway? I purged myself of weakness. 
Savage corrected, like I believe you can. You remind me of myself, Naruto. Naruto growled, I'm nothing like you. Savage chuckled, you'd think that wouldn't you, but our paths cross more than you would think. You will learn in time that humanity needs to be corrected, to be controlled. They're helpless without authority. And you will be that authority? Savage smirked, the light will. The man was trying to persuade him that they were equal partners. Why tell me this? He was curious as to what the man wanted. Did he just bring him here just to give him a history lesson? No Savage always had a secret agenda below his already secretive plans. Savage stared evenly at him. You've already begun seeding your way into our world. Creating your own organization, regardless if it's still in its infancy is no small feat. He adorned his infuriating all-knowing smirk, especially since you've managed to recruit Wonder Woman. Naruto was upon him before he could even finish his sentence, Savage was slammed against the wall with a powerful thud. Spying on me, are you now? Savage grinned, it pays to be paranoid. After all, I'm sure you were using that amulet to do more than just avoid detection. Naruto let the man go, he had more to lose if he drew in Savage's ire. He knew next to nothing about the man, he doubted someone of his age wouldn't have some contingency plans or very powerful allies. The immortal coughed, Naruto could tell that he was angry despite his calm exterior. I brought you here to simply warn you, Savage said. There are two things that are unacceptable to us. One, I don't like loose ends and two, I don't particularly enjoy it when you bring attention. Naruto's eyes burned a fiery red and the earth cracked from pressure. Careful Savage, I might take your little warning as a threat. Savage stood tall, you mistake it as a threat. I am only guiding you, young one. He rummaged through his pockets and took out a scroll. Take this as a show of good faith. Naruto grasped the old scroll, almost dropping it in shock when he saw the whirlpool seal on it. Savage said, did you really think someone as old as I wouldn't know about the Uzumaki clan? How do I know that this isn't a ploy, it's a blood seal, as far as I'm aware only an Uzumaki can open it. Naruto bit his finger and smeared some of his blood onto the seal. It glowed a deep blue before it unfurled exposing an array for a complicated seal. Naruto could barely understand how it worked but the scroll had something sealed inside it and whatever it was invaluable. The Fuenjutsu was eerily familiar to the archaic methods used by his ancestors to seal demons and the like. Savage said, in return, I only ask that you don't become so abrasive in your attempts. Do what you like. Create a kingdom if you wish. But it is imperative that we remain in the shadows. He stuck out his hand and Naruto hesitated for a moment before he shook it. Savage said, Good. I will contact you if and when I have need of your services or your team. Naruto nodded. The man watched as Naruto simply disappeared in a plume of smoke. A dark grin adorned his face. Luther's attempts to convince him that the Uzumaki was better used as a lab rat or a scapegoat were short sighted. He had plans for the boy, very big plans indeed. After all, every emperor needed an heir. Elsewhere, is it done? Yes, I've collected the shards as you have asked. A man spoke. I don't know what you need from the useless trinkets anyway. But he was getting paid top dollar to collect them. Black sludge began to filter out, the man yelped as he felt himself step on it. He drew his gun and fired at the moving sludge but to no avail, the sludge moved, sticking to his skin like a leech as it began to cover him until he was submerged under it. He could hear the voice echo in his mind, then you have served your purpose. It was all coming together now. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.